Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? The clerk. Oh, sorry, <coughs> Senator Wish Wilson. President, I'd like to make a short one-minute statement in relation to uh, a matter that was said about me in adjournment last night by Senator McGrath um, while he was in the chair. Uh, you can seek, you can, yeah. I mean, you can seek leave to make a statement at any point if leave is granted. In the, uh, you seek leave to make a one-minute statement. Well, one-minute statement would be is maybe even less, Chair. Leave, but, is, leave is granted. Th thank you, Chair. Um, I have been a deputy president myself, an uh, acting deputy president myself, for nearly five years, and I was quite shocked and surprised to learn this morning that during adjournment last night, although two, two hours prior I had taken myself off the speaking list, uh, I, Senator McGrath in the chair said, for those playing along at home, Senator Wish Wilson has missed his spot, so Senator Bragg, you now have the call. I think that's totally inappropriate, firstly, for any acting deputy. Uh, president to make those kind of comments and use that position to have a go at another senator, especially if they hadn't made inquiries as to why that senator wasn't on the list. So, President, could I ask you to take to take that on notice and seek a response from Senator McGrath and bring it back to the, the Senate chamber? Um, I, will, this I, will, dealt with. Yeah, I I will speak to Senator McGrath and ascertain what happened. Um, I may come back to you privately or to the chamber as is appropriate, Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, the clerk, for any documents to be tabled. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute and the return to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Mr President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item 4 of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I believe we have a message. I have received a message from the House of Representatives returning the Treasury Laws Amendment 2019 Measures No. 3 Bill 2019 and inform the Senate that the House insists on disagreeing to the amendments made and insisted on by the Senate. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I move that this message be considered in committee of the whole immediately. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The committee is considering message number 221 from the House of Representatives relating to the Treasury Laws Amendment 2019 Measures No. 3 Bill of 2019. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. I move that the committee does not further insist on its amendments to which the House of Representatives has disagreed. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just want to indicate that uh, 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 it's my understanding that we will uh, not insist in this instance for this uh, amendment to be attached to the uh, uh, to the bill to this bill um, because there is uh, an, an urgent need for financial advisers to be relieved in terms of uh, their requirements uh, uh, for professional qualifications. However, I will indicate to the chamber that uh, the, the the crossbench, uh, the Greens, uh, and the Labor Party are quite determined. Uh, to deal with this particular issue, uh, <clears throat> this, uh, we, we have a regime uh, in, the, in the Federal Register, Register of Leg Legislation whereby 1,119 companies uh, have uh, the ability or are excluded from not having to lodge annual uh, reports to ASIC. Uh, that uh, creates a p the potential for. Uh, aggressive tax minimisation through opaqueness 
It has to go. We cannot have a privileged class of companies in Australia uh, where there is uh, you know, one rule for certain companies with certain uh, uh, owners and another rule for all other companies. Okay. So the question is that the motion is moved. Oh, sorry, Senator Roberts. I just want to just want to say that uh, One Nation will be supporting what Senator Patrick just said uh, in the future. We will be right behind him because we see this bill, uh, this amendment, as very, very important for the country. Thank you, Senator Roberts. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Oh, beg your pardon. Sorry, Senator Wish Wilson. Quickly, Deputy, Pre Deputy President, wanted to uh, add that the Greens will be supporting this amendment. Um, we, as we said uh, yesterday and, and last week, uh, we've put similar amendments up to Treasury bills in previous years. Uh, it's a really important issue. We've yet to have a statement from the minister as to why this is good public policy. Indeed, uh, the, the government has been remiss in providing any information as to why this uh, archaic grandfathering arrangement is still in place. Great grandfathering arrangement, as uh, Senator Patrick's now, now calling it. Um, although I wouldn't say there's much great about it, um, transparency should be in our genes. It's absolutely critical for us to, uh, to take any uh, legislative or regulatory action against uh, tax evasion. Uh, transparency is critical, so um, there's no reason that this over 20-year-old uh, clause should still exist, and this chamber has the opportunity to remove it. And I urge all senators to support uh, the amended bill. If there are no more speakers, I intend to put the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Okay, so we're cancelling the division. No division required. So I'm moving on. Minister. Uh, so the question is that the motion. Well, hang on, this what uh, I move that the resolution uh, be reported. So the question, the, uh, the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The committee has considered message number 221 from the House of Representatives relating to the Treasury Laws Amendment 2019 Measures No. 3 Bill and has resolved not to insist on the amendments made by the Senate to which the House has disagreed. Minister. Uh, thank you very much. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. So the question is, the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Government business ordered the day number one, Export Control Legislation Amendment Certification of Narcotic Ex Exports Bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Labor supports the passage of the Export Control Legislation Amendment Certification Narcotic Exports Bill 2020. The bill seeks to change the definition of goods in the Act to include narcotic goods which will support the legitimate export of narcotic goods in alignment with foreign country import requirements. Labor unequivocally supports this bill, but we do not think it is time for the government to harness but we do think, excuse me, we do think it is time for the government to harness the full potential of this crop. In the explanatory memorandum for this bill, the minister claims this amendment will, quote, remove unnecessary and unintended regulatory barriers on the trade of Australian hemp products. We agree. Hemp is a product that is often misunderstood and misrepresented. Indeed, the low THC levels of this crop has historically prevented the full utilization of this plant, including for medicinal purposes, local consumption, textiles, oil and exporting due to misinformation about its narcotic character. Labor encourages the growth and development of the hemp industry. It should be legal to ingest, cultivate and produce hemp products in all states in Australia. Hemp is an environmentally friendly crop, provides opportunity for value adding and export growth. It is also time to remove unnecessary regulatory barriers to medicinal cannabis. 
starting with responding to the re recommendations made by the Senate Community Affairs References Committee. Australian agriculture has been hard hit by the protracted drought, bushfires and now COVID-19. And at every step of the way, this government has failed to respond to the needs of the sector in a timely manner. Sadly, this is just another example of the government's failure to provide a strategic, well-informed plan for Australian agriculture. The National Farmers Federation have put forward their vision to grow Australian agriculture to $100 billion in farm gate output by 2030. However, the NFF have made it clear that the Morrison government will need to play a central role by stepping up with developing a national strategy for agriculture. Farmers and regional communities are doing it tough, and they are missing out on critical export opportunities, such as in hemp, because this government cannot get its act together. As previously mentioned, Labor supports the substance of this bill. But we urge this third-term government to stop taking for granted the resilience of our farmers and our regional communities. Start developing a comprehensive plan for agriculture that addresses long-term drought resilience and allows farmers to capitalize on emerging opportunities through innovative solutions to address future challenges that will impact the value of the sector. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Di Natale. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. Uh, I rise in support of the Export Control Legislation Amendment Bill uh, 2020. This bill removes barriers to Australian hemp and medicinal cannabis companies exporting their products to supply international markets. <coughs> now, the Greens support this bill because we understand the many potential benefits of medicinal cannabis and we support a healthy Australian medicinal cannabis industry. Uh, but this bill also raises serious questions about the domestic market. Uh, since the Greens led the charge for the introduction of medicinal cannabis as far back as 2015, I've been highlighting the enormous barriers to patient access to medicinal cannabis in Australia. The TGA arrangements at present are failing to provide people with timely, uh, cost-effective access. As a result of the problems within the current regulatory system, we undertook a detailed inquiry into the barriers and uh, uh, the problems uh, with the regulation of medicinal cannabis in Australia. We did that earlier this year, and the committee tabled its report in March. It's now essential that the government implement the recommendations of that report, and I'm going to be moving at the end of my speech a second reading amendment to that effect. It's really important to understand the history here. The government made medicinal cannabis legal in 2015 and set up the regulatory framework through the TGA, the Therapeutic Goods Administration. At that time, we advocated very strongly that a separate, independent, standalone regulator be established to allow people to access medicinal cannabis. It's the approach taken by many jurisdictions right across the world, recognising the very unique issues associated with the drug that in many circumstances has been prohibited for consumption and understanding also that medicinal cannabis is not one drug, but indeed many different drugs. We uh, decided to give the government the benefit of the doubt. It was a big change at the time. Up until 2015, it was illegal, full stop, for a doctor to prescribe a patient medicinal cannabis. Uh, but what we've seen now is that the system is failing people. In the five years that have now passed, what we've seen are people failing to get access to medicinal cannabis when they need it. The barriers are many, and I'll go through some of them in a moment. The Community Affairs inquiry into patient access to medicinal cannabis uncovered a range of issues which advocates in the industry have been highlighting for many, many years. At the moment, if a doctor wants to prescribe a patient medicinal cannabis, they require the use of the special access scheme through the TGA. Now, this is important to understand. The TGA regulates products for approval here in Australia, but where a product, a pharmaceutical drug, uh, from another jurisdiction 
that hasn't yet entered the Australian market and hasn't been approved for use in Australia, there is a special provision called the Special Access Scheme that allows doctors to seek permission to prescribe that product. Now, that's a scheme that was designed to be used in exceptional circumstances for drugs that may be of benefit to a limited number of people. The scheme was never intended to be used at scale for something like medicinal cannabis. I mean, it's remarkable. You've got the regulator, the TGA, that is de designed specifically to regulate for the approval of pharmaceutical products, and they've been chosen to regulate a drug which bypasses their normal approval processes and uses something called the special access scheme. Now, what that scheme, as I said, does uh, is it allows for the prescription of products not yet approved for sale here in Australia, but it requires doctors to jump through a number of uh, hoops in order to be able to prescribe it. It requires doctors to complete a detailed form every time per patient per script. Now, there is another way in which you can uh, avoid having to go through that approval process for every specific script for a patient. You can become what is known as an authorised prescriber. But again, the number of authorised prescribers has been extremely limited. The process for becoming an authorised prescriber is uh, not only onerous, uh, but the committee found that the required approvals are, are really hard to come by. There are very few people who have been designated authorised prescriber status. Now, I just practical example. Uh, when I was in general practice, if a patient came in to see me, I could write a script for an opiate. Opiates are drugs, uh, codeine-type drugs, uh, uh, other injectable preparations of opiates like pethidine, for example. I can write a script for an opiate like codeine without requiring any approval from anywhere else. It's up to my discretion as a prescribing doctor as to whether I think a patient will benefit from an opiate. Now, we know from what's happening here in Australia and indeed right around the world that there is a crisis in overdose deaths from prescription opiates. In the US, tens of thousands of people dying from prescription overdose deaths. I could do the same for benzodiazepine type drugs. I can write a script. And we know that when it comes uh, to the use of drugs like opiates and benzodiazepines, people do die when they're taken in large quantities. The potential for overdose is very real. I don't require any approval to be able to prescribe that drug, and yet I have to jump through a range of hoops to prescribe a drug like medicinal cannabis for which there has not been one documented case of overdose. When you talk about the relative safety of particular drugs, medicinal cannabis is safer than over-the-counter drugs like alcohol. We've, we're trying to put a square peg into a round hole. Now, the issues don't stop there. Doctors are struggling to get the necessary training and information they need to properly prescribe these products. So, look, when I was training, we didn't even know there was an endocannabinoid system. It was something that just wasn't understood in medicine. We know now that medicinal cannabis products work because we have an endogenous, our own endocannabinoid system. We produce variations of these drugs ourselves. Our own body does that, and that's why they're effective. We didn't know about that only a short time ago. So the amount of information that doctors have on, on cannabis-type products is very limited indeed. The only training I got was that cannabis is a dangerous drug. You need to uh, ensure that people stay away from it. Now, if you can find a doctor who's willing to undertake the paperwork and feels comfortable in prescribing, you're going to find uh, red tape accessing medication thanks to the overlapping regulation, not just at a federal level through the TGA process, but also at a state level. And I'm sure we'll have a contribution later on where we hear about the huge problems in Tasmania, specifically, where that state has decided to make it harder than any other state uh, for someone to access medicinal cannabis. And if you manage to go through the tangle of federal and state uh, uh, restrictions, uh, patients are then going to be hit by the enormous costs associated with accessing these products because they're not subsidised, again, unlike other medications. So patients who need these treatments, who benefit from them, who want to do the right thing, continue to use the black market because they can get these products cheaply. Unfortunately, they don't know what they're getting. It's an unregulated market, and often what people think they're getting is not what they're purchasing. But they are being forced to break the law. Now, our inquiry 
uh, and including included uh, contributions from senators on all sides, made unanimous recommendations on how to urgently fix the, this failing system. And these recommendations need to be the government's highest priority in this area. While we support our local industry accessing the export market, surely we should be looking after Australian patients first. Our committee has recommended that immediately changes be made to both the special access scheme and the authorised prescriber scheme to allow a smoother, simpler, more straightforward process for doctors. We recommend that investment be made by the government and by the colleges to ensure that appropriate doctor education is available so that people learn about the endocannabinoid system and the benefits from medicinal cannabis, rather than the stigma that's currently associated with the use of those pro products. Crucially, we recommend that the government investigate a compassionate subsidy scheme for medicinal cannabis so that patients are not faced with huge price tags just for accessing their medication. Right now, when people are given a script, they can be forced to pay hundreds and hundreds of dollars each month simply to get access to a medication that would be of tremendous benefit to them and their families. Through the committee, we made a number of other recommendations, and I commend the report to all senators. But the key one is that the government moves forward to reform the system, that we establish an independent, standalone expert, expert regulator for medicinal cannabis and move away from the TGA system, which is good for what it needs to do, but we are trying to put a square peg into a round hole. Now, the report said very clearly, again, that the government reform the system if barriers to patient access persist 12 months after tabling the report. Personally, I would have liked to have seen a stronger recommendation, immediate reform of the system. But working across uh, the divide with both Liberal and Labor senators, uh, we accepted that the government be given uh, 12 months uh, to address the inadequacies of the regulation associated with medicinal cannabis. We know that an independent regulator, which understands many of the complexities associated with medicinal cannabis, we know that it would allow for far greater patient access. That's the experience of many jurisdictions overseas. The irony of the current system is, is that although the TGA is the pharmaceuticals regulator, it regulates the introduction of pharmaceutical products in Australia, most medicinal cannabis bypass the normal regulatory framework within the TGA. They're through the special access scheme. So it circumvents the processes that are established within the TGA to regulate medicines. We have decided to use a regulator to regulate medicinal cannabis and then to bypass their normal regulatory processes. It makes no sense. It's not sustainable and Australians deserve much better. Of course, all these improvements to patient access would improve the viability of the Australian medicinal cannabis industry. This is a young market. It's just starting out. And it wants to supply a domestic market. But the barriers are so high that despite knowing how many Australians are likely to benefit from these treatments, there are only a trickle of prescriptions coming through. Yes, there has been incremental improvement over recent months but coming off an extraordinarily low baseline and still uh, not enough to meet the extraordinary demand that there is for medicinal cannabis products. It's been estimated that millions of Australians would benefit from the use of medicinal cannabis or at least a trial of those products. At the moment, all we have is a few thousand Australians being able to access those products. Now, we know that our uh, domestic market isn't enough to, support, to sustain a medicinal cannabis industry, and that's why the export market is important. And as I've said, we do support that. But let's sort out our own system here in Australia so that Australians can benefit from uh, medicinal cannabis products. I have said on many occasions this isn't a wonder drug. Uh, it doesn't uh, uh, purport, uh, it doesn't um, uh, have the benefits that some advocates purport. But it does have many, many potential benefits. And you only need to talk to people who have experienced uh, a remarkable improvement in their quality of life to know that this is a drug that Australians should be able to get access to. A key issue for both industry and patient access domestically is now the descheduling of CBD. 
one of the components of medicinal cannabis. So that CBD only products, and again, it's important to understand here, the THC is the drug with a psychoactive effect. CBD products don't have any psychoactive effects. And there's now a move to deschedule CBD only products so that they can be accessed like other complementary medicines. Since inquiry, the TGA has begun a process to downschedule small quantity CBD products from Schedule 4 to Schedule 3 so they can be available over the, over the counter at pharmacies rather than requiring a prescription. It's a good start, but the issue remains that even Schedule 3 CBD, which, as I said, has no capacity to create a so-called high, we know it's safe, we know it's well understood, it would still require registration on the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods requiring all the years and huge investment in clinical trials. Clinical trials are important, but they shouldn't be a barrier. So we support the bill, but it's time we got on and fixed the situation at home so that Australians can access medicinal pro uh, cannabis products here. I therefore move the following second reading amendment. At the end of the motion, Add, but the Senate calls on the government to urgently implement the recommendations of the Senate Community Affairs References Committee into patient access to medicinal cannabis. Thank you, Senator Di Natale. And has that amendment been circulated? I believe so. Okay. I was just checking, that's all. Yes, I've got a yes, it has. Yeah, that's fine. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much, and I would uh, like to, through you, um, uh, Deputy President, um, thank Senator Di Natale for his contribution, which I acknowledge and um, support the intent of his contribution. However, this bill is specifically about export, and I think we need to deal with um, TGA matters uh, through the appropriate regulations. Um, there are a lot of opportunities in, in the medicinal cannabis area, and, and I, I'd like to just put a plug to my colleagues in the New South Wales State Parliament who moved to enable the use of medicinal cannabis in um, 2016. So it is a, truly a bipartisan acknowledgement that there is, um, there is uh, a lot to be said about medicinal cannabis. But I want to talk today about the Export Control Legislation Amendment Certification of Narcotic Exports Bill 2020. Um, this bill reflects the ongoing support by our government, by the National Party, working with the Liberal Party, to support Australian agriculture. Because at the end of the day, whether it is used for medicinal cannabis or industrial hemp, it is an agricultural product. I share the National Farmers Federation's ambitious goal to grow Australian agriculture to 100 billion by 2030. It's currently at 60 billion. And to do this, we must look at two things. Firstly, identifying emerging agricultural markets, and secondly, ensuring that we do what we can in government to increase market access overseas. <coughs> this bill recognises legal narcotics such as medicinal cannabis and low THC hemp as an emerging market and we are easing restrictions for our producers to access those markets. Two thirds of our traditional agricultural produce is exported. This legislation is designed to give our producers of legal narcotic products the same chance as we do to our wool, beef and wine producing um, farmers and who enjoy Australia's status as a leading agricultural exporter. Markets in East and Southeast Asia currently, as well as Europe, require government issued certification on plant exports, and that is fair enough. The amendment we are debating today will allow for our government to issue those certif certificates for our narcotic products legal narcotic export products. It will amend the Export Control Act and will replace the 1982 Act in March 2021 to ensure continuation. It is important to note that these changes only refer to legitimate narcotic goods, such as medicinal cannabis, and it will not change other regulatory controls that we have in place on narcotics, 
more broadly, which we do not seek to produce, export or import. But for our legal narcotics, we want to ensure that our growers are not at a competitive disadvantage in international markets. And this de bill deals with this quickly and efficiently. <coughs> this legislation supports two key products that I want to talk about very briefly. Medicinal cannabis is a different product to our traditional view of marijuana. It is a clear opportunity for a positive agricultural product to grow cannabis plants under strict control orders and legislation. It is something the Morrison, Go Morrison government in our coalition strongly believes in, as shown by the government's announcement last October of $3 million for the Medical Research Future Fund to examine the benefits of medicinal cannabis for pain or symptoms and side effect management for cancer patients. Our government is, is committed to ensuring a safe quality regulated supply of medicinal cannabis to Australian patients. And this bill will enable the producers of that safe medicinal cannabis to be able to access international markets. There is also industrial hemp. This is a low THC cannabis plant that its fibres and seeds are used for a variety of products. The use of low THC cannabis as a usable fibre can be traced back some 50,000 years. Today it has multiple uses, including paper, textiles, ropes, clothing and food for humans as well as animals. In fact, hemp seed is now claimed a superfood in a lot of the trendy cafes. The potential for our farmers to compete on international markets is huge, and this bill will assist our Australian growers to participate in this market. Allowing government certification will give such growers the best chance to export their product overseas. We all know our farmers make decisions on what to grow based on current demands, supplies, what is best for their on-farm business and where they can access markets. And that's what this bill is about. In 2011-12, the gross value of Australian hemp production was around 300,000, over an estimated 185 hectares of plantation. In November 2017, the Australian Food Standards Code was amended to permit the sale of low THC hemp seeds for food consumption, which has seen a small increase in hemp production. This bill will fur further raise the opportunities. And due to the perceived health benefits of hemp seeds and the like, as well as traditional and novel uses for hemp fibre, which now includes being used for biodegradable plastics, it should be no surprise that there is perceived to be a global increase in industrial hemp demand, making it an emerging market both domestically and internationally. The certification of Australian industrial hemp and our medicinal cannabis by the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment will give many countries the assurance required to import our produce, which we all know Australia has a very high regard internationally for our agricultural produce. Our government supports this because we believe in Australian agriculture. We believe in the Australian farmer and we believe in regional and rural Australia. Today we are talking about an emerging agricultural market which will continue to grow and it would be remiss of us not to enable our farmers full access to those markets. When you increase exports, you increase the income of farmers, you strengthen the economies of regional and rural Australia, and that is what this legislation is designed to do. Agriculture in Australia has always been ambitious and innovative. This legislation reflects that ambition and recognises this increasing market as an opportunity. We have a tremendous reputation 
for our produce, both in the amount we produce, three times more than we consume, and in the quality. There is no reason why that reputation can't extend to our production of legal narcotics, and I commend this bill to the Chamber. Thank you, Senator Davey. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Well, this export control legislation amendment, certification of narcotic exports bill 2020, is another example of the commitment One Nation and I made to the Australian people that we would pursue changes in our laws to unwind the stranglehold on the cannabis industry. I need to pay respect to Senators Cormann and Kitching for their combined efforts to assist me in making this bill pass the parliament. My office reached out to the Minister for Agriculture, who is also the deputy leader of the National Party's David Littleproud. Minister Littleproud originally had no interest in making this bill come before the parliament, even though market standards predict the global industry hemp demand is projected to grow from 4.6 billion to 26.6 billion over the next five years. And listening to Senator Davis' comment that they are really interested in the agricultural industry to grow it in Australia, well, again, David Littleproud made a comment the dairy industry is still dying. Over another 500 dairy farmers la went last year. So, you know, pushing for the agricultural industry, I don't think Mr. Littleproud is up to the job. So Mr Littleproud showed zero interest or foresight into the very real fact that the future hemp industry could very well act as the transition crop for struggling cane farmers in Queensland and North Queensland, where sugar millers are squeezing them out of the market. When Mr Littleproud refused to deal with this bill in a timely manner, I went to Minister Cormann's office and it was he and Senator Kitching a Labor senator, and I thank her very much, who brought both the Liberal and Labor parties together. I have seen the benefits this crop offers to food, fibre and medicines. I want to also acknowledge the countless health food stores who have been pushing the benefits of this crop. But I also want to acknowledge Woolworths, who have recently taken on Australian-made products including hemp seed and hemp oil. I'm aware of Australian dog food companies who are looking to implement plant-based substitutes like hemp, which is high in fibre. I also want to recognise Lambert in Initiative Research Centre that operates within the Sydney University, whose use of cannabis to treat epilepsy will be recognised tonight with a virtual award for their efforts to assist many Australians who suffer these debilitating fits. Researcher Dr Lindsay Anderson, an American attracted to Australia to work at the Lambert Initiative, is being internationally recognised for her work. We have an enormous way to go in making medicinal cannabis more readily available for patients across this country. But today's passing of this bill is just another shuffle in the right direction to assisting the cannabis industry. I will be encouraging farmers nationwide to get on board with the cannabis industry, and I will be ensuring after the next Queensland election that One Nation remove the barriers that have been put in the way of growing hemp as a food and fibre product. I not only welcome the passage of this bill, but I am very pleased to have instigated the change we're legislating here today. Thank you. Senator Stoker. Madam Acting Deputy President. The Morrison government is very much committed to finding ways to continue to grow our agricultural sector. And AgriFutures, whose research is so very important to planning out policy in this area, has noted the potential future for the growth of the industrial hemp market work worldwide. They've said there is a great opportunity for Australian growers to capitalise on the growth of current and future products derived from industrial hemp, with global market insights predicting the market to surpass 
US $270 million in size globally by 2025. Now, most countries currently regulate unprocessed and semi-processed plant products um, against the introduction of injurious plant pests and diseases. But um, up until recently, we've had some difficulties in being able to access some of those international markets that Australian growers might like to reach. This bill ensures that there is the kind of legislative coverage needed to be able to enable government certification for goods of this kind so that Australian growers have international market access. Now, that means that we are complying with international agreements around this, like the International Plant Protection Convention, and it means that um, a problem faced at present, where the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment aren't able to issue government certificates um, to support the legitimate export of these goods, um, is able to be fixed so that those sorts of certifications can readily and easily be provided. Now, I must say this bill led me down a path of having to make some inquiries because um, I'm on the record as being somebody who is anti-drugs in, um, in the narcotic sense in every possible way. Um, I'm always conscious of ways that we can uh, reduce the use of Australian people on um, harmful drugs and um, despite the fact that there are some people out in the community who think drugs like marijuana are you know, harmless, um, I think very differently. And I think once we start to tally up a lot of the, the mental and social costs um, associated with what some people pretend is harmless, then um, it is exposed to be nothing of the sort. But the inquiry I was led down by this bill was to find out precisely what kinds of things we were talking about under the heading of um, low THC goods, low THC hemp um, and the medicinal cannabis products. And um, I found it quite informative. I learned that um, the low THC hemp, that is the subject of this bill, is a plant that's got 0.3 per cent or less of um, THC, which is the, the, uh, the part of marijuana that gets a person high. Um, so it's not a product that poses any kind of um, drug type risk. And in fact, it's a really important agricultural product. Um, the hemp seed, without of course those um, potentially harmful drug-like attributes, um, the, the variety that doesn't have those attributes, um, when hulled and unable to germinate, um, is a food product that is used by many. Um, and again, um, I'm, I'm assured that it is not something that's harmful at all. Um, the other uses for the hemp plant I found pretty interesting too. It's a really important um, fibre that is used in the production of fabrics and textiles. Um, and that those fabric, textiles and food uses can provide um, a great opportunity for Australian farmers to be able to uh, diversify the crops that they grow so that they um, are more resilient for different environmental and market circumstances. And so anything that gives um, agricultural communities more of the choice and flexibility they need to be able to be viable has to be a good thing. Um, now, medicinal ca cannabis in this country is heavily regulated but, um, but legal, and um, while I'm not an enthusiast for it, the very tight controls that we have around it in this country um, are maintained by this bill, and in circumstances where um, that is legal here and legal in other places, there's not really much of a reason why we should stop the high-quality Australian farmers from being able to access those um, important markets. So I commend the bill to the Senate. I think it is an important measure that we can um, implement to cre create better market access for um, Australian producers and um, everything we can be doing to make their ability to be viable, their ability to contribute to our economy, their ability to employ 
and their ability to continue to invest in the communities in which they grow has to be a good thing. Thank you. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I'm delighted to say that this bill holds enormous promise. For far too long, cannabis and hemp have been suppressed for reasons that have everything to do with established interests and nothing to do with the merits of the plant. That has hurt people for years and is hurting hundreds of thousands of people now. This bill addresses one area that has been holding back the Australian cannabis and hemp industry. Currently, there is no formal system for providing approvals for the export of medical cannabis and hemp. The approval must apply, the producer, sorry, must apply to the minister for an ad hoc approval. While approvals have been granted, the volumes are a fraction of the potential that this crop offers. The Export Control Act 2020 came in this year and it allows the minister to make rules that govern the issue of export certificates. If a substance is on the list, rules are issued to regulate the export of that substance. Now, cannabis and hemp were not originally included in that bill. This amendment corrects that. Cannabis and hemp growers and manufacturers can now have certainty about the rules for export. Every grower is on the same footing. All who meet the rules can get an export license and sell product into the world market. And what a market that is. The cannabis and hemp market in Australia is expected to grow to a billion dollars in just four years, and double that to two billion dollars by 2028. And at that time, our near neighbours in Asia, in the Asian market, will exceed ten billion dollars. This is a wonderful opportunity, the start of a wonderful opportunity. Australia's reputation as a high quality, safe supplier of food and medicine will help our producers take a significant share of that huge market. And I must compliment the government's decision to require all cannabis producers to follow the international safety and quality standard known as the GMP, Good Manufacturing Practice. Quality processing has been instrumental in growing our reputation for trusted product, and that means a lot to people overseas and in Australia. Internationally, the world market for canna cannabis and hemp is expected to reach $50 billion by 2030. Some of this growth is from the trend to legalise recreational cannabis, which I need to make clear one nation does not support. We do support natural Australian whole plant medical cannabis by way of doctor's prescription to any person with a medical need supplied by a pharmacist subsidised on a PBS. I note that the government is also looking to reschedule low THC cannabis into Schedule 3 as an over-the-counter, chemist-only medication. One Nation supports that reschedule. We have long pushed for this. The Liberal government talks about market efficiency, but in the cannabis market we have nothing but over-regulation and disincentives to enter the market. This bill will help, but there is much, much more to be done. I draw the government's attention to the review of the Narcotic Drugs Act conducted by Professor Macmillan, which reported almost 12 months ago, July 2019. Professor Macmillan made 26 recommendations to improve the commercial efficiency of the cannabis market in Australia. None, none of those recommendations have currently been implemented. Many of those recommendations dovetail nicely with the intent of the Export Control Legislation Amendment to develop an export, Australian export industry for cannabis and hemp. The report calls for a reduction in the onerous conditions being applied to the industry and to people who work in it. These restrictions are an unnecessary and costly barrier to efficient quality production. They're holding our farmers back. They're holding everyone in the supply chain back and holding customers back. Professor Macmillan has recommended that a single licence be issued for all or some of cultivation, production, manufacture and research. This is instead of the individual licences currently being required at each step. The report also suggested licences be valid for five years 
rather than 12 months. Now, most export, exported cannabis and hemp is value added, allowing one producer to now grow, process, manufacture and research new products on a five-year license guarantees the security of their investment, which, which improves the return of their investment. By encouraging vertical integration, our producers can benefit from multiple profit centres and insulate against fluctuations in one area of this emerging market. Export opportunities will be enhanced by a wider range of products offered for sale. Volume and diversity resulting from export markets will benefit domestic patients as well. So let me explain. Currently, medical cannabis is prohibitively expensive. This is in part due to the high administrative, regulatory and security costs imposed on each stage of the process from cultivating or importing through to selling the product to a patient. This high cost is spread across low volumes because of restricted access, making each, process, each prescription too expensive for patients to afford. And that creates an ongoing cycle of high prices and low affordability, leading to low volume, which leads to high prices. It's a vicious cycle. This bill represents a way out of that self-defeating cycle by allowing for the current small domestic demand to be met from high volume, low cost export production. Medical cannabis is best used when the plant has been processed as little as possible. It is a wonderful natural product. Conversion into vaping solutions, patches, topicals and capsules does not disturb the compound profile of the plant. It is a wonderful product. Since med medical cannabis has been legal for many years in, well, most nations on the planet, we are seeing an explosion in new hybridised varieties of medical strains of cannabis. I've seen some of them myself. These have been developed to provide an optimum profile for a specific medical condition. This wonderful plant and its many varieties can be tailored to specific needs of patients, and there are many patients in desperate need of this. Hundreds of different varieties are now available to the world market. Hundreds. The more of these varieties that can be grown in Australia to support export demand, the greater the variety that will be available to supply domestic patients. People can have this marvellous natural plant tailored to suit their specific medical needs. With a professional, efficient and profitable export industry, Australian patients will be able to access the exact cannabis profile for their particular health condition at much reduced prices, much greater value. So as a senator from Queensland, I am excited that we have a growing centre for cannabis excellence in Southport. Our beautiful climate is perfectly suited to growing hemp for food, textiles, cosmetics, oil, building products, and so much more. Queensland will be on the forefront of this multi-billion dollar export industry for both hemp and cannabis. One Nation's policy of restoring property rights for farmers and building more dams will deliver our, to our farmers the capacity to grow Australia's agricultural capacity through hemp and cannabis. Before closing, I want to reiterate what our party leader, Senator Hanson, said and express my thanks to Senator Cormann from the Liberal Party and Senator Kitching from the Labor Party. It was them who made it possible because Senator Hanson and some of our staff have been pushing for this for years vigorously, and it's wonderful to see this, this step. Tiny though it is, it is a wonderful step. So thank you. In closing, may I suggest that the success of this bill will depend upon what the export rules for cannabis are. To date, rules on medical cannabis and hemp have been so damn onerous, people were left wondering if the government was fair dinkum about a plant that has so many proven applications and so many successful runs on the board overseas. We look forward to the government proving, through fair and effective regulation, that they are indeed genuine about implementing this bill's attention. Thank you. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. The Export Control uh, Legislation Amendments Certification Narcotics Export Bill 2020 is required to amend parts of the export control legislation. Uh, the bill will amend the definition of goods contained within the Export Control Act 1982 and the Export Control Act 2020. 
The amendments will remove discrepancies in the treatment of narcotic goods with other goods that pose a similar risk to Australian trade reputation and market access. Markets for industrial hemp in Australia are underdeveloped by comparison to other OECD countries, especially Europe, the UK and Canada. The past 15 years have seen significant global innovation, significant levels of research into agronomy and the development of high-performance hemp products. AgriFutures has noted the potential for future growth of the industrial hemp market worldwide, stating there is a great opportunity for Australian growers to capitalise on growth of current and future products derived from industrial hemp, with Global Market Insights predicting the market to surpass uh, $270 million US in size globally by 2025. Most countries currently regulate unprocessed and semi-processed plant products against the introduction of injurious plants, pests and diseases. Under international plant protection conventions, exporters in countries can issue phytosanitary certificates attesting to the absence of such pests and diseases on exported plant products, which is what this bill seeks to facilitate. Since 2015, in place of phytosanitary certificates, alternative assurances were provided for cannabis products exported to markets in Korea, the United States, Uruguay and, the, and New Zealand. Earlier this year, an exporter from Queensland sought to export a commercial quantity of seed to the United States. The US Department of Agriculture indicated they would require for formal phytosanitary certification from the Department of Agriculture, Water Resources and Environment for exports to be accepted. Since late 2019, exporters have expressed interest in exporting to other markets, including Thailand, Vietnam and Canada. These are all markets that require official phytosanitary certification. Certification that the passage of this bill will finally allow Australian authorities to issue. The proposed amendment will allow Australian exporters to meet the biosecurity import requirements for any market that requires a phytosanitary certificate. Countries that currently have strict import requirements, including phytosanitary certificates for unprocessed plant products, include China, Japan, Thailand, Vietnam, Korea, Canada and the US. In fact, the only major markets that don't have such requirements are Hong Kong and Singapore. This bill will address the government's current inability to issue phytosanitary certificates and enable certification of a broad range of agricultural commodities, including narcotic goods with the meaning of the Customs Act 1901. The bill will ensure Australia meets its obligations under international agreements and provides assurances to trading partners that our exported agricultural goods meet their requirements. The bill provides the confidence for existing and future exporters to pursue lucrative export opportunities, particularly for those involved with new and emerging industries. Being able to access a broad range of markets creates more export opportunities and higher profits for Australian farmers, producers and export businesses. The bill will support initiatives of the government to congestion bust in regulation and ensure the agricultural industries come out firing after the threat of COVID-19 has passed. Without the ability for government to provide this certification, Australian exporters are at a disadvantage when compared to global competitors. I commend the bill to the Senate. So the question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Di Natale be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. The ayes uh, call a division. Uh, ring the bells. <laughs>
stop the bills. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Di Natale be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I, I appoint Senator Urquhart, the teller, the teller for the noes, and Senator Seawood, the teller for the ayes. I forgot your name. There being 12 A's and 31 no's, the <laughs> resolved in the negative. The question is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Call the clerk. <laughs> A bill for an act to amend the law relating to export control and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. I move this bill now be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to export control and for related purposes. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Treasury Laws Amendment 2020 Measures Bill No. 2, Bill 2020, for concurrence. I call the Minister. Uh, I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that the bill now be read for the first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Oh, I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation, child support and international finance institutions and for related purposes. Minister. Uh, thank you. I move this bill be now read a second time. I seek leave to have this second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, Senator Gallagher. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I rise to speak on the Treasury Laws Amendment 2020 Measures No. 2 Bill on behalf of the Opposition. At the outset, I, I will confirm that the Opposition will be supporting this bill. This bill contains six schedules relating to various aspects of Treasury legislation. The measures contained in the bill are technical and non-controversial. 
Schedule 1 of the bill amends the hybrid mismatch rules in the Income Tax Assessment Act of 1997. Amends is perhaps a generous assessment of this measure. The measure clarifies certain aspects and is expected to have a minor unquantifiable revenue impact over the forward estimates period. We have heard the government make strong claims about how much it is doing to combat multinational tax avoidance, but you have to laugh when the strongest measure they have brought forward this year is a few minor typo corrections and clarifications in the more obscure chapters of the Income Tax Administration Act of 1997. The government must urgently act to end multinational tax avoidance. Schedule 2 of the bill allows the single-touch payroll system to include employer withholding of child support deductions from salary and wages. This measure will further streamline and simplify our child support and family law system. Schedule 3 amends the designated gift recipient rules in the Income Tax Assessment Act of 1997 to include a new category for community sheds. This means that men's and women's sheds across the country will now be eligible to receive tax-deductible gifts. There are more, now more than 1,200 men's and women's sheds across Australia. These sheds are doing vital work building connections and communities. This work is more important now than ever before as our community recovers and rebuilds following the coronavirus pandemic. Schedule 4 of the bill amends the International Finance Corporation Act of 1955 and International Monetary Agreements Act of 1947 to allow the government to meet obligations to the World Bank, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development and the International Finance Corporation have under this bill. This measure supports the provision of financial assistance and advisory services to middle and low income countries and of course Labor supports it. Labor will continue to offer the government bipartisan support for Australia's participation in important global institutions. Schedule 5 of the bill adds a number of specified designated gift recipients to the broader list of specified designated gift recipients. Labor welcomes the inclusion of the Superannuation Consumers Centre and welcomes their advocacy for the interests of ordinary Australians in the superannuation sector. I'm glad that we're now hearing more from people who represent the interests of ordinary Australians in the super sector, whether from the union movement or the consumer movement. Schedule 6 provides the Australian Tax Office uh, pro provides for the Australian Tax Office to share information on JobKeeper payments with the Fair Work Ombudsman and the Fair Work Commission. This will allow the Fair Work Ombudsman to better address JobKeeper-related compliance issues, particularly where employers are rorting the system and pocketing funds. We can welcome the government's decision to allow the Fair Work Ombudsman to do their job here, but we would encourage the government uh, to go further. I'm speaking about the $6 billion in superannuation guarantee levy payments that are rightfully uh, earned by Australian workers but snatched away by their employers to fatten their own profit margins. The Fair Work Commission and the Fair Work Ombudsman should be, could be a part of that solution. And yet, at, these, at this point, these bodies do not have the powers or the information necessary to tackle the problem of superannuation theft. Unlike minimum wages, sick leave, annual leave or parental leave, the universal right to superannuation is not included in the national employment standards. This means that ordinary workers are powerless to pursue super theft claims through the Fair Work Commission and means that the Fair Work Ombudsman is toothless in the face of this $6 billion problem. And this means that workers are powerless to organise through their union to take action through the Fair Work Commission to stop having their superannuation stolen by their employer, and this is not good enough. While we welcome and support the government's decision to allow these bodies to access information relating to JobKeeper and appropriately enforce compliance around this measure, we do call on the government to act to end superannuation theft and to give the Fair Work Commission and the Fair Work Ombudsman the powers that they need to do so. I commend the bill to the chamber. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, the Greens are particularly interested in, in Schedule 6 of this bill uh, before us today. So essentially, it's an omnibus bill that uh, includes six different uh, legislative uh, instruments, but we're particularly interested in Schedule 6. Uh, and the reason is pretty simple. We fought hard in the Greens to get JobKeeper during the COVID 
crisis that we've all been through in recent months. Indeed, uh, I think the Greens were the first ones to raise the issue of the need for a living wage during this pandemic. We raised the issue that countries like the UK and New Zealand were considering a living wage and that while we applauded, uh, especially Senator Seward, after all her fantastic work in recent years to raise New Start, which has essentially became, become job seeker, we felt that didn't go far enough, that we actually needed to provide certainty for workers and businesses to stay in business during this most unprecedented crisis that we found ourselves in, simply to give confidence, to give confidence to families, to workers and to business owners, and indeed even to consumers and the economy which is what we need to do in times of pandemic. We've learnt enough from history to know the most important thing we can do in times of crisis is inject confidence into the economy. We learnt that from the GFC. We've learnt that from other crises. So we got JobKeeper. And let me just say a few brief words about the background on JobKeeper. Um, it wasn't just the Greens and, and the Labor Party and others who were actively out saying we needed a living wage in the form of something like JobKeeper. I understand the reason the government finally came to the party and legislated a living wage like JobKeeper is because the business community themselves, along with the unions, the ACTU, and it's been well publicised the role that Sally McManus and others played in negotiating the JobKeeper package with the business community. But the business community also recognised the need to keep businesses open, to keep the continuity in place. And also they recognised the fact that many business, small business owners, especially, and that's what JobKeeper was firmly aimed at, small businesses, they recognised that many small business owners didn't feel comfortable and were unlikely to go down and join the long queues outside Centrelink. So we got JobKeeper, and I think it was fantastic collaborative effort from both people within this parliament and many, many stakeholders outside the parliament. And it hasn't been perfect. It hasn't been perfect. The Greens have been on the COVID commission uh, inquiries. And we've been continually asking questions around some of the failings of JobKeeper. I mean, it's a, it's a, a gigantic effort to pull something like this together at a short notice. And I, I have put on record uh, the Greens' thanks to all the hard-working public servants, especially the Treasury officials and the Australian Tax Office and others who have literally worked around the clock to make sure that we have this payment to keep small businesses ticking, to give money to workers and give them confidence. But it did leave out huge cohorts in this country such as casual workers who have been employed for less than 12 months, and the absolutely critical foreign visa workers. And in my state of Tasmania, uh, we, we especially uh, need foreign workers in many of our agricultural industries and our tourism industries. So it hasn't been perfect. We've con the Greens have continually pushed for uh, extra payments to disability support sector to the arts sector, indeed uh, to the university sector and so on. And we're not taking our foot off the pedal in, in that regards. But what we've discovered in recent weeks is that a number of uh, glaring emissions have raised themselves that need to be fixed. And one of them is the fact that the government's one in all in rule, which basically said to employers, if you are going to put your employees on JobKeeper, you must put all your employees on JobKeeper. Remember, employees, yes, had to fund the first four to five weeks of this payment, but then they would be refunded. And that has definitely been an issue for many small businesses, particularly if they're employing dozens of employees. That potentially was twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars they had to come up with at short notice. And for those not following this debate, 
Uh, there was pressure put on the banks to provide low interest loans or to provide interest holidays on existing loans to try to do whatever they could to help small businesses meet that, that gap. I moved an amendment in the original legislation many weeks ago to bring that payment date forward to make sure small businesses weren't put under that pressure. But nevertheless, there's no excuse for employers in this country when they're being given money by the government. It's not their money. This is public funds, a stimulus payment to their workers to keep confidence in the economy, to keep food on the table, to keep their businesses going. There's no excuse for employers in this country to cherry pick who gets, who gets the JobKeeper and who doesn't. If you are eligible, the law says, and I'll get to that point in a minute because it's very important, the law as it stands says if you pay one employer, employee, you must pay them all. Now we know, we know that many businesses, sadly, have not adhered to the one in all in rule. Now I accept there's been some confusion in terms of dealing with accountants around this, that the rules and the goalposts have been changing a lot. The situation is very fluid. It's been a difficult time, but the one and all in principle is very simple, and it's there for a reason. This is a government stimulus payment to keep confidence in the economy provided by the Australian taxpayer, by the public. And I know that Fair Work are dealing with thousands of complaints, thousands of complaints from employees who have been left out of JobKeeper, and they've been told by their employer, they have been told by their employer that sorry, uh, Joe and Jane got it, but I haven't been able to sign you up to it. Often there's been no explanation given. And acting deputy president, someone very close to me has been going through exactly this situation. They contacted Fair Work and said four of my fellow employees have received it, three of us haven't, and our employer has provided no explanation apart from, well, oh, we got it late or he didn't see it when you sent it through, so on and so forth, all the excuses in the world. They've contacted Fair Work. Fair Work said, you are entitled to this. Your employer needs to sign you up to it. It is the law. And then Fair Work has contacted them back and said, look, we feel sorry for you, but there's nothing we can do to enforce this. Now, I have raised this issue in the COVID inquiry directly with the Australian Tax Office and directly with Treasury. And as it turns out, as it turns out, while we have this rule in place, there is no enforcement powers in the legislation that has been before this place. There is no enforcement powers at all. So Fair Work have been telling employees who have missed out, and many of them have severe anxiety, they don't have the money to pay their rent and get through this, that they can't help them until this parliament legislates enforcement powers. So Fair Work can go after these employers. Now the tax department answered my question. It was quite interesting. Uh, Mr Hershorn, who I have a lot of time for and have worked with now for many years, said, look, our first our first port of call is to have a discussion with the employer and say, why aren't you putting these workers on JobKeeper? And try and sort it out at that point. Mr Hershorn's view was it's in no one's interest for the employer to be fined. Now, I understand where he's coming from, but it's easy for him to say that. He's not the one missing out on getting a payment when he needs it. And that's not a, a slur against Mr Hershorn at all, but I fundamentally disagree. I think there has to be a stick and carrot approach. If the carrot doesn't work, and I think there are sadly some dodgy employers out there, if the carrot doesn't work, there needs to be a stick, Acting Deputy President. Fair Work needs the information from the tax office and they need the power to enforce this rule. Now we don't know how much longer this uh, scheme is going to go on for. The government is introduced, unfortunately, significant uncertainty into the equation again by saying that JobKeeper will be reviewed in June after employers have been told and employees have been told they're going to get it to September. 
They're now reviewing it in June. They took it away from the childcare sector 10 days ago at sudden notice. So the whole point of introducing confidence into the system by providing a stimulus payment is being eroded by this government's rush to pull the rug out from underneath the feet of employers and employees in this country. This idea that somehow the economy is going to snap back. We're all very worried, Acting Deputy President, that we're facing a fiscal cliff and that when these payments are withdrawn, we're going to have significant pain and hardship on our hands. The Greens' view is this should be extended, this payment, and it should certainly be extended to those unfortunate Australians who have been left out by this government. But let's fix the law as it is before us now, and that is especially uh, Schedule 6 in this bill, which relates to the one-in, uh, all-in uh, rule. Now, I understand that a, uh, a second reader amendment has been circulated uh, in the chamber uh, on behalf of myself and the Australian Greens, um, and we wanted to add at the end of this motion but that the Senate A notes that the JobKeeper scheme requires that employers that have decided to participate must ensure, must ensure that all eligible employees are nominated for the scheme. Two, the decision about employee eligibility is entirely at the discretion of employers. And three, there is currently no avenue for employees to dispute decisions made by their employer to include some but not all employees in the scheme. And lastly, part B, calls on the government to give the Fair Work Commission the power to deal with disputes about whether a worker of an employer participating in the JobKeeper scheme is eligible for the JobKeeper scheme. And I also want to uh, highlight that uh, my colleague in the other place, the, the, the Leader of the Greens, uh, Mr Adam Bant uh, will be introducing a private, uh, private senator's bill to cover this exact issue. And, uh, my, and I've just been reminded that my colleague uh, Senator Faruqi has done exactly the same thing on behalf of, uh, of Mr Bant. So, um, this is an issue we all care about, and I know the Labor Party care about it, and I'm sure so do the crossbench. And in the spirit uh, to my colleagues across the chamber, in the spirit which you introduced, JobKeeper, and thank you for doing that. Thank you for working with all stakeholders and bringing in a living wage. Uh, let me also remind you that I think what's been seen can't be unseen. Government stepping in and keeping businesses going is a good thing when it's needed. We would like to see this, this concept extended way beyond COVID to look at a permanent living wage. We think it's very important that government plays a strong role in our lives. The Greens have always argued for a strong role. And may I remind the minister, while I'm on my feet, Acting Deputy President, that in our recovery phase, the government also has a strong role to play by investing in the community, investing in infrastructure projects that will build this country, investing in transitioning to 100 per cent renewable energy in this country, providing job security for young Australians who by Jove, have had a difficult few years. If you're a young Australian now who have been told to stay at home for three months and not go out, you've seen a summer of horrendous bushfires, Australians being evacuated from beaches, record droughts, the destruction of the Great Barrier Reef, a third mass coral bleaching in our oceans, you surely must be wondering what the future holds for you. It's our job as government to give them that certainty for the next generation, not just for the next few weeks or the next month through JobKeeper Scheme. Our role is to take that concept and provide a future and security for young Australians, something that they can feel that they have been supported on. So we need to take these principles that we've all applied in recent weeks and recent months, which have been great, and now extend them to the future. No more austerity, no more zombie budget cuts. Let's have a strong role of government in our lives. The Greens will be supporting. Senator Whistleson, your time has expired. The question is, sorry, Minister. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, can I start um, just by thanking Senator Wish Wilson for his um, 
uh, praise of our public servants, and I agree uh, with the great work that's been done by many officials, uh, not just in the Treasury, but the Treasury certainly has been at the heart of the economic response of the government. And we're very pleased and very grateful for that very, very hard work. Can I say very briefly on this um, second reading amendment that's been circulated? Given we've had five minutes or so to consider it, uh, we won't be supporting it. Um, Senator Wish Wilson obviously flagged that there uh, may be private senators' uh, bills that deal with this, and I think that would be more appropriate than with five minutes' notice looking, up, looking to set up a new mechanism, as is suggested in that second reader. For, so for that reason alone, uh, we won't be supporting the second reading amendment. So I'd like to thank uh, those senators who have contributed to the debate. Um, Schedule 1 to the bill amends the Income Tax Assessment Act to ensure that the hybrid mismatch rules operate as intended and help to ensure the integrity of Australia's income tax laws and their application to multinational enterprises. Schedule 2 to the bill amends the Tax Administration Act to allow employers to voluntarily report under the single touch payroll rules information about employer withholding of child support deductions and child support garnishee amounts from salary or wages that are paid to the child support registrar. This measure will streamline the child support reporting process, simplifying reporting and giving employers a greater return on their investment in single touch payroll. Schedule 3 of the bill amends the Income Tax Assessment Act 1997 to establish a de deductible gift recipient general category for men's sheds and women's sheds. This provides sheds with more opportunities to attract public financial support. Schedule 6 to the bill uh, will allow the ATO to share relevant information relating to the JobKeeper scheme with the Fair Work Commission and the Fair Work Ombudsman. Uh, this information will help the Fair Work Commission and the Fair Work Ombudsman address JobKeeper-related compliance issues in relation to obligations under the Fair Work Act 2009. And I commend this bill to the Senate. The question is the, the, the amendment moved by Senator Wish Wilson on 8982 be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Call a division. Uh, Ring the bells. I do need to sit here. Right.
Stop the bells. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Wish Wilson be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator McCarthy, tell her for the ayes. Senator Brockman, tell her for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 30, noes 28. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the second reading as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation, child support and international finance institutions and for related purposes. So, Senators, uh, we're shifting the committee stage, so um, please, if you could leave the chamber. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There, there being no objection, is so ordered. Senator Patrick. I uh, wish to move the amendment uh, circulated in my name. I just don't have the details uh, of a running sheet. If someone might better. There's there's no running sheet, so if you just wish to to move uh, your amendment, and you'll need to seek leave. Yep. So I seek leave to move. Is is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Patrick. Okay. So uh, just uh, for the benefit of the chamber, I am moving the same amendment that I moved uh, on the Treasury Bill Number Three, 2019. Uh, bill, uh, which is a bill, which is sorry, is an amendment that seeks to uh, remove from the statutes an exemption for 1,119 1, large proprietary companies from uh, uh, having to lodge an annual return at uh, uh, with ASIC. That uh, uh, creates a situation where there is um, uh, scope for aggressive tax minimisation. That is. Uh, uh, what has been presented to the Senate's uh, com uh, Senate Committee on Corporate Tax Avoidance in the 44th and 45th Parliament. Uh, it also uh, um, cr creates a situation where you have one class of companies and another class of companies. Any new company that comes along uh, that meets the criteria for annual, for annual reports uh, doesn't get an exemption, and we can't have a situation where we, where we, ha where we have elite, uh, wealthy, uh, businesses uh, or business owners uh, simply uh, not having to lodge uh, 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 annual reports. It's also important for anyone who wants to deal with a company to be able to be go to, to go to ASIC 
and get access to reporting information to work out whether the company that they might be dealing with is, uh, is solvent, uh, what, uh, uh, what arrange arrangements they have in the respective organisations and so forth. Uh, there is uh, no justification for retaining this exemption. It was an exemption that was uh, introduced uh, back in 1995 as a temporary measure. Twenty-five years later, uh, it is still uh, in the statutes. Uh, we know from the previous, uh, the previous um, uh, discussion on this uh, last week that the government has no, um, uh, has no uh, policy reason other than they are still considering the 2015 report uh, uh, for, in fact, not supporting this, uh, not, not supporting this amendment. So, uh, I will keep it brief. I just would like uh, the minister to perhaps respond uh, again today whether or not uh, she can present a a, um, uh, a a policy reason for retaining Senator. this exemption. Oh, sorry, my apologies. Um, so, <laughs> I'll ask the minister if you could present a, a policy reason for retaining this exemption. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Uh, Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, this is the second instance of Senator Patrick attaching this amendment to a government bill. It is delaying important measures. The Morrison government is committed to corporate transparency. Uh, the issue raised by the senator's proposed amendment is the subject of a recommendation in the Senate Economics Committee's uh, Corporate Tax Avoidance Report, Part 1, You Cannot Tax What You Cannot See. The government will respond to this recommendation uh, in due course as part of its response to the Senate Economic Committee's Corporate Tax Avoidance Reports. It wouldn't be appropriate to rush this amendment through prior to the government's response to the report being considered. I did have Senator Patrick, and I'll come to you, Senator Gallagher. Just very quickly, Minister, there's a resolution in the Senate that uh, that uh, all committee reports are responded to within three months. Uh, this has uh, gone beyond three years. It's five years since we've uh, received a response from this. Is there any reason that you can give the Senate as to why the government hasn't complied with the resolution of the Senate uh, and, uh, and, and indeed why it has taken so long to respond to this very important uh, Senate committee report? Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, the, Senator Patrick, there's nothing that I can add uh, over and above what has already been put on record uh, by ministers in this place uh, when this amendment has been moved uh, by you in the past. Uh, in relation to the report, uh, we are working through it, uh, and in terms of uh, delivering that response, uh, it will be delivered. We are committed uh, to corporate transparency, uh, but we don't believe uh, that rushing this amendment through prior to uh, the response to that report uh, would be the appropriate way to do it, and particularly on a bill uh, that deals with very, very separate issues. Thank you, Minister. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Um, Labor will be supporting this amendment. and uh, uh, There's a part of me that feels for Senator Seselja having to uh, give an answer like that. Um, not wanting to rush something through that was recommended three years ago, um, five, five years ago and then confirmed three years ago. Um, <laughs> it, I, I imagine the government's focus on this issue might become more urgent as this amendment gets repeatedly put on these bills, as Senator Patrick has indicated he's intending to do. Um, we do believe that um, this amendment is um, worthwhile. We think it's sensible. It increases transparency and consistency in the corporate law system. Um, the com private companies on this list, many owned by Australia's richest and most powerful individuals, are benefiting from an unfair and out-of-date grandfathering regime. And, um, we do believe it increases accountability for large uh, proprietary companies. Um, we've supported this amendment on previous bills and we support it. Uh, and I think, if, if anything, it's going to make the government take this issue more seriously than it perhaps has over the past five years. Thank you. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, the Greens also want to put on record that we'll be supporting this amendment today. Uh, we introduced exactly this same amendment uh, two years ago. Uh, we worked with the Labor Party at the time and the crossbench to uh, try and get up uh, removing grandfathering 
exemptions for some of the most wealthy individuals in this country and for some of the biggest companies in this country not to provide their financial reports to the Australian Securities Investment Commission. Transparency should be in our genes. We can't fix a system until we actually see the problem. And there is no excuse from a public policy point of view. And I'm glad that Senator Patrick has put the same question to Senator Seselja as he did to Senator Hume. What is the public policy purpose of providing an exemption for providing your accounts so they can be publicly scrutinised? Uh, I haven't seen a good response to that question. I think the Australian public are watching this debate and they will continue to watch this debate and look out for your policy response on this. Um, I wanted to take a point that Senator Seselja made because it is a good point. This chamber and this parliament has worked on tax transparency. We have passed some really important legislations working together across party lines. The multinational anti-avoidance bill, which uh, Senator Hume was very keen to provide in some detail yesterday uh, as she filibustered out the debate, but nevertheless it was a very good point made and I was glad she made it. Uh, we have done some really good stuff together in this chamber. And the fact that this anomaly sits there, it sits there and has not been tackled by this chamber, stands out like Chopper Reed at a country women's association morning tea. That's what it stands out like. The more good work we do, the more it looks stupid, anomaly that we haven't actually removed this. Yes, Chopper Reed was a Tasmanian, an honorary Tasmanian there at the end. But however, not, not in my, not, that is not saying that I honour Chopper Reed at all. However. Enough with the chopper. <laughs> oh. Okay. Only because there was some, there was an interjection. There was an interjection that might have suggested that. Nevertheless, order, order. can we can we make this point? We have the ability today to pass this legislation and also remove the grandfathering exemptions. Exemptions brought in over 20 years ago by the Keating government and locked in by the Howard government. We have repeatedly raised this issue. It's been raised in numerous Senate inquiries. It's been raised by the Australian Tax Office at estimates, so on and so forth. There's no excuse for keeping the Australians in the dark. <laughs> in terms of the financial matters of these big companies. Let's do it today. Let's get it out of the way, and then let's get on with our business. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, Senator Lambie. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, I think what we need to bring out in the open here is let's go back to these donations. A thousand, over a 1,000 of these companies, since this grandfathering was put in place over 20 years ago, has donated more than $20 million to the Liberal Party. Pratt Holdings is one of those companies and has since that time has donated over $5 million to the Liberal Party. So I'm wondering, Minister, if you can get up and ensure the Australian public out there that these donations have absolutely nothing, nothing whatsoever to do with why you want to leave this grandfathering in place. Senator Patrick. Uh, uh, just, just a, f a final comment um, uh, in relation to this. Um, uh, as uh, Senator, Senator Gallagher said, uh, I, will, I will be putting this amendment on uh, every Treasury bill that uh, it is possible to uh, put it on. I point out that this uh, is not an inappropriate bill to put it on. It's an omnibus bill, and I'm simply adding in a, uh, a measure to close a loophole. Um, I was speaking with uh, someone on your side of the chamber yesterday, and I won't identify that person, but uh, they said. We have to recognise that on this one we're pregnant. Why don't you just have the baby? Thank you, uh, uh, thank you, Senator Patrick, uh, Minister. Thank you. I'll just briefly respond. Uh, I don't know how to respond to the baby analogy, but uh, I'll respond to the uh, the question from Senator Lambie. And yes, I can assure her uh, that there is no link. Thank you, uh, Minister. So the question before the chair is the amendment moved by Senator Patrick uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think uh, the noes have it. Uh, a division. A division is called uh, for four minutes.
Stop the bells. So the question is that uh, Amendment 8974 by leave together as moved by Senator Patrick be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McCarthy as teller for the ayes and Senator Brockman as teller for the noes.
Order. There being 32 ayes and 28 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. The question, the bill, no so the question is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Beg your pardon. Uh, it's an amended bill. I've just been informed. So the question is that the bill, as amended, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. So the question is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Uh, against? I believe the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Treasury Laws Amendment 2020 Measures No. 2 Bill of 2020 and agreed to it with amendments. Minister. Uh, I move that the report of the committee be adopted. So the question is the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Minister. I move the bill now be read a third time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation, child support and international finance institutions and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day No. 2, Treasury Laws Amendment, Your Superannuation, Your Choice Bill 2019, resumption of second reading debate. I'll just allow um, senators to get to their places. <clears throat> I believe Senator Ayres is in continuation. No, he's not here. I intend to go to Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy President. Um, the Greens are particularly interested in focusing uh, in terms of my contribution today in the second ready debate and also in committee stage uh, on the uh, the bill's uh, defined benefit schemes uh, and, uh, and what that means to uh, employees at uh, Australian universities. Uh, and the amendment uh, under consideration we have before us today applies very narrowly to defined benefit schemes uh, currently admitting new members. Um, now I understand that uh, there are very few defined benefit schemes still open and admitting new members. Uh, this Senate has dealt previously with uh, schemes in relation to public service and uh, especially uh, mil military personnel. Um, but the bill has very serious implications for at least one of them, which is uh, Uni Super, uh, who made a number of submissions to the Senate Economics Committee. Uh, now, while this amendment has narrow uh, application, I should point out an inconsistency in that other defined benefit schemes provided by the Commonwealth, State and Territories are not exposed to the same risks. Uh, the Superannuation Guarantee Administration Regulations 2018, Section 15, already carves out government schemes. So, Without these amendments, from what I know about adverse selection, it seems likely that the new employees in the university sector will not be given the chance to join UniSuper's defined benefit scheme. Uh, that has implications for the next generation of researchers, uh, scientists and lecturers. Um, now, the university sector, I think we all agree uh, in this chamber, plays a very important role in both public education and world-class research. And the Greens have a vision to support a well-funded, high-quality and sustainable university sector. And a number of my colleagues have made this contribution over many years and most recently, of course, most eloquently by Senator Faruqi, uh, who is our higher education spokesperson. Could I perhaps just provide a little bit of context as to why I'm in especially interested in this bill, uh, Deputy President? Uh, I myself worked at the University uh, of Tasmania uh, for uh, nearly ten years, uh, on and off, uh, as a lecturer, in including full-time in my last couple of years before I came into the Senate. And the University of Tasmania has a direct link to this bill today, uh, especially to UniSuper, because UniSuper uh, was actually uh, formulated and established uh, at the University of Tasmania. And uh, for the Tasmanians uh, in the chamber, 
uh, they would be well aware that the University of Tasmania is indeed one of the largest employers uh, in the state. Uh, it used to be the biggest employer. At the moment, it's the second biggest employer. Nevertheless, in my hometown of Launceston, where my electorate office is, it is the biggest employer in Launceston. Uh, and it plays a critical role not just uh, in the economy, uh, but also uh, in the community. In the community. And I would also like to put on record, while I have the opportunity, um, that the Greens are currently campaigning, and I know Labor uh, have, have been supporting us, and I, I, and I, and I ex understand their sympathy from my Tasmanian colleagues to make sure we have continuity, long-term continuity in science funding for our scientists and researchers at the University of Western Australia, at the Marine, uh, in, uh, Marine and Antarctic Studies in Hobart and other institutions, and the Australian Antarctic Division to keep the fantastic world-beating work that they do there uh, going, because that funding uh, faces significant uncertainty. It has fallen off a cliff in 2022 due to research decisions that have been made recently, and that is a critical part of the community in Hobart. We need to make sure we get the government to commit to long-term funding to uh, Australian Antarctic science, to Southern Ocean science and, of course, to climate science uh, in Tasmania. Um, we're also very concerned at the moment, uh, given the COVID uh, situation we found ourselves in, this, this pandemic, uh, that the universities have been particularly hard hit and university workers and employees have been particularly hard hit. Universities themselves are facing immense fiscal challenges with the drop-offs in international student numbers. And we're not sure when they're going to get that certainty back. Uh, we understand it's going to be a very difficult recovery for universities, and yet university workers, casual workers, uh, have been excluded from any kind of stimulus payment by this government. It's made it extremely difficult for university workers. So they face almost a perfect storm of pressures on them at the moment and the risks they face uh, into the future. And we need to do everything we can to help employees uh, at the universities. And we're concerned that this bill, without the amendment presently before the Senate, uh, piles more uncertainty onto a sector already in limbo, a sector fighting to overcome the loss of billions of dollars in income, facing a government determined to avoid its responsibilities to assist this industry at a time of unprecedented crisis. Now, I'm not sure why the government hasn't wanted to assist university workers. But I will say this. It's been really obvious to me in the eight years that I've been in the Senate that the government has continued to reduce funding to universities. They've continued this push to privatisation, to commercialisation of universities. We've seen significant job losses at universities right around the country. And I know my brother, uh, who uh, lectures at a, a major university in Western Australia, is continually talking to me about the pressures that his university have faced over many years in this push to essentially privatise education services. The Greens have often advocated in this place for free higher education, to provide the, exactly what I had when I first went to university, a free degree, to try and give young Australians the certainty they need without having to pay significant amounts of money back to the government and, of course, to provide the numbers that are needed and the funding that are needed to keep uh, employing uh, staff at these universities. So not only are universities facing significant uncertainty with major losses of revenue from student enrolments, the inability to access JobKeeper payments and impending job losses, especially of insecure casual and fixed-term workers, university staff are now facing uncertainty about whether or not they will have access to defined benefit schemes that have been one of the key features of university employment for nearly 40 years. And for those following this debate, uh, defined benefit schemes essentially set a guaranteed payment for, uh, for, for workers and for staff uh, that will go into their, into their retirement. Unfortunately, this will have flow-on effects for the recruitment of new staff, particularly in the regions and, and the rural regions. Uh, and as a Tasmanian, I'm acutely 
aware of the challenges faced in recruiting good staff to regional universities. Uh, it's been one of the major challenges at the University of Western Australia to move the university up the rankings is to get good people to move you to universities. And of course, it's an extremely competitive space. So it will make it harder to attract and retain top staff to, to universities, and it's unhelpful, to say the least. Well, as I mentioned earlier, I'm proud uh, and note that UniSuper is a Tasmanian-led uh, innovation. The fund was conceived by a group of senior administrators at the University of Tasmania in the late 1970s, and the university provided the corporate vehicle to sponsor the establishment of the trustee company known as UniSuper. The provision of a national and fully portable defined benefit scheme has been of considerable assistance to all Australian universities, and this outstanding achievement continues to assist the recruitment and retention of qualified staff, especially, as I mentioned again, in remote and regional parts of our nation. I'd also like to point out that this amendment is not an exemption from choice. And I can see uh, the minister nodding to that. The amendment ensures that all defined benefit schemes are able to operate on similar terms, while ensuring that those fortunate enough to be offered a defined benefit scheme will still be eligible for choice. This amendment allows a contribution to be made in compliance with choice if an enterprise agreement provides for an employee to join a fund of which the relevant person is eligible to become a defined benefit member and only where the fund's governing rules permit the relevant person within a period specified to choose not to remain a defined benefit member and to choose another fund. Uh, while I spoke in this chamber on Treasury Laws Amendment protecting your superannuation package bill back in 2018, uh, I, when I spoke, I expressed concerns about making insurance and superannuation opt-in rather than opt-out. And I think the principle applies equally here. Under the proposed amendments, members are able to opt out of defined benefit arrangements within a two-year period. Without these amendments, it is extremely unlikely that anyone will ever be offered the chance to opt in to a defined benefit scheme owing to the adverse selection risks that have been well documented. It would be a tragedy if a durable and highly performing fund were sacrificed to an inflexible, one-size-all, cookie-cutter, all-choice regime. Doing so would deal enormous blows to product diversity in an industry dominated by the same style of largely uniform accumulation style products. Rejection of this amendment would be all the more ironic as it would signal the government had opted to deny the choice for defined benefit funds to continue to provide first class retirement benefits in the best interests of their present and, importantly, future members. No arguments have been advanced that could possibly justify endangering arrangements which have served the higher education sector exceptionally well for many decades, uh, and I urge senators to support this amendment. Um, the Greens uh, have uh, circulated uh, a Treasury Laws amendment uh, through the chamber, and I look forward to talking more about that and, of course, the uh, Labor Party amendment when we go in committee. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson, and we note that you have moved that second reading amendment. Um, Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy President. And I rise to speak on the uh, superannuation laws amendment to your superannuation, your choice bill of 2019. And I am delighted to talk on the great labour achievement of our modern superannuation scheme, which has ensured that all Australian workers now have a right to a dignified and prosperous retirement. I do want to acknowledge uh, the contribution of uh, Senator Wish Wilson in his remarks around the university sector. Um, like Senator Wish Wilson, I spent some time working in that sector myself, and I'm very much apprised of the very significant challenges faced by that workforce pre-COVID and particularly during the COVID period. And uh, I actually uh, put on the record that I am indeed a continuing member of the National Tertiary Education Union, as it was my last union when I left that workforce to come here to the parliament. This bill amends the Superannuation Guarantee Administration Act of 1992. It ensures employees under workplace determinations or enterprise agreements have the right to choose their superannuation fund. This applies 
only to new workplace determinations and enterprise agreements made on or after 1 July 2020. The bill will allow employees to select a fund that best suits their own circumstances. The lack of super choices can mean that employees who have changed workplaces can end up with multiple super accounts, which can lead to higher fees and charges and potentially paying multiple insurance premiums. More specifically, the bill will allow employees to choose their own superannuation funds where they are employed under a workplace determination or an enterprise agreement that is made on or after 1 July 2018. New employees to whom such a determination or agreement applies must be provided with a standard choice form, and if there is no chosen fund for a new employee, the default fund arrangements apply. An employer does not have to provide existing employees with a form unless requested once a new determination or agreement is made. And where there is no chosen fund for an existing employee, an employer that continues to make compulsory contributions for that employee with the same fund in accordance with the previous determination or agreement will comply with the choice of fund requirements. Labor has always been supportive of super choice and are committed to ensuring that every Australian worker is in a high performing fund and that adequate information is available to empower customers, sorry, consumers with the information that they need to make the choices in their best interests. But I'm worried that this bill proposed by the government, the Liberal National Party, who have so often taken to superannuation to cut it, to contain it, to diminish it, to abolish it, I'm worried that this bill, without significant amendment, does not meet that criteria. While this bill will have minimal, relatively minimal impact on the super sector, given that Industry Super Australia estimates that of those employees covered by an enterprise agreement, only 7.4 per cent have no choice of superannuation fund, which represents 1.9 per cent of the workforce. It will have a significant effect uh, on the retirements of that 1.9 per cent, should this bill pass without amendment. Labor will move an amendment to ensure that there is a provision that allows for workers to bargain for a single fund or set of funds where it is determined by the Fair Work Commission to be in their best interests. Now, this uh, amendment proposed by Labor is a common sense measure that was highlighted in Labor's dissenting committee report on this bill. The report also noted the evidence of the ACTU and UniSuper, which provided uh, to the committee. Uh, enabled the highlighting of the detrimental effect that the bill, unamended, could have on their defined benefit product offering. The amendment that UniSuper provided in the 2.63 uh, of the committee report addresses their concerns and indeed many of my concerns about the effects that this bill could have. Any risk, any risk to defined benefit offerings lessens choice rather than enhances it. And it will achieve the opposite of what this bill claims it seeks to do. We know that we cannot trust this government, this LNP government, with superannuation. I see many colleagues, members of the government on the other side of the chamber, who have previously lambasted Australia's world-class superannuation scheme for a quick social media grab. I note Senator Rennick from Queensland who claimed in a speech last year in this chamber that superannuation was a cancer. He actually said that. To describe superannuation as a cancer, this is a disgusting slur on all those who have suffered cancer. And as the co-chair of the Parliamentary Friends for Cancer Care and Cure, I was revolted and sickened by that comment. It was ill-judged. Super is an enhancement of people's lives. And no one thinks that about cancer. Superannuation has allowed thousands of Australians to share in the dignity of retirement funded in full or in part by the benefits of superannuation, formerly a privilege that was restricted to public servants, politicians and senior managers in the banking and financial industries. I can tell you that when I grew up in uh, Curran Street, Blacktown and Aurelia Street to in Gabby and then uh, Kings Clare Street in Lumia in Campbelltown. There weren't too many conversations over the back fence about how the superannuation was ticking over. 
There weren't too many conversations about what a defined benefit was. And that gap in the difference of financial literacy was only taken seriously by one party, that is the Labor Party, who <coughs> instituted super, superannuation. And that's why we have to watch so carefully what this government seek to do. They were never committed to delivering superannuation for every Australian. They were ha quite happy to preserve it as a right for the well-employed in the public service and the wealthy who could, uh, uh, who could uh, afford the advice to set up such structures. Senator Rennick bemoaned the management fees taken by superannuation firms and consultants, but he's been silent on the billions of dollars that this government forks out to consultant firms while sacking thousands of frontline public service servants like our posties. Shame on this LNP government. I also note Senator Bragg yeah, from the home state, my home state of New South Wales was reported recently as suggesting in his book that workers raid their super to purchase a home. It just reveals what a total lack of understanding and a continuing ideological uh, push against the benefits of superannuation for Australia reside still in this government. This uh, raid on superannuation was also the Liberal National Party's answer to economic privations in the pandemic, which saw $14 billion ripped out of the super scheme, out of people's future savings, out of people's retirement, to be spent on a range of things, including, sadly, online gambling and needless purchases. And that is even before the next phase of a raid is undertaken. And it's because this government is so loose with how it handles money, despite its rhetoric about being great money managers. People should not forget, this is the party that lost $60 billion in a few weeks—$60 billion their figures were out by. They could have left people with their super intact. They could have supported the Australian people better through this COVID crisis, but they failed. And they have compromised people's futures and retirements with regard to super by the actions they have taken in their ideological Bent. The contribution from Senator Bragg to the debate on superannuation in recent times only serves to undermine a system that is responsible for giving millions of workers a comfortable retirement. And I also notice that uh, the Prime Minister's scheme to allow Australians to withdraw super bills, super um, to pay bills, was so riddled with fraud that it had to temporarily be freezed in order for a correction to that structure. My office had to help locals who had thousands of dollars stolen from their accounts by criminals, and yet government ministers have, haven't yet revealed, because they don't come into this place and transparently reveal the truth. In fact, Question Time is an exercise in watching them painfully hide from the truth. They have not yet revealed exactly how many fraudulent claims have been made. Neither do we know yet what the government is doing to compensate victims after the ATO directed their super fund to make a payment to a fraudulent account. Now, this government's got form on the shonky ways of moving Australians' money away from them in unedifying and unpalatable ways. Think about robo-debt, illegally constructed debts by this government sent to hundreds of thousands of Australians, which they now need to repay. They don't care about helping Australians manage their money in ways that are sage and sensible. Rather, they take any opportunity they can to raid, to raid Australian savings and to make them more at risk in terms of their finances. In terms of choice, Labor supports that concept, but choice is not the most pressing issue right now in the superannuation sector. Rather, it's a retirement savings gender gap. According to the National Advocacy Group Women in Super, an older woman generally retires with 47 per cent less superannuation than a man. And yet, women, we will very likely outlive men by at least five years. There's also, uh, they're also likely to the family's most active caregiver, as well as the ones who are most likely to take time off to care for children or elderly relatives, further denuding their super compared to men. Now, this is a problem far more pressing than the issue of choice 
for, is for super of 1.9 per cent of Australia's workforce. But that is not what the government is choosing to focus on, and that is not the legislation that's before us. Rather, we have this. So instead of solutions, we have, uh, we have crickets from the government opposite. Superannuation firms have also been active in addressing the gender wage gap and its knock-on effects in retirement savings. With average lower earnings, breaks from their career to begin families and longer life expectancy, women face a far different picture to men when it comes to superannuation. Yet some superannuation funds uh, are taking up that challenge. I want to acknowledge in particular the work of the SDA and the Super Fund REST, who have both campaigned very hard to support their majority female workforce in their goal for equitable treatment in retirement. Super should be gradually increased as we face an ageing population and with healthcare and aged care costs continuing to soar. I note the SDA union recommended several, several sensible changes to the current superannuation system, which would go further than anything this bill proposes to make Australia's super scheme more equitable. These suggestions offered by the SDA in their submissions to important inquiries of this place ensure superannuation is compulsory through the award system and universal through the creation of a new indicative model of retirement income, with the first next step being 12 per cent superannuation on all income. The removal of $450 per month earning thresholds and ensuring superannuation is paid on parental leave and through the application of representative governance model for all superannuation. This is a result of the important work, the important civic work that the SDA as an exemplary union takes on on behalf of its members, in addition to supporting them in their workplaces, standing guard against the attacks, the savage attacks on the working rights and the superannuation rights of these Australian people, particularly women. These suggestions would attempt to balance the effect of penalty rates cuts on these workers, as well as give millions more Australian women the opportunity of a dignified retirement. Currently in Australia, older women are, fastest, are the fastest growing co cohort of homeless people in Australia. According to census data, the number of women aged 65 to 74 describing themselves as homeless increased by 51 per cent in the five years to 2016. Shame on this government for presiding over that. Shame on them for their failure in terms of responding to the housing needs of older Australians. Shame on them for taking away the opportunity for improvements in terms of superannuation for Australian women in particular. With a social housing waiting list in my home state of decades, not years, many will find themselves on the waiting list in their 50s who will die before they actually ever get near into getting into a house. And this government continually incentivises people to pillage super, to pay daily bills in an economic crisis rather than offer real and sustained government help. Like everything else, this government's answer is to throw everything out to the free market to that perfect neoliberal goal of choice, which they dress up uh, as something much greater than it can actually ever bear. But as Martin Luther King Jr. said, what good is having the right to sit at a lunch counter if you can't afford to buy a hamburger? Choice is all well and good, but it's hardly the most pressing issue that this government could determine to undertake uh, with legislation. I support the measures that will make this bill work in keeping with that honoured tradition of collective bargaining alive. And I support amendments to this bill that will allow workers to bargain for a single fund or set of Thank funds, you, Senator as well as adequate measures to ensure. Expired. Senator Green. Noisy. Thanks, Senator O'Neill. Senator Green. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure the Senate won't mind the short interruption. Uh, Thank you, and I'm um, pleased to follow Senator O'Neill because she raises some very important points about this bill and about the government's uh, attitude towards superannuation. And I wanted to add my voice to that debate today. 
I've heard or seen comments um, from the government that uh, Labor senators or members opposite um, are trying to waste the Senate's time by contributing to this debate today. And that couldn't be further than the truth, because I think it's important to understand what the government is doing uh, as part of this broader debate around superannuation. And I know that it's very clever of the government to call this bill your superannuation, your choice, because it gives them an opportunity to get up here and talk about cho choice in super and um, beat their ideological drum about what they have planned for superannuation in this country. Uh, but it does concern me greatly that this um, is another opportunity for the government to talk about their plans to raid Australian superannuation. We know that this uh, bill is um, limited in its scope and it's talking about a small amount of workers who at the moment are covered by an enterprise agreement um, that directs the superannuation fund that they um, use. And the, the amendments to this bill um, seek to uh, make sure that people are able to collectively bargain in their workplace, um, while also supporting the um, principles behind the bill around choice. Um, but we know that this is uh, part of an ideological debate that the Liberals are waging against superannuation. The Liberal National Party opposed compulsory superannuation when Labor introduced it in 1992, and they have been fighting this war ever since. But they really have taken it up a notch lately, haven't they? They've really uh, taken up the, the, the memes and the, the, um, uh, they're even writing books about it. They're um, getting op-eds written in the paper about just what they're going to do for super, to superannuation and to um, Australian workers' superannuation. They've said in this place that superannuation should be voluntary, and they've said that many times. That is not a one-off gaffe from one member of the Liberal Party. Um, we've had many members in this uh, place uh, say that superannuation should be voluntary, and obviously that is deeply concerning because we know that for many Australian workers, superannuation is the only way that they will be able to afford a dignified retirement. And we know particularly that there are many women in this country at the moment who did not have access to superannuation or worked in part-time positions for many years raising their children who have severely depleted superannuation funds at this moment compared to the men that were working at the same time as them. So I am deeply concerned about any attacks, any attacks on compulsory superannuation that would stop Australian workers who desperately need to have money for their retirement saved for that purpose. What the government is trying to do is to pretend that they care about the wages of low-income earners. And we know that that is nonsense because the Liberal National Party has never stood up for the working conditions of Australia's lowest paid workers, and they never will. The coalition has opposed the advancement of superannuation every step of the way. They opposed it when we introduced it, and they sought to undermine it ever since. Compulsory superannuation is a national achievement created by Labor and it stands alongside the NDIS and Medicare as a system which makes our country fairer and stronger. But I want to talk about one aspect of this debate, and that is this, uh, proposals from members of the government around extending early access of superannuation payments. Because it's one of these ideological fronts that the Liberals have been waging, and they've, they've said that the coronavirus pandemic has actually shown that more people should have access to their super for more reasons. Um, for example, Liberal John Alexander has floated the idea about using super to buy a home, and I'll talk about that proposal a little bit further. But I want to make this clear. The primary purpose of superannuation is to provide for a dignified retirement for every Australian. That is the primary purpose of superannuation. 
That is why, right now, there are provisions that allow for early access of superannuation, but only in very limited circumstances. And these circumstances include compassionate grounds, severe financial hardship, terminal medical conditions, which is very difficult because there are, um, I know that there are people who find themselves in that situation of getting that very difficult news of being terminally ill, um, and they know that they have their super there to count on in those very difficult times. A temporary um, incapacity and permanent incapacity are the other times when people are able to access their super. And we know that super has been used, super accounts have been used as a way to save for a home by withdrawing voluntary payments. And the reason that Labor has always argued to keep these reasons limited is because we don't want super to fix the policy mistakes of this government. We don't want people to not have super in their retirement or in those very limited circumstances when they're very ill, when they're given the absolute worst news that they need to tie up their affairs. If you have a friend who has gone through that, I know I've got a friend who has been given that news recently and they've had to rely on their super. I cannot imagine what it would have been like to not have that superannuation to depend on in those circumstances. Expanding the circumstances where super can be withdrawn will reduce the super balances for thousands of Australians. It'll increase the demand on age pensions, which will you know, have an impact on the budget bottom line. That's what the government's always talking about but also leave Australians with less money to use when they really need it. And here's the other thing. Allowing Australians or talking to Australians about withdrawing their super to fix a problem of the government's own making should ring alarm bells with people in the electorate. Because when we're talking about withdrawing super because housing has become so unaffordable, what does the government do? Do they build more social housing? Do they talk about how they're going to make housing more affordable? Do they um, make a, a plan to build better cities, to make them more connective, to build better transport so people aren't having to travel so far from their workplace? No, they don't do that. They say, well, you can use your retirement savings for this instead. Senator Bragg has even said the reality is a first home is much more important than super. And no one is saying that a first home is not important. But what you're saying is that people don't deserve both, that they don't deserve a home and a dignified retirement. That's what you're saying to people like nurses and teachers who are out there working and saving. They're saying you, that the government doesn't want to do the hard work to make housing more affordable. What they want to do is raid people's retirement savings. Because we know that people, Australian workers, need those retirement savings later on in life. They will be relying on them. But instead of doing something to make housing more affordable, instead of trying to fix that problem, they just want to come in and raid superannuation savings. It's lazy. It's pompous. It shows that you've got no idea what workers go through. It shows you have no appreciation for how difficult it is for people to save for their retirement. And it shows that you're completely out of touch with the purpose of superannuation in the first place to provide a dignified retirement for Australian workers. So I want Australians out there to be very careful, very careful when they hear this rhetoric from the Liberal National Government. Because when the, when the government is saying to Australians that they want to open up early access for super payments for other purposes, I want Australians to consider why that is and what policy failure from this government has created that problem in the first place. We've seen the same thing happen with young workers during this pandemic. Instead of relying on government support, instead of being included in JobKeeper, many young Australians have had to rely on their superannuation to support themselves 
through this pandemic. This is a government which is setting up millions of younger Australians to be in a weaker position in their retirement. Already we have seen that 500,000 young workers under the age of 30 have dipped into their super early. This makes up one third of all early super applicants. In many cases, young workers have been left with no choice other than to empty all of their retirement savings. All of their retirement savings are gone. And that might not mean much if you're 25 years old and you, and you consider that you've got a long time before your retirement. But again, what it points to is that this government isn't prepared to do the work, to build the policies, to give the support to young people. Instead, they said you can use your superannuation because we're not going to give you the support that you need. In the short term, this scheme is expected to cost the budget $1.1 billion in lost revenue because we know that this does have an impact on the budget as well. And in the long term, it means that less Australians will be able to support their retirement, and that will mean more people demanding on the pension system. And we also know that this hasn't happened in a vacuum. Industry super analysis shows in North Queensland alone, 65,000 workers have been shortchanged super, and that the government offered an amnesty to businesses that have systematically underpaid their workers. So not only do we have a situation where workers are being asked to rely on their super during the most difficult economic time in their lives, but it's off the back of years of underpayment of superannuation. The coalition has used every opportunity to undermine super, including this pandemic, and that is completely disgraceful. We should be strengthening the systems that support people during this pandemic, not making them weaker. We even know that their incompetence has opened the door to widespread fraud in the early access super scheme. I was listening to Triple J Hack last night. We know that some people said the, the government just made it so easy to get this money. They made it so easy that we've seen fraud as a result of this government's incompetence. Look, at the end of the day, superannuation is there for one reason, to provide Australians with a dignified retirement. And every time that the government comes in here and tries to reduce the access that people have to that dignified retirement, Labor will come in here and show you out. We will stand in here and explain to people exactly what you're up to. Because you can create your shiny memes and you can talk about, you know, um, you can write your books and do your op eds, but at the end of the day, workers understand that superannuation is there for their retirement. Because we know that this government won't be supporting workers in their retirement. They will have to do it on their own. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Green. And I'll Senator Billick. Thank you, Deputy President. I too rise to speak on the Treasury Law Amendment to your superannuation, your choice bill 2019. Labor has a very proud track record when it comes to superannuation, and we will continue to fight for a stronger and fairer superannuation system. Compulsory, superannu compulsory superannuation created by Labor is a national achievement which sits alongside Medicare and the NDIS as major nation-building reforms. It has made our nation stronger and it's made our society fairer. Prior to the introduction of compulsory superannuation, most Australians only had the age pension to rely on in their retirement. The introduction of compulsory superannuation was a revolutionary policy and achievement of the Hawke-Keating government. Labor and the union movement fought for and won compulsory employer-paid superannuation. And we did this through national worker-led campaigns, together with legislative action in this parliament, that today has resulted in a universal workplace right to occupational superannuation. And this right was once only available to people like us, to politicians, to public servants, 
senior managers and long-serving employees in certain industries, such as, let's remember, the banking and financial services industry. So, as I said, superannuation is a universal right and one that is enjoyed by all people in this building, not just those that sit in this place or any other place, and across, it's available across every industry and sector. Compulsory superannuation has been an incredible success. It provided a new system for funding retirement incomes, and this not only creates a retirement nest egg for Australians, the savings are being invested in infrastructure and business which are generating wealth and creating jobs. Superannuation assets totaled $2.7 trillion at the end of the March 2020 quarter. Our super system is world class and has created a huge new pool of capital that can invest in Australian business. According to the Willis Towers Watson's Global Pension Asset Study 2019, Australia remained the world's fourth largest pension market with Australia's superannuation, superannuation assets rising to 131 per cent of GDP in 2018 up from 67 per cent a decade before. And this latest ratio was the second highest among the 22 major pension markets covered by the survey. Now, on this side, we know that the Liberal Party has always opposed universal superannuation, and we see it once again today. It was opposed by the then Leader of the Opposition, Mr John Howard, when it was first introduced, and he brought this opposition to government when he became Prime Minister. The Howard government's 1996 decision to abandon the Keating government's 15 per cent superannuation guarantee cost the average Australian worker roughly $250,000 in accumulation over their working life. Fundamentally, superannuation is still opposed by the Liberals now. And the Morrison government has used the COVID-19 crisis as, as an excuse to escalate its decade-long ideological war against super in general and industry super in particular. Coalition governments have used every opportunity to undermine superannuation, including the current process that has seen two million Australians resorting to accessing more than $13 billion in personal retirement savings. And why have they been forced to access these savings? Because of the gaping hole in government support. Now, this government's track record and ideological opposition to industry super funds gives me cause to be more than a little bit cynical about the reasons behind this bill, let alone the name. We know that those opposite come up with these lovely caring names for their bills. But beneath that, that first um, page of the bill, we know there is often situations where workers are going to be worse off. I believe this bill is just a demonstration once again of the ideological opposition to industry super funds that, as I said, those opposites so often portray. And it's interesting to note that the ideological opposition to industry super funds goes even further among some members of the Liberal National Party caucus. You know, we've seen Senator Bragg um, call for all kinds of superannuation to be made voluntary for people earning under $50,000 a year, and he was backed up in that call, uh, as the previous speaker mentioned, by members of his caucus. And then, of course, Senator Rennick. Yes, that very same senator that said, we do not want the hand of government reaching in and taking away our children's youth in regard to a debate on early childhood education. Senator Rennick on the 13th of November called, for, called superannuation a cancer, stating in his speech, millions of dollars get sucked out of the pockets of the battlers in the bush and sent to the blowhards in Sydney and Melbourne. Well, let me just say, as a cancer survivor, I was mortified to hear that comment. I don't think anybody from any party should refer to especially a hard one and for, for benefit for workers as a cancer. And I did take great umbrage at that comment, and I'm glad to be able to put on the record today how angry, and I was angry, that that comment made me. And I know other cancer survivors and cancer sufferers 
uh, throughout um, certainly my state of Tasmania, because some of them spoke to me about it, but also throughout Australia. So the government just refused to listen to advice, and that's why they put so much of the hard-earned superannuation savings of Australians at risk. We've seen billions taken from the accounts of our lowest-waged employees. And of course, we know that in early May the government were forced to temporarily freeze the scheme because of fraud. The Australian Federal Police have still not ruled out the involvement of organised and offshore crime in this fraud. I'm not quite sure what the government's doing because they're yet to reveal how many fraudulent claims have been made or what the government is doing to compensate victims after the ATO directed their super fund to make a payment to a fraudulent account. And it's also been reported that there is an alarming trend of super funds being plunged directly into online gambling. And we all know that that cannot be good. If true, the embattled government scheme may be boosting the profits of dodgy overseas gambling businesses instead of stimulating the economy and addressing cases of real hardship. But we know that those opposite don't care, and they certainly don't care about super. I call upon the minister responsible and the prime minister to come clean with that information that needs to be asked about that fraudulent activity. We've got a government that is intent on attacking work workers' wages and their conditions and their ability to better organise for better rights at work, but now it wants to destroy their retirement income. Do you just want everyone to end up on the pension? Is that what it's about? Because I can explain to you that with an ageing population, that's not going to be a very smart move on your behalf. The rate of superannua superannuation guarantee has been scheduled to progressively rise to 12 per cent in 22, but of course was frozen by the Abbott government in 2014. And when the superannuation system was designed, it was intended that the guarantee would rise. Analysis by Industry Super Australia shows if the super, super guarantee moved to 12 per cent, as the last Labor government intended, a 30-year-old male earning $85,000 a year would stand to gain $147,000 from their super by the time they reach retirement, compared with if the super guarantee was frozen at 9.5 per cent. And separately, a 30-year-old woman earning $85,000 a year who takes time off work to have children could gain up to $93,000. Now, in the last 12 months, $20 billion of superannuation assets have moved into the not-for-profit not sector, with consumers in search of lower fees and higher performance. Choice is already happening. While too many Australians still retire without adequate retirement savings, our super system needs to be strengthened and protected, not undermined. It's clear that every move that this government makes is to undermine the most successful retirement savings scheme in the world. Now, the bill we're debating today is entirely designed to continue this attack. It wants to dismantle the system we have in order to advantage, guess what, the mates of those opposite in the banking sector. Let me be clear. Industry funds benefit members, not big banks, as those opposite would wish to do. They outperform retail funds again and again. And I'd like to quote a report by the McKell Institute that says, and I quote, available evidence demonstrates a clear causal relationship between not-for-profit representative government's funds and high levels of returns for members. Both raw and risk-adjusted research supports the proposition that the two governance models produce significantly different returns for their members. And also from the report, they state that, and I quote, in 2013, Industry Super Australia concluded that had all superannuation funds returned the 5.7 per cent long-term annual average of not-for-profits, of not-for-profit funds, Australia's retirement savings would be $88 billion higher. In 2016, a similar analysis showed that if retail funds had earned the same returns as industry super funds between 1996 and 2015, Australia's pool of super retirement savings would be roughly $105 billion greater, an increase of more than 5 per cent than the actual situation. 
So based on those figures, an individual member with a starting balance of $20,000 could have been $36,000 better off by using an industry fund. But those opposite want employees to be forced into slickly marketed funds which promise the world but in the end just return super profits to the big bank. They don't really care about choice, as I've said. It's entirely a cover for enriching their mates. They want to ensure that dodgy employers can force employees into the super fund of their bank's choice for the employer's own profit. And if they did care about Australians, about Australians having better retirement savings, they wouldn't have cut the super guarantee in 1996 and 2014. And they wouldn't have Senator, Senator Rennick over there saying superannuation is a cancer and should be made voluntary. In fact, they probably shouldn't have him over there at all with some of the comments he's come out with. Labor supports choice in superannuation, but we are also committed to making sure every worker is in a high-performing fund and that adequate information is available to empower consumers with the information they need to make choices in their best interests. Labor remains concerned that there is a significant risk to defined benefit offerings that will lessen choice and achieve the opposite objective to what the bill intends. Now, Labor referred the super choice legislation to the Senate Economics Legislation Committee to ensure the bill had no unforeseen or unintended consequences, which left super fund members worse off or with less choice. And in their dissenting report, Labor senators noted the ACT use evidence, highlighting the detrimental effects that the bill could have on defined benefit product offerings. The ACTU said, should the, should the bill pass, some superannuation funds would need to re-evaluate how and if they could offer their products. Unisuper is one of the best performing super funds in the country. It offers one of the rarest and most valuable retirement products available, which is an open defined benefit scheme. This is an incredibly generous product which guarantees re retirement incomes for life, and that is why the National Tertiary Education Union bargains for this fund for their workers. Its viability is centred on longevity, risk of each member and the fact that it is compulsory. If workers were to choose to be a member, then this would be evidence of self-selection into the fund and thus would increase the risk of the product failing. Should the bill pass, the fund could seriously reconsider the offering of the product to its members and potentially close off entry to one of the most beneficial outcomes for hundreds of thousands of members. The ACTU opposes this bill and is seeking amendments which would would protect workers in circumstances where, there would, where they would be better off having a single fund. So Labor also noted evidence from Unisuper that similarly highlighted the detrimental effect that the bill unamended could have on the defined benefit product offering. And they also provided, uh, Unisuper also provided to the committee an amendment that addresses their concerns. Labor will move amendments to address the issues raised by Unisuper to the Senate Economics Committee inquiry into the bill relating to defined benefit schemes in order to ensure that the bill does not inadvertently threaten the viability of these schemes. We all know, any of us on this side know, that workers are better off as a result of collective bargaining. An industry super Australia estimates that of those employees covered by enterprise agreements, only 7.4 per cent have no choice of superannuation fund, and this represents just 1.9 per cent of the Thank workforce. Thank you, Senator Billick. Your time has expired. Minister. Thank you, Deputy President. First, I would like to thank those senators who have contributed to this debate today and yesterday. This bill addresses a long-running issue in, superannuation, in the superannuation system and will mean better outcomes for many, many Australians. The Productivity Commission noted the current system that restricts choice of fund for some members, funds for some members can, in fact, discourage member engagement and concluded that this reform was much needed. The Productivity Commission report also highlighted the negative effects that holding unintended multiple superannuation accounts were having on millions of Australians through duplicate fees and insurance premiums. The government took action on this through its Protecting Your Superannuation package uh, to address the stock of these duplicate accounts. And this bill is the next step, which ensures that Australians are not forced into having multiple accounts because of their enterprise agreement or similar determination. It will also encourage greater member engagement, it will promote competition and it will address situations where a member disagrees with the choice of fund that their employer has made for them. 
While choice is vital, as Central Alliance pointed out in its additional comments to the Senate Committee on this bill, informed choice is equally as important. And improving members' ability to make informed choices by providing simple and accessible comparison information about superannuation products was in fact a key recommendation of that Productivity Commission landmark report on the superannuation system. Uh, while a number of recommendations from that Productivity Commission report have already uh, been addressed, including uh, a retirement income review, uh, the Treasurer is, is currently considering a more comprehensive response to that Productivity Commission report and will issue that response in due course. However, the government has committed to changing the way that people are defaulted into superannuation products, including to ensure that members are only defaulted one time. Preventing people from languishing in underperforming funds will underpin any changes that we make to default superannuation. This bill is the first step in providing choice, improving competition and improving outcomes for members, and the bill will commence on 1 July 2020. Now, I have listened very carefully to all the contributions in, to this debate, and they have been impassioned and they have been sincere. But in all honesty, they have largely also been somewhat irrelevant, very ideological and often just plain wrong. So I think it's important to acknowledge some of the straw men of this argument. This bill has nothing to do with the early release of Super Scheme, which is an initiative that was supported by the Labor Party and has been supported by now over two million Australians who have been grateful for the access to their superannuation in this temporary scheme during a period of financial distress. This bill has nothing to do with undermining enterprise bargaining negotiations. Unions can still collectively bargain wages and conditions. They can still name a default fund. This bill doesn't change the default system one iota. Those who don't do choose a fund, their employer can still do it for them. This bill has nothing to do with the industry versus retail versus public versus corporate versus self-managed super debate. Indeed, diversity within this sector is fundamental to the premise of this bill. Competition is good. It drives down fees. We want all sectors to thrive. In the same vein, this bill has nothing to do with uh, the debate between defined benefit and defined contribution. Again, quite the opposite. We would like to see more people be able to choose the fund that suits them best, including defined benefit schemes. Mm -hmm. This bill has nothing to do with wage theft. It has nothing to do with super theft. It has nothing to do with the extent of the rollout of single-touch payroll, an initiative, I might add, that this government has implemented and it has been possibly the most effective deterrent to wage and super theft ever initiated by Parliament. This bill, your super, your choice, has nothing to do with any of those things. And if they are the arguments that this Senate is prosecuting here, you have either intentionally or inadvertently misunderstood this bill. It's about a basic and fundamental right, which is choice to do with what you want with your own money. In the same way that we don't let our employers choose our bank account or our bank and we make that choice a condition of employment, so too should we not let our employers choose our super fund. This bill removes the ability of an employment agreement to demand that you contribute to a particular super fund as a condition of that employment. This is even more important in a system where superannuation is compulsory. When the government mandates that nearly $1 in 10 of your hard-earned wages must be quarantined, and potentially for up to 45 years, surely, surely you should at least have some say as to where that money is invested and what it's invested in. So choice is indeed a logical and necessary corollary of compulsion. In Australia, we compel people to vote, but we don't tell them who to vote for or force them to vote for someone that they don't want. Well, in Australia, we also compel people to contribute to superannuation to save money for retirement. And similarly, we shouldn't tell them where to save their money or which fund they should contribute to. Moreover, 
the Financial Systems Inquiry, the Productivity Commission and indeed the Fair Work Commission have all made it abundantly clear that denying or even restricting choice has long-term impacts on superannuation savings and casuals are particularly vulnerable. Hand on heart, despite what you may have heard from those opposite, I am a super believer and all the things that I have ever said in this chamber, in public and in private, attest to this. And to those opposite, you know it, you know it. But if you think that the system we have now is perfect, if you think it's actually serving the workers that you represent as best as it could, if you think that high fees, that duplicate accounts, that inappropriately applied insurances, that unnecessary op opacity and complexity, that persistently underperforming funds that without this bill will have the ability to lock disengaged workers into for years and years of erosion of their retirement savings, if you think that's all okay, then are you really doing the right thing by the people you claim to represent? I cannot understand why you are circling the wagons on this issue. Super is good. But it can be so much better. This bill is not about dismantling super, quite the opposite. Your super, your choice, is about building a superannuation system that will serve Australians well for the next 30 years. And surely that is something that we all want. I commend this bill to the Senate. So the question is, the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The oh, the ayes have it. The nose have it. Division required. Ring the bells. to 162 metres from this chair to that chair. It's a par three. <laughs> I just measured it, it's a par three. We were talking about whether it was a par four or a par three. It's definitely a par three. Oh, it's possible. They are very long.
stop the bells. The question is that the bill be read a second time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Davey Teller for the ayes, Senator Urquhart Teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 31, noes 25. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Superannuation Guarantee Administration Act 1992 and for related purposes. Just wait for a temporary chair to not allowed to chair this session. Uh, is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is, the bill stand as printed? Senator McAllister. Uh, thanks, Chair. I seek leave to move items two to four <coughs> on sheet 8871, revised together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator McAllister. I move items two to four on sheet 8871 revised relating to defined benefit schemes. As we've made clear in this debate, Labor supports choice in superannuation, but we are committed to making sure that every worker is in a high performing fund and that adequate information is available to empower consumers with the information they need to make choices that are in their best interests. And we are concerned that there is a significant risk that this bill poses to defined benefit offerings. And we're concerned that the effect of this risk will be to lessen choice and to achieve the opposite of what this bill purports to achieve. This amendment specifically addresses the issues raised by Unisuper uh, when they appeared before the Senate Economics Committee inquiry into the bill. It uh, addresses issues relating to defined benefit schemes in order to ensure that the bill does not inadvertently threaten the viability of those schemes. So we, uh, uh, Senator Wish Wills. Yes, just just before you you move on, uh, uh, Deputy Chair, that uh, the Greens will be supporting these amendments. So the question is that uh, opposition amendments two to four on sheet eight eight seven one revised two by leave taken together. That those amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the ayes have it. No. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bell.
stop lock <laughs> stop the bells <laughs> yeah stop the clock that's it um, so the question is that the amendments on 8871, two to four, as moved by Senator McAllister, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Davey as teller for the noes. Order, there being 25 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. It being just after 12.45, I shall now report progress. The committee reports progress. Pursuant to order, I shall now call upon senators' statements. and I'll call Senator Askew. I'll just give senators a moment to get to their respective spots. Senator Askew. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise today to acknowledge the 70th anniversary of the Korean War, which began on 25 June 1950, when North Korean forces invaded South Korea. Australian Army, Royal Australian Air Force and Royal Australian Navy personnel fought to defend South Korea as part of the United Nations multinational force. This war ended on 27 July 1953, three years and one month, almost to the day after it began, with some Australian defence personnel staying on as part of the peacekeeping force until 1957. The Australian War Memorial has an extensive range of documents and artefacts relating to the Korean War. During my research, I found that the United Nations Commission on Korea was established in 1948 to monitor the withdrawal of World War II occupation forces from Korea. However, in May 1950, as war loomed on the Korean Peninsula, two Australian military observers, Major Peach and Squadron, Rankin, Squadron Leader Rankin, were on the ground monitoring activity. They were Australia's smallest peacekeeping contingent, but vitally important, as they were the only UNCOK observers in place when North Korea invaded South Korea. It was their report that proved North Korea had initiated hostilities, which was the evidence that the UN needed to intervene. Senator Dean Smith and I moved a Senate motion to mark the 70th anniversary of the Korean War last month. We moved that the Senate note, 25th of June 1950, would mark, sorry, 19, 2020, would mark the 70th anniversary of the start of the Korean War and that the 24th of April 2021 marked the 70th anniversary of the Battle of Kapiong. The Battle of Kapiong is considered a decisive conflict that resulted in significant Australian sacrifice—32 soldiers killed, 59 wounded and three imprisoned. The successful motion also noted the number of Western Australians who perished in the Korean War, 
those who have deceased since, and the surviving veterans. However, the motion was also an acknowledgement of the more than 700 Tasmanians who fought in this war. While many listening here today might know of the Korean War through historical studies or the popular US television series MASH, I have a personal connection to this conflict through my family that I would like to share with you today. My uncle, Douglas, better known as Doug Bushby, worked as a UN accredited war correspondent during the Korean War, and my father, Max Bushby, OBE, joined his brother towards the end of the war as a correspondent too. In his role as a war correspondent, Doug Bushby covered the war itself, but he is better known for his films and photographs depicting the scenes that went on behind the conflict that were caused as a result of the war itself. Some of this work can be viewed at the Australian War Memorial, not far from here, with this exhibition accompanied by relics that my uncle brought home to Launceston with him when he returned. He subsequently donated many of these items to the War Memorial. One of these items is a full-length feature film Doug Bushby made about the Korean War, which was edited in Hollywood. But one of the most significant pieces is a photograph of my uncle holding a red silk communist peace flag and a certificate. The flag was taken from the Chinese lines at Hook, which has also been documented as Bloody Hook, after being the scene of one of the final battles in this war. The Chinese flew four peace flags from their positions on a ridge line opposite the 2nd Battalion, the Royal Australian Regiment, to RAR, just after the ceasefire came into force. The red flag my uncle held included signatures from two Australian lieutenants, a Chinese major and the Korean Army's <coughs> Chief of Staff, all of which were signed on the day peace was declared. Two ARA were stationed in Pakapunyal in Victoria prior to, prior to leaving for Korea on the 5th of March 1953 on board the MV New Australia. They arrived in Korea on the 17th of March and patrolled the no man's land to the north of UN lines, including sections of the Jamestown line and the hill I referred to earlier called Hook. On the 24th of July 1953, Chinese forces attacked two RAR and a US Marine Regiment at Hook, and this battle continued on the 25th of July. The two RAR held firm against these attacks, and the Chinese forces abandoned Hook on the morning of 26th of July. The armistice came into effect at 10 p.m. the following night. My uncle was visiting the Australian troops just after the ceasefire in August 1953 and asked the Australian soldiers if they could make contact with the Chinese. This was arranged and Doug Bushby gifted his wallet to an English-speaking Chinese officer, Shuang Shon Kuang, asking if he could have one of the four flags in exchange. Two flags were retrieved from the ridgeline and the Chinese officer presented a red flag and a green flag to the Australians, inscribing both flags with Doug's pen. The red peace flag, which my uncle kept, says, and I quote, presented by the Chinese People's Volunteers, we Chinese want peace and the British want peace too. We will unite to bring peace to the whole world, end quote. The certificate my uncle holds in his left hand was a citation for service to the chaplain corps. It was presented to him by the Korean Army Chief of Staff and Republic of Korea Navy Chief of Naval Operations, Rear Admiral Park Ok Gai on the 6th of August 1953. My uncle published a translation of the citation in his book, Adventures in Revival. The inscription reads, To Douglas Bushby, United Nations War Correspondent, you have largely contributed to newly organise the Republic of Korea Navy as a member of war correspondents to the United Nations from the period of April 1953 to August 1953. You have distributed a large quantity of religious tracts and pamphlets regarding the unfavourable conditions in order to inspire the morale and encourage the religious faith among the officers and men of our Navy and Marine Corps. Especially you served in the fierce battle, under line, uh, un, battle line under the shower of enemy shells by taking pictures of real battle scenes and spreading them throughout the United Nations. Therefore, I sincerely confer you this letter of appreciation. Mr Bushby, an accredited UN accredited war correspondent and devout Christian, committed much of his time to relief and missionary work amongst Korean refugees, orphans and North Korean and Chinese prisoners of war." End quote. As mentioned, while in Korea during, my, during the war, my uncle spent a lot of time providing relief and conducting missionary work for the Korean refugees, orphans and North Korean and Chinese prisoners of war. 
There is another photo showing him being presented with a bunch of flowers by a North Korean prisoner of war and a prisoner of war chaplain when he accompanied US Army Chaplain Harold Vocal on a visit to the Nonsam prisoner, prisoner of war camp. During this visit, he preached to the prisoner of war congregation. An opinion piece by Amanda Price, which was published in the Korea Times in May 2019, said Doug Bushby was well known for his compelling images of the Korean War. However, she writes further that he was less well known for the hundreds of hours he dedicated to helping orphans, the wounded and prisoners of war. His standing within these communities in Korea was obviously significant, based on the accounts I've been told, but also the inscription on the certificate from Rear Admiral Park Ok Goi. Doug Bushby's book, Adventures in Revival, includes several chapters depicting what he experienced during the Korean War and his mission work in the country with prisoners of war. The book also includes several of the photos he took as a war correspondent, including the United Nations Honor Guard when the truce was signed, but also the churches he found and the people he met. Interestingly, a copy of this book has been listed for sale on the British eBay site for $100. US dollars. As Amanda Price wrote in her opinion piece mentioned earlier, no one was prepared for the sheer scope and force of the evil that would engulf the Korean Peninsula. No one anticipated that cities and villages on both sides would be razed or that millions would lose everything they had, including their lives. To find even a faint silhouette of goodness during the Korean War was understandably beyond the grasp of many. Yet amid the sulfurous clouds and charcoal smoke, such moments did exist." End quote. The horror of the Korean War, of any war, is hard to fathom for those of us who have not served. However, it is through war correspondence, like my uncle and father shared, that we can gain some understanding. Doug Bushby put himself on the line to help others, and it is that compassion I wish to pay tribute to. I'm proud of the involvement of both my uncle and father in reporting stories of the Korean War, especially around the time of the armistice being signed. Through their storytelling, both men played an important role in sharing stories from this war 70 years ago. And as a note, I was fortunate myself to be able to visit South Korea in 2005 as part of an APEC trip, and I actually stood in the DMZ where the armistice was signed. Standing in that room was quite an emotional moment for me, as you can imagine, where both my uncle and my father had been for that historic moment. It was an honour to co-sponsor this motion with Senator Smith last month. Australian soldiers fought valiantly during the Korean War, and their sacrifice deserves to be recognised at such a significant anniversary. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, in recent weeks, we've seen hundreds of thousands of Australians take to the streets to march and to call on uh, the reduction that's necessary for uh, black deaths in custody and certainly the high incarceration rates of First Nations people. Uh, as a 19, 20-year-old Mr Acting Deputy President, I covered the Royal Commission into Black Deaths in Custody as a journalist uh, for the ABC, uh, in particular in Darwin, and also uh, when Elliot Johnson brought down the recommendations. And then we could talk about the names of people who died the 99 deaths. And at the time, my colleague, Senator Pat Dodson, was one of the Royal Commissioners. So this has been an incredible journey. And yet, when we look at, at the deaths of over 437, 38, possibly 39 uh, Aboriginal people in deaths since then, we don't really know all of their names. So what I've been able to have a look at, and I looked through the Australian Institute of Criminology and saw the statistics, and it was really Guardian Australia's details. The newspaper Guardian Australia's Deaths Inside Project that documented the names. They collected and analysed all available coronial data and other sources to build a searchable database of First Nations deaths in custody since 2008. So we certainly don't know the names of those who died between 1991, when the findings of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody were handed down, to 2008. As I said, the Australian Institute of Criminology has the statistics, but we don't know those names or the circumstances surrounding their deaths. They're just numbers. So, Mr Acting Deputy President, I'd like to take the time that I have now 
to mention as many names that I can and pay our respects to those families who are still seeking justice for their loved ones and wanting to know what has happened. So I start with 29 March 2020, an unknown male, 30, arrested and taken to Horsham Police Station where his condition deteriorated. He was transported to hospital by ambulance where he later died. 21 March this year, TC, female, 40, found dead in her single cell at Brisbane Women's Correctional Centre. 2 January this year, Ms Walker, 37, arrested for shoplifting on 31 December 2019 and denied bail. She was remanded at the Maximum Security Women's Prison, the Dame Phyllis Front Centre, and found dead three days later. 9 November 2019, Mr Walker, 19, died after he was shot at Yundamu when two police officers went to his house to arrest him for breaches of his suspended sentence. 6 November 2019, unknown male 20, fell 10 metres to his death while being escorted from Gosford Hospital to Carrion Correctional Centre. 30 October 2019, RN male 39, died in Royal Perth Hospital three days after being sedated by paramedics at the direction of police. 17 September 2019, Ms Clark, 37, shot dead by a police officer outside her house in Geraldton in Western Australia. 12 June 2019, JB Male, 30, found unresponsive in his cell in Acacia Prison and attempts to revive him were unsuccessful. Authorities warned he was suicidal. 9 April 2019, Shodina Wynne, 26, died in hospital five days after she became unresponsive after being handcuffed by police on a side street off Albany Highway. 14 March 2019, T Walton, 21, shot multiple times by police who were seeking to question him. 11 February 2019, A Eads, 46, allegedly attacked by other prisoners and found critically injured in his prison cell on 26 February 2019. He died in hospital 13 days later. His injuries included a broken neck, severe brain swelling and facial fractures and lacerations. 11 September 2018, CD male 16, drowned in the Swan River in Perth while trying to escape an on-foot chase by police. 10 September 2018, TS male 17, drowned alongside his best mate CD while fleeing police who were chasing him and four other boys them on foot following reports of teenagers jumping fences. He and three other teenagers entered the river to escape, but only two made it out. 1st of September 2018, Nathan Reynolds, 36, died in custody in the Outer Metropolitan Multipurpose Correctional Centre, a minimum security prison in South Windsor, allegedly following a severe asthma attack. 29th of June 2018, DK Male, 34, during arrest, DK stopped breathing while being removed from a house in Perth by police. 3rd of May 2018, Mr Yeadon, 19, collapsed at West Kimberley Regional Prison in Western Australia and was declared dead less than an hour later at Derby Hospital. 10th of February 2018, TK, male 39, became unresponsive after police attended his Townsville home and he was forcibly restrained. 7th of February 2018, Patrick Fisher, 31, fell from a 13th floor balcony in the Waterloo Public Housing Block in Sydney in February 2018 while allegedly trying to climb down to escape from the police. 3rd of February 2018, J.H. Mail, 23, found hanged in his cell at the Junie Correctional Centre in New South Wales two days before he was due to face court. 22nd of December 2017, Ms. Day, 55, died 17 days after falling in the cells of Castle Main Police Station after being arrested for public drunkenness. 4th of December 2017, TMH, male 47, had a heart attack while being loaded into an ambulance and later died in Boulder, WA. 22nd of September 2017, Tane Richard Chatfield, 22, <coughs> found unresponsive in his cell after being separated from his cellmate and receiving medical treatment for a seizure. 
22nd of August 2017, KG Mail 47 discovered unresponsive in an observation cell at the Adelaide City Watch House. 8th of August 2017, JT Mail 39 complained of chest pain the day before his death, but prison staff in the Northern Territory mistakenly believed he was complaining of a sore throat. 4th of July 2017, EJW Mail 35 died in hospital after suffering a brain hemorrhage in prison and was shackled to the bed in the last days of his life, despite being unconscious and unresponsive. 25th of June 2017, R. Thomas, 29, thrown from his car after an accident being pursued by a highway <coughs> patrol car. 26th of May 2017, P.R., male 50, became unresponsive after being arrested, handcuffed and placed in a prone restraint position by South Australian police outside his house in Parafield Gardens. An ambulance was called, but he was unable to be revived. 12 May 2017, C. Riley, male 40, died after being shot by police with a stun gun in an office works car park in East Perth. 29 March 2017, Taz, male 35, critically injured when the car he was driving flipped less than a minute after police began a pursuit in Bathurst. He died in hospital a short time later. 1 March 2017, J. Anderson, 23, died in Fiona Stanley Hospital after being found hanged in a safe cell at Hakia Prison. And 4 January 2017, RPN male 62 died at Alice Springs Hospital of renal and liver failure while serving a mandatory life sentence. Mr Acting Deputy President, these are the people that hundreds of thousands of Australians walk the streets for this week, last week, and will no doubt continue to do so. We don't know some of the others, a lot of the other names, but we certainly pay our respects to those families still seeking justice, equality and fairness in our country. And we must never stop the pursuit of justice equality and fairness for all Australians, especially First Nations people. Thank you. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. And can I just thank Senator McCarthy for an incredibly moving uh, speech and thank her for bringing those really important stories to the attention of the Senate today. Uh, many in this chamber will have received emails from an increasing increasingly desperate number of temporary visa holders that are currently stranded overseas and unable to return to Australia due to the COVID-19 travel ban. Our borders closed on the 20th of March, so it's been three months that so many people who call Australia home have been trapped overseas. Three months that people have been separated from their partners. Three months that many parents have been separated from their children. Three months that people have been separated from their homes, their friends, their pets, their jobs, their businesses and their lives in Australia. There are so many stories that have been shared with my office. People like Chui Trashanka, who rushed to India after her mother was diagnosed with cancer and had to undergo immediate surgery. Her husband and four-year-old son stayed at home in Melbourne. She planned to be away for a week but couldn't get back before the borders closed. She writes, My son has never stayed away from me for such a long period and is too young to completely comprehend the reason behind this. He is crying daily in the video call requesting me to return back. It's so painful to watch him like that. I've lost all faith. I'm dying every day. I can't live without him. I just want to come back to my son. Chaitra's requests for a travel exemption have been rejected 22 times by the government. Or Londa James, who arrived with her two children, aged four and 16, to start work as a teacher in Melbourne in February. Her eight-year-old daughter's passport was delayed, so her husband and daughter stayed in Abu Dhabi to wait for her passport to arrive. 
Then the borders closed. She writes, My concern is I've never been away from my children for such a long time. My daughter is now displaying changes in her behaviour and signs of anxiety as a result of the separation. We have two medical reports as proof of this to support our application in the hope that there would be some mercy shown to us. She's still unable to come to Australia. Then there is Uruj Usman, who took her two children to see her dying father in Pakistan. Her husband stayed in Australia. She booked a flight which would land in Australia before the borders closed, but her flight was delayed by just two hours, so the airline turned her and her children around in Dubai. She writes, Every single passing day is increasing my anxiety and pain. It's been three months now I'm separated from my husband and my kids are separated from their father. The situation is very stressful and overwhelming. Uruj has been rejected six times from returning to Australia, but has just received a permanent residency approval. But to become a permanent resident, Uruj needs to lodge her application that she has been approved for from within Australia. But of course she can't because she's stranded overseas. Perversely, if she had that permanent residency, Uruj would be able to come home immediately without needing an exemption. These families have all applied for travel exemptions under the compelling and compassionate category and have had all their applications rejected by the government multiple times. Why? How are these cases not compelling and worthy of compassion? Without any publicly available criteria on, on how these and many, many other requests are being triaged and assessed, we simply have no way of knowing why the government is rejecting these claims. So I ask the government now, why are you blocking parents from being reunited with their young children? Why are you stopping children from returning to their school? Why are you tearing families and their lives apart? When will the government publicly release the criteria by which temporary visa holders are having their applications for travel ban exemptions assessed? At the very least, if you've got a home here, a job here or immediate family here, you should be allowed to return to Australia. It's time to bring these people home. In fact, it's long past time. Next, I want to talk about people that are stranded overseas on an expired bridging visa B. Like other temporary visa holders, they have their homes, their jobs, their businesses, their partners, their children and their lives in Australia. However, these visas had a time limit on them and despite their best efforts to get back to Australia before the borders closed, they became stranded and their visas have now expired. People like Henrietta Haldane, who writes this, I moved to Australia in 2017 to be with my daughter, who is an Australian citizen. I, come on holiday, I came on holiday to Japan for three weeks to visit my son on a bridging visa B, which expired on the 28th of May. Sorry, the 27th of May. My son has submitted the exemption form eight times, only to be rejected. I am 80 years old and suffer from high blood pressure, so this stress is not doing me any favours. I just want to go back to my home in Sydney and to my daughter. Or Ruchita Patel, who writes this, we came to India on a bridging visa B, which expired on the 20th of May. I'm stuck here with my eight-year-old son. My husband is there in Australia. My son is missing his school. My husband is struggling alone from the last three months in this pandemic situation and we are desperate to meet him ASAP. Ruchita's son is in year three at the Bomaderry Public School in Nowra, New South Wales, and has now missed almost two terms of school. Or Rafay Jamil, stranded in Pakistan, who writes, I've been living in Australia for more than seven years. I have a job where my employer desperately needs me back. I have a house I'm still paying rent and all utility bills for. I'm on a bridging visa B, which expired on the 26th of May. I'm extremely worried and going through depression because if I don't come back soon, I'm afraid my seven years of hard work will be lost and I'll be left 
with nothing. These families and these people have invested their time, their energy, their skills and their passion into Australia. They are part of our communities, they are part of our schools, they are part of our businesses and they are guests in our country. They pay their taxes, but they don't have access to social security or Medicare. They are here under their own steam. They love Australia and proudly look forward to the day when hopefully they can become permanent residents and citizens of our country. They are expressing a great trauma at being ripped from their homes and lives during a once-in-a-generation pandemic. They simply cannot understand why they are being blocked at every turn from returning to their homes with no end in sight. No point in time to focus on, nothing to stay hopeful for. I call on the government to urgently announce new visa arrangements for people stranded overseas on expired bridging visa Bs so they can return to their children, their partners, their families, their homes, their work and their lives here in Australia. It's just not good enough for decisions that impact on temporary visa holders to be made on an arbitrary basis by an unaccountable public official without any publicly released criteria being available publicly so people can understand why their applications are being rejected. There is simply no need to prolong the harm that is being caused, to prolong the distress and the trauma that is being caused. These people all understand they would need to be quarantined for two weeks when they arrive back in Australia, and most of them have indicated that they are very happy to pay any costs associated with that. They just want to return home to their lives and their families and their jobs in this country that we have invited them into as our guests. We are a better country than this and we need to do better. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Earlier this year, I called out General Motors Holden for their unethical behaviour in blindsiding 185 Holden dealers and their families and their staff around Australia by retiring the Holden brand by press release. Now, over the last couple of days, news reports have emerged that General Motors was considering the decision to retire the Holden brand far sooner than they are prepared to admit. Yesterday, Car Advice, Australia's largest independent automotive publisher, wrote, and I quote, it has been claimed that emails outlining how Holden planned to notify dealers and the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission about the closure and the loss of about 600 jobs were written on an afternoon flight from Detroit to Los Angeles in January. I go on. The email exchange is written on a laptop computer using in-flight Wi-Fi were visible to other passengers in nearby seats, according to a social media post seen. The post goes on to say, so the managing, so the managing director of Holden, Christian Aquilina, was sitting in front of me on the plane, the Facebook post said. In the most incredible lapse of information security, he composed emails and reviewed documents about the end of Holden in Australia to be announced in February. He wrote about how to spin things with the ACCC, the dealer network and the timing of notifying employees right in front of my eyes and writing about how concerned he was about leaks. Oh, General Motors, you're flying business class all while planning the destruction of, of Holden here in Australia. The decision of General Motors to discontinue Holden operations in Australia is their prerogative. But their appalling conduct, their appalling misbehaviour in how they are dealing with Holden dealers, 
how they are dealing with the Holden family in Australia is to be condemned. Because what is becoming clearer and clearer is that General Motors did not convey such plans to Holden dealers until the last possible second of the last possible minute. In doing so, General Motors has acted irresponsibly and in a manner that is very unfair to the very ambassadors that has enabled General Motors to operate in the Australian marketplace. And I'm talking about Holden dealers. This is a kick in the stomach to Holden dealers and their families. It is a kick in the stomach to the Holden family here in Australia. And we're not just talking about Holden dealers. We're talking about the allied trades, the mechanics, the receptionists, the sales staff, tens of thousands of people. Shame on you, General Motors. Now, the Holden brand is more than just a car with, with four wheels. The Holden brand might now be worthless to General Motors, but to Australia it is, it is priceless. And I have written, as I have said previously in this place, to, to Mary Barra, the worldwide president of General Motors, written to her asking to buy the Holden brand for a dollar, not because it is worthless but because it is priceless. Now I am yet to get a response from, from Ms Barra. Holden is the livelihood of many Australians particularly in rural and regional communities. I've said it before, and I'll keep saying it until I'm blue in the face. Be better, General Motors, because I'm going to keep on fighting the Holden dealers and the Holden family. Now, Madam Acting Deputy President, equally damning is the scandal of Paradise Dam. Now, you don't hear about Paradise Dam in the Bermuda Triangle, that is Sydney, Melbourne and Canberra. You don't hear about it in the press gallery. You don't hear about Paradise Dam much from the Queensland Labor government. That's because they don't want you to. They don't want you to know and they don't want anyone to know. In my last statement to the Senate on Paradise Dam, I called on the Queensland Labor government to release the Commission of Inquiry's report into the dam before they started to tear it down. Because we've got this unique situation in Queensland. We have a Labor government who are not only not building dams and not supporting the building of dams, they're actually tearing down dams. Such is their distaste for rural and regional Queensland. Such is their lack of comprehension for the importance of water infrastructure to grow the economy of Queensland. So, the Labor government did release the Commission of Inquiry report into Paradise Dam with 96 hours notice before they sent in the bulldozers to start to tear down the wall of Paradise Dam. Because when Queensland Labor finally did release the report, the responsible minister, Minister Lynham, said the Commission heard evidence about a litany of issues with the design and construction, some of which were ultimately found to be root causes of the present-day structural and stability concerns. The Commission found the design of the primary spill spillway simply not wide enough. This is a fancy way of saying what we already knew. Peter Beattie and Queensland Labor's commissioning of the Paradise Dam is the biggest infrastructure fail in Australia's history. This is a dam that cost hundreds of millions of dollars and is as useful as a chocolate teapot in Bourbon Street in the middle of summer. And the people of Bundaberg, the people of the Bundaberg Burnett region, were told they were going to get water. That's not happening. They were told that the dam wall would be reduced by five metres. Well, that's also not happening now, because now they've been told it's going to be closer to six metres. But what they aren't being told. What they aren't being told is a plan from the Queensland Labor government to safely return Paradise Dam to full capacity. No one is denying that the safety and security of, of the people in the Bundaberg Burnett region should be guaranteed. 
But part of that safety and part of that security is ensuring that there is water security for the growing agriculture sector in the Bundaberg Burnett region. And this, this destruction of, of the Paradise Dam will effectively be a $2.4 billion economic hit to the region. But you're not going to hear anything from Palaszczuk. You won't hear anything from, from state Labor about this, because within the DNA of, of Labor in Queensland is a dislike of anything to do with dams. They don't want to build dams. They don't like dams. We've got a state Labor government in Queensland who aren't building any dams, and the dams that are existing they're actually tearing down. Such is their record. And the reason this is, Madam Acting Deputy President, is that they're chasing green preferences. Because the Labor Party in Queensland know the only way they can win the coming state election in 140 or so days is by getting the Green Party preferences. And they know that the Green Party you know, are, the, are, the, are the tail that wags the dog that is the modern Queensland Labor Party. And I call on the Queensland Labor Party to forget about the Greens, to stand up for Queensland and to stand up for dams, to stand up for the community and the region that is the Bundaberg Burnett region and restore Paradise Dam to its full height. Because the Frecklington Manda LNP government will, and that's why the election on the 31st of October is so important. We can't afford another four years of, of Labor mishandling, mismanaging the Queensland economy. We can't afford four years of, of, of Palaszczuk hiding in her, in her high-rise, hiding from the voters, hiding from, from Jackie Trad, because we all know that, that, that Jackie Trad has got the numbers in that caucus and will come back and knife Palaszczuk. We can't afford four years of Labor playing games. That's why we need Deb Frecklington and Tim Mander to have focused on jobs and water security. That's why we've got Deb Frecklington and Tim Mander who are going to deliver a budget within 100, with 100 days when State Labor and Queensland aren't going to deliver a budget within a year. So the choice is clear. Vote one, LNP. Thank you, Senator McGrath. I call Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President. And I wish to uh, thank my colleague, uh, Madam Deputy McCarthy, for attempting to put the humanity to human beings <coughs> who otherwise would be um, <coughs> numbers on a file. Uh, two weeks ago, we observed National Reconciliation Week. But the sad reality then and now is that our nation is far from reconciled. Just remember what we witnessed only a fortnight ago. In my home state of Western Australia, a sacred Aboriginal heritage site of world significance was destroyed, followed by an insincere apology by the company. The High Court ruled that the tear gassing of teenagers in the Dondale Youth Detention Centre in Darwin was unlawful, and Black Lives, Black Lives Matter protests erupted here and around the world. Fueling the protests was the dreadful realisation that since the report of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths and Custody, nearly 440 Aboriginal people have died in custody. Without answers, this breeds fear of foul play being at work. I was one of the six Royal Commissioners back then, but our report did not support the initial expectation of foul play. A death in custody does not, as a fact, impute guilt or culpability to the officers in attendance or to the institution per se. I do it does raise the question of what happened when the death occurred and why the person came to be in custody. The then Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, Mr Robert Tickner, tabled our report in May 1991 and noted that the most a significant contributor to incarceration was the disadvantage of Aboriginal people in every way, whether socially, economically or culturally. Mr Tickner told the parliament 
And the, re the report highlighted, and I quote, the dispossession and subordination within a dominant and often hostile society frequently motivated self-interest, the development of racist attitudes, both overt and hidden, and the way in which these attitudes became institutionalised in the very practice of legal, educational, welfare and Australian assistance authorities. The fact that hundreds of Aboriginal persons have died in custody since the Royal Commission diminish us all as a nation. We must ask ourselves, what are the common themes that drive this continuing subjugation of First Nations? What are the underlying factors through which First Nations peoples have become destabilised, disempowered and dispossessed? And why have our good intentions and resolve failed to make any difference? There is no pride in seeing First Nations peoples so reduced by societal factors from within and from without that they are perceived as exceptional recipients of government largesse, not worthy of restorative justice and denied true equality of opportunity in our society. Why is it so difficult for the descendants of the settler and colonists to have the necessary discussion about uncomfortable truths? First Nations know the shortfalls in their societies and have been trying to address them for some time. But they will not advance without true partnership and change. Incarceration and out-of-home care for children presents questions of moral, ethical and legal substance that go to the heart of our willingness to deal with our relationship and understanding of each other. Deaths in custody is not just about policing and incarceration rates. It goes through the legacy of dispossession and disempowering First Nations. Subjugation goes to the point of interaction of First Nations and mainstream society, manifested in our schools, our workplaces, our shops, our hospitals, real estate agencies and in other places. It is also embedded in the institutions that administer the many services and often in our public institutions. It's in our constitution. Mr Menzies recognised that in relation to section 5126, the race power. That is why First Nations want a voice to parliament and at regional and local levels to stop the subjugation. Australian racism explains the deep distrust felt by First Nations peoples towards our institutions and agendas of assimilation and, a, and a, uh, adoption of those. It explains why we are not surprised but still outraged when First Nations peoples are locked up behind bars and even if they are responsible for breaking the law. Systematically, First Nations peoples have been treated as inferior, as deficient and tolerated through condescension. This has, brought, this, has brought those, uh, this has brought subjugation, destabilisation and disempowerment in order for the, those of the non-Indigenous society wanting to remain confident in their positions of privilege and power. The Royal Commission uh, report identified the impact of that exclusion. Commissioner Elliot Johnson, the esteemed Queen's Councillor, wrote uh, back then, and he had no real idea of the degree, and I quote, the pin-pricking domination, abuse of personal power, utter paternalism, open contempt and total indifference, which confronted Aboriginal people in their everyday lives, with no personal control over one's own children, one's employment, personal savings and decisions as to whether you buy a car or other person's belongings, other personal belongings. Commissioner Johnson pointed out that communities then were faced with the multiplicity of grants, which effectively means the agendas were being set elsewhere, that assumptions as to what is best for Aboriginal people were being made elsewhere. And that was 30 years ago. Well, what's changed in the decades since? I say if there's been any change, it's been for the worst. 
and maybe with the peak organised Aboriginal organisations uh, at the table these days, we'll get institutional change. Thirty years on, we are all still optimistic. First Nations peoples have never ceded their sovereign claims to their lands and waters. They've never entered a treaty on the terms of their subjugation. They remain sovereign peoples. Now more than ever, Australia cannot afford to be unreconciled. We must accept that this nation is in transition, confronted by the necessity of the voice to parliament, constitutional recognition, truth-telling and agreement-making. We must avoid going down the path of seeing history as a set of competitive narratives and instead work towards the pursuit of truth and respect. We need a political settlement on questions of national independence, integrity and um, identity. 250 years of avoiding these fundamental questions has handicapped us as a nation from navigating the complex challenges before us and left us unable to capitalise on the great opportunities of uh, a future together. We feel this confusion in our public discourse with well-meaning policy objectives failing uh, to meet the expectations of modern multicultural Australia. Standards we recognise when cross but seem unwilling to speak about uh, honestly. We have seen generations of political leaders come and go, blindly clutching for a sense of common ground, common identity, without addressing the darkness of dispossession and racism, keeping us chained to the ethnocentric understanding of Australia's identity, one that has never really been true. We have a system unable to understand or celebrate diversity and difference, and First Nations are left to deal with a bureaucratic machine that has often been a tool more of oppression than of liberation. We see this shortcoming in our geospatial engagement with the world. With a new form of imperialism emerging, Australia, without a robust and honest civic identity, simply cannot stand on its own two feet. Amidst the culture wars, it is easy to forget that there is a purpose in national reconciliation. It is not a purely academic question. We labour for the cause of reconciliation to seek a political settlement and to bring sense of, a sense of unity uh, to our Australian project. Indeed, the ceremonial Makarata brings two parties in disagreement to resolve their differences and become as one. We are all the lesser for its absence, whether we are descendants of the First Fleet, migrants or indeed First Nations. During this pandemic, we have learned a lot about resilience. The nation can learn a lot about resilience from the First Nations people. The path forward has been offered to us through the Uluru Statement from the Heart. The Parliament must honour that call and listen to the torment of the powerlessness that continues to haunt this place. Only then will we continue on the path of reconciliation, built on honour, equality, recognition and respect, and free from racism. Thank you, Senator Dodson. Um, Senator Wong. Can I just thank the Chamber for allowing Senator Dodson to finish? Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. All lives matter. The majority of the Senate opposed this motion that was put up by myself and only supported by one other, Senator Malcolm Roberts. All Australians should be treated equally when it involves the delivery of government services and funding. All citizens and residents are equally deserving of services that make our lives better, but there remains a significant imbalance in terms of the funds and services dedicated specifically to those of Aboriginal heritage as opposed to non-Aboriginals. This was a matter that I raised in my maiden speech to the parliament in 1996 and in those ensuing two decades plus. There has been little change to the attitude of the government, which continues to throw money at the problem and virtually no improvement to the lives of those needy Aboriginals. It seems to be a bottomless pit into which money continues to be thrown, but that money has achieved virtually nothing. If taxpayer funds are spent in, in a specific area, we are right to expect positive outcomes. As I said in the Senate, February 2020, most Australians know that tens of billions of dollars are spent each year to help alter the standard of living between those in remote Aboriginal communities and even those living in our developed parts of Australia. 
when you spend billions of dollars a year on any group of people, you expect outcomes. Sadly, those billions have gone to the non-productive, unrepentant Aboriginal industry, not to where it should go, the grassroots Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It is an industry that has achieved no notable benefits in pulling our First Nations people out of squalor, domestic violence and poverty. Over the years, I have been labelled a racist for my views, mostly by white Australians and those Indigenous who thrive financially for themselves and their families. I call it the Aboriginal industry. Their agenda is not in the best interest of all Australians, white or black. It's about milking the cow, the taxpayer, crying the victim constantly and blaming whites for a so-called invasion. I was born in Australia. This is my land. Where the hell do I go? I will not accept the blame game for the so-called invasion you refer to. You're pushed to change our history books and the false claims that are foisted on our young throughout our education system is disgraceful, all to better suit the left's agenda. All atrocities must be noted and taught to ensure we acknowledge our past, but more importantly, to protect our future. I will not acknowledge or echo the words welcome to country that has been forced on people to say at functions or events. I am very respectful to those who have fought for our freedom and sacrificed their lives for our way of life that we all have the opportunity to enjoy today. I will not support those whose agenda is to divide us as Australians. Wanting a separate nation within a nation at the expense of the Australian taxpayer, this should never happen. Many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that I have met over the years, including many elders, have come to understand my honesty and resolve and not the lies they had been fed mostly by Labor, the Greens and less so the Coalition to destroy myself and One Nation from taking their votes. Remember, it was John Howard who disendorsed me as a candidate in 1996 when I called for equality for all Australians. The Closing the Gap Report 2020 shows just how little improvement has been realised for the Aboriginal people, despite the billions spent each year over the past decades. As I have said many times, money alone will not solve the problem. It comes back to determination, discipline and a willingness to make the changes, and that must come primarily from the Aboriginal people themselves. I met recently with a group of strong and focused Aboriginal women from all parts of Australia who are desperate for positive change for their children and their communities. I think it makes sense to allow women to play a bigger role and have a say in the direction taken by initiatives to improve the lives of Aboriginal Australians. <coughs> These same Aboriginal women and elders say they want the Aboriginal land councils gone or made accountable. They are corrupt and don't represent the needs of the Aboriginal people. Duplication of Aboriginal services costing billions of taxpayers' dollars propping, propping them up with no review or accountability. Why? Members in this place are continually calling for accountability from other government departments. In seven key areas, the Closing the Gap initiative has not performed well, with even Prime Minister Scott Morrison admitting the poor results. Poor results will continue in substance abuse, domestic violence, child sexual abuse, education, housing, jobs, health and Aboriginal incarceration if we keep giving excuses, calling them disadvantaged, throwing money at it and treating their ineptness as our responsibility when they have to take responsibility for their own actions. Someone needs to start looking in the mirror. The child sexual abuse that is committed in Aboriginal communities is an absolute disgrace. Very little is done about it by authorities because they are black, and they pull the race and cultural card. Those poor children, and also the women who are bashed and raped, is that the fault of the white man? No. Go to Dumaji and see the children walking the streets at night to flee the, the abuse they receive in their own homes from their own parents and family members. Is that the white man's fault? No. I have had a gutful of the bleating from the Greens and others. How many Indigenous have you had in your homes? Have you fought personally to help an Indigenous woman in prison to get her life on track? 
be with her seven children in her own home. I very much doubt it. I have. Many in this place are all BS and push their own political agenda without really understanding the implications and ramifications of what they are saying. My research has found that although the systems and programs may have changed in some ways and perhaps become more complex, there is still an overwhelming imbalance weighing heavily in favour of Aboriginal Australians in services provided in the areas of education, legal services, housing loans, health, royalties for mining operations and employment support services. Are handouts a good thing? Do they help improve the life of positions of many Aboriginals, particularly those who live in remote areas? To favour any one race in Australia over other races in terms of government support and the provisions of services amounts to racist policy and actually prolongs the problems. There are many Australians who would gladly love the handouts and opportunities to give to the Indigenous, given to the Indigenous. And might I add, many Indigenous are living in very nice housing, they are in well-paid jobs and not struggling, but they can apply for educational assistance for their children that many Australians would love for their own children but can't because of race. Tell me this is not racism. As I said at the outset, additional handouts to Aboriginals does not help them. It makes them reliant on government and actually prevents them from becoming independent and becoming, being able to create new and more fulfilling lives for themselves. We need to encourage Aboriginal people themselves to take control of their communities, to reduce substance use and abuse, to encourage school attendance and education, to promote discipline and determination in, in employment. The definition of Aboriginal continues to be contentious and unclear in many cases. The Australian Institution Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies provides an outline of a three-step working criteria of confirming Aboriginality, which is usually accepted by government agencies and community organisations. These three steps are being of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander descent, identifying as an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person, being accepted as such by the community in which you live or formerly lived. It is worth noting that those who identify as Aboriginals today has increased dramatically in the last 50 years. In 1971, there were officially 115,953 Aboriginals in Australia, or 0.9 per cent. Today, that time, we've actually got um, an increase of 459 per cent, while the, general, while the population generally has increased by 83.5. Some suggest the increase is a result of increased willingness to identify as Aboriginal. It is a matter for further research, which the increase is a cause of the loose definition and the many government benefits available to Aboriginals. I believe it does. To all those struggling Australians wanting equal opportunities for their children and families, tick the box. There is no place in our country for racism or, for that matter, reverse racism. And to finish on a, on a note, it was Quote from Martin Luther King Jr. from his speech in 1963, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the colour of their skin but by the content of their character. This is what I want for Australia. Every individual life matters. Aboriginal lives matter. All lives matter. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I read with uh, great interest a story in today's Canberra Times uh, titled Rates Set to Fall for Most Households. Now, the article states that ACT Chief Minister Andrew Barr will use his annual State of the Territory address to announce rate freezes for about two-thirds of homeowners. And this follows Mr Barr's announcement on Monday that his government will freeze a number of fees and charges at 2019-20 levels, uh, including birth, death and marriage registration, car rego, land title fees and others. Now, what these two announcements ignore, and what most of the media coverage has ignored, is that since Mr Barr embarked on a so-called tax reform package in 2011, he has jacked up rates and charges year on year, putting a massive strain on Canberra households and families and businesses. Uh, now, while Mr Barr claimed at the time that his so-called tax reform package would see rates increase while stamp duty would be abolished, here we are nearly 10 years down the track and rates will have more than tripled and stamp duty uh, well stamp duty is still here still gouging Canberrans in fact even with rates tripling Canberrans paid more than 15 million dollars more in stamp duty 
in 2019-20 than they did in 2010-11. And what do we expect from the Australian Labor Party and their fellow travellers, the Greens? For them, tax reform means only one thing: tax increases. Their philosophy is to tax you back into the Stone Age, and they are merciless in doing so. So, is this some sort of road to Damascus conversion uh, to lower tax uh, from Mr Barr? Uh, I don't think so. The reality of the situation is that, having jacked up rates, uh, Mr Barr now finds himself staring down the barrel of an election, uh, with many Canberrans fed up with the gouges and the rorts of his government. What we see here is nothing more than a desperate pre-election fix from a desperate chief minister trying to save his job. Mr Barr has form on pre-election fixes ahead of the 2016 election. Instead of the planned 9 per cent increase, Mr Barr decided to be generous and only slug Canberrans with a 4.5 per cent increase. This was after having year-on-year -year increases of around 10 per cent. After the election, he returned back to his merry ways and his massive tax gouges. Uh, now, when uh, now Senator Gallagher was Chief Minister, Mr Barr was her Treasurer, and it was them who embarked on this so-called tax reform. I mean tax increase plan. I said at the time that under ACT Labor, Canberrans' rates would triple within a decade, and of course Andrew Barr said that was a lie. Well, here we are, eight years down the track, and we are well on the way. A decade into Senator Gallagher and Chief Minister Barr's grand tax plan, rates revenue will have increased from $209 million in 2011-12 to $697 million by 2021-22, more than triple. And who's paying for that? Of course, it is ordinary Canberrans. History has proven uh, that it is actually Mr Barr who lied to Canberrans and he should hang his head in shame. And having lied at the start of this tax plan, uh, how can he be, be believed now on the eve of an election? Now, if you don't believe me, uh, well, perhaps you believe former Labor Chief Minister John Stanhope, uh, who is critical of how Mr Barr has, and ACT Labor have managed the Territory's finances since taking over the top job. And I quote from Mr Stanhope, since releasing the debt genie from its bottle in 2013, Net debt in the ACT has ballooned to skywhale proportions. From a position of negative net debt of $736 million in 2011, it has increased in giant leaps, somewhat akin to the cravings of an ice addict for methamphetamine. The more you have, the more you need. To a debt of $109 million in 2013, $910 million in 2015, $1.453 billion in 2017 and $2.216 billion in 2019. The reality of the situation is that having jacked rates up every year and increased stamp duty every year, with increasing debt every year, service delivery in the ACT is worse than it has ever been, because the ACT Labor Greens government is more focused on political grandstanding than getting the basics right. We see this in Mr Barr's chronic underfunding and mismanagement of the ACT health system. Despite Commonwealth funding more than doubling since the coalition came to government, Mr Barr has cut hospital funding in real terms year on year. The situation is so egregious that a recent report showed that the ACT has the highest emergency department wait times in the country. Just one in five patients who were classed as urgent were seen within the recommended 30 minutes of presenting themselves. More startling and a figure of real concern is that not even those requiring resuscitation are always seen within the recommended time frame. Now, this is quite an amazing record. Uh, jacking up rates, tripling uh, rates in less than a decade, uh, huge tax increases for families and business, yet still delivering record debt and still managing to underfund and mismanage the health system. I mean, that is quite the record uh, when, when you are taking that much tax and still running massive deficits and still delivering such poor services for the people of the ACT. The reality of, reality of the situation is under the Barr-Labor-Green government, 
many Canberrans, uh, working people doing it tough, pensioners and people in lower income households are locked out of home ownership, lack the essential services they need and are ignored. The Labor Green government doesn't even pretend to be committed anymore, I think, to affordable housing. And if you haven't got private health insurance, you'll be left waiting years for medical treatment that is essential to your quality of life. Again, John Stanhope, the longest serving chief minister in the Territory's history, has completely lost confidence in the Bar's government because they are simply not getting the job done. He says, ordinary Canberrans are abandoned by the Labor Party, ignored by the unions, and invisible to the Greens. Ironically, they now have nowhere left to turn but to Alistair Coe and the Liberals, and who could blame them? Who could blame them indeed? I received many representations from my constituents on the Bar Labor government's rate rorts. Here's just some of the direct quotes from people in the community. They mean increased financial stress, having to choose between maternity leave and returning to work early after only eight weeks. No family holidays, no extracurricular activities for the children. The cost to our budget due to rates is significant. We have to go without to make sure they can be paid. In addition to hurting its own constituents, the disgusting greed of the ACT Labor government directly damages small businesses and harms the underemployment throughout the territories. Another says, I feel like a cash cow uh, for the Barr government as they are making uh, up any excuse to get more money. Services in the south are dismal, so money leaves our pockets and we see no return. Another says the rates increases mean I have more difficulty in paying other bills and I have less discretionary funds. Also, what on earth did they spend it on? We have the worst hospital in Australia and dilapidated, unmaintained local parks. This is just some of the feedback from the community about this tired, long-serving Labor Greens government and how much they are letting the people down. Canberra ought to be the best place in the country to live, but Canberrans are being let down by an uncaring, arrogant and incompetent Labor Greens government. I'd ask Canberrans not to fall for these pre this pre-election pretense from a government that only ever increases taxes. If we want things to get better in our city, if we want to see real change, then Canberrans need to let their voices be heard at the ballot box in October and kick out this incompetent Andrew Barr Labor Green government and vote for Alistair Coe and the Canberra Liberals. Thank you, Senator Cecil. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to talk about the five ways that this government is sidelining the women workers of Australia today during this COVID-19 crisis. Uh, this is a government that has had a problem with women workers for a long time, and they've doubled down on that problem uh, with their unequal response to the COVID-19 crisis when it comes to Australia's working women. So let's see if I can get through my five ways that the government is letting down Australia's women uh, in the few minutes that I have in this statement. Number one, the government's backflip on aged care workers. 87 per cent of aged care workers are women, uh, and Minister Colbeck promised them a retention bonus that would be paid after tax to support the low-paid, hard-working aged care women of Australia. Uh, but the government uh, and Senator Colbeck have backflipped and decided that this would be before tax, meaning less money going to the aged care workers that have already been on the front lines for so long as essential workers during this crisis. Number two, the government's choice to exclude over a million casual workers from JobKeeper in the first place. We know women are overrepresented in both casual jobs and in the sectors that have been hard hit by the shutdown. Retail, hospitality, food, accommodation. Women make up 60 per cent of the people who have been excluded due to the government's decision to stop casuals with less than 12 months' service from being able to, uh, to apply for a JobKeeper. Number three, kicking early childhood educators off JobKeeper, straight after announcing that JobKeeper would be maintained for Australia's workers. The government decided to target a group of 120,000 women workers and kick them off JobKeeper. Women who have been working hard, who have been doing everything that the government has asked of them, who have been going to work, performing essential work uh, and keeping the rest of Australia at work. How does the government reward them? By making them the first people that they kick off the JobKeeper program. What an absolute disgrace. What a way to reward that absolutely essential workforce. Number four, 
ending free childcare while this crisis uh, continues. So while the government are busy making women workers' jobs more uncertain, they're also making it harder for women with families to even be able to return to work. We know that their decision to end free childcare will have a much larger impact on women and their ability to work when compared with men. Uh, and number five, no jobs package for women workers. So what a stand-up record that we have of this government supporting women workers already. Uh, and let's add to that the government's decision to make grants for $150,000 bathroom renovations uh, with golden toilets and platinum bidets. Uh, and absolutely no support for the industries that women work in. So this government has absolutely got a problem with women workers. They broke their promise to aged care workers who are mostly women. They excluded over a million casuals from JobKeeper who are mostly women. They kicked educators off JobKeeper early who are mostly women. And they're ending free childcare at an absolutely critical time for the working women of Australia. And in the meantime, they've announced no real support for the working women of Australia in this crisis. It being 2 p.m., we'll move to questions without notice, and I would like some guidance as to who has the first question. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Minister Sukar justified providing stimulus for jobs in the male-dominated housing industry while providing none for jobs in female-dominated industries by saying, yes, it is dominated by men and in many cases those people will be supporting families. Does the minister endorse his comments? The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Very much, Mr. President. I actually didn't hear all of uh, Senator Pratt's question, uh, and uh, the observation I would make in in relation to uh, the part that I did hear. Sorry, Senator. Order. Point of order. Sorry. No, no. I'm not actually complaining. I'm actually suggesting could we we'll restart the clock and we'll have the question I, again because the, the minister leave, should hear the question before with she the leave of the Senate. Sorry. I'll, Thank I'm, you. I'm happy to let the question be asked again, Senator Pratt. Thank you. Um, to, Minister to Senator Payne, Minister Sukar justified providing stimulus for jobs in the male-dominated housing industry whilst providing none for female-dominated industries by saying, yes, it is dominated Order, Senator Henderson. Yes, it is dominated by men and in many cases those people will be supporting families. Does the minister endorse his comments? Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, I am glad that uh, Senator Pratt put that question again. As I understand it, Minister Sukar is the Minister for Housing. Uh, and so, therefore, I would expect him to talk about the housing industry and the construction industry as it relates to his Order. portfolio. As it absolutely relates to his portfolio. And so, I didn't hear his uh, direct comments. Uh, but if, if Minister Sukar is speaking about his portfolio, then obviously that's what I would expect him to do. But I do want to refer you to another speech, Mr. President, which will be remarkably inconvenient for those officers. But nevertheless, the Prime Minister, in his CETA speech, for example, earlier this week, has been absolutely clear in saying that we know there is a disproportionate impact on women, and goes on to speak also about younger Australians uh, and those with lower skills and a range of other people with challenges in the workforce, which identify key parts of the labour force key parts of the Australian community we need to focus on as we prepare and plan our way out and make our way out. We need to focus on. That is the words order. of the Prime Minister order. of Australia, Mr President, so in relation to order. these Senator issues. Senator on a point of order? Uh, uh, is it the obvious order. one about noise, Senator po Cormann? Point of order. Uh, interjections are disorderly. The most persistent interjector always is the Leader of the Opposition, and I would ask her to call it to order. Senator, I was calling the Chamber to order. M Minister is correct. Interjections are always disorderly. Senator Payne to continue. Thank you very much, Mr. President. The Prime Minister went on in his CETA speech to make a number of other points, including the uh, work that JobKeeper and JobSeeker has done to put a fall, a floor, I'm sorry, uh, under the fall in consumer confidence, uh, which we saw in March, uh, and we have now recovered. 
Order. We have now recovered uh, that lost ground in consumer confidence, and both the Westpac and the ANZ indices tell us that. The high frequency spending data shows that that's being increasingly translated into increased retail sales. Those opposite mention uh, work areas which have a high proportion of women working in them. That includes hospitality and retail. And we know that the good news for those women and for young people who work in both of those areas, for example, that they will be Order. early benefited from time the reopening the process. Has expired. And Senator Payne, time for the answer has expired. Senator Pratt, a supplementary question. Thank you. Yesterday, the ABS released data which showed that since March, women lost payroll jobs at 1.3 times the rate of men. Modelling from the Bank West Curtin Economic Centre found that the majority of the casuals excluded from JobKeeper are women, including more than 200,000 women in retail and fast food alone. Why did the government design a scheme that leaves women behind during Australia's first recession in 29 Order. years? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I absolutely reject the premise of Senator Pratt's question. I absolutely reject the premise of Senator order. Pratt's Senator question. Wong, and in order. fact, Senator Payne, I have um, Senator Cormann on a point of order. Uh, uh, Senator Wong doesn't even try to um, uh, comply with standing orders. Uh, interjections are disorderly. Please call it to order. I was, I was doing so at that point, and I'm going to reinstate my request that senators who are called to order at least count to ten before they commence breaching standing orders again. Um, Senator Payne to continue. Thank you very much, Mr. President. As I said, I absolutely reject the premise of Senator Pratt's question. And what has been made clear by ministers, what has been made clear by the Treasurer, what has been made clear by the Finance Minister, by the Prime Minister uh, and by me, is that we absolutely recognise it is critical that in the recovery process we draw on the Order capabilities Senator of McAllister. the entire nation. Men, women, women, men, to ensure the fastest possible economic and social recovery. Senator Pratt, a final supplementary question. Yesterday, Minister Lay said in the other place, women have been hardest hit through COVID-19. So why, in the last two weeks alone, has the government left women further behind by snapping back to unaffordable childcare, dudding aged care workers, taking from childcare workers and refusing paid parental leave from people who are expecting to be eligible? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. It seems to me that those opposite would prefer to have seen the childcare sector collapse upon itself. It seems to me that they would have preferred that a government didn't take advice from a sector about how best to sustain it in the middle of a pandemic. Order. Because, quite frankly, you don't even have the basic skills. Order. Order. I will call the minister to continue when there's silence. I didn't. Order. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Prior to COVID-19. Order. Senator Cormann on Senator a point Wong of order. Senator Wong continues to defy your order. Uh, interjections are disorderly. Uh, Senator Wong on a point uh, of he's order. He's very sensitive today. I actually said across the table for him that you know he, if he was going to play this game, we would in, we would make the point that he was interjecting order. on his own minister. I'm not sure that that's order, an interjection. Senator it's a Wong. private conversation with the leader um, of the government. I'm not going to. I don't want to get to the point where um, what I might broadly describe as conversation across the centre table I deem as interjections. However, there have been interjections, Senator Wong, and I have called you to order previously. Um, Senator Payne, to continue. Thank you very much, Mr President. I'll do my best. Prior to COVID-19, there were more women in the workforce in Australia than ever before. The gender pay gap had closed to its lowest level on record at 13.9 per cent. When Labor was last in office, it was 17.4 per cent, Mr President. And our ambition as a government is to return to those numbers and grow them and enhance them. Order. That is the approach that we will be taking. We absolutely know that we must draw upon every woman and every man in this country in the recovery process to ensure the fastest possible economic and Order. social recovery. Senator Payne. Senate, Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism, Investment, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister update the Senate on the progress towards the exciting prospect of a free trade agreement with the United Kingdom? The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. 
Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Betts for his question and his interest in, uh, in this very important topic because I'm pleased to inform the Senate that later today Australia and the United Kingdom will officially commence negotiations towards a free trade agreement between our two countries. This is a great step forward in terms of creating new opportunity that will lead to new and further job opportunities for Australians. The UK is already our seventh largest trading partner, and our total two-way trade is worth more than $30 billion a year. But we can do, we can do much more than that. We are seeking an ambitious and comprehensive free trade agreement which secures commercially meaningful market access for our farmers, for our businesses, across services sectors as well as goods, uh, and further strengthens our two-way investment flows. The UK is Australia's third largest services trading partner. In 2019, our two-way services trade was worth in excess of $15 billion. And we want to make sure that across financial services, professional services, telecommunications, fintech and emerging sectors, we enhance and strengthen those opportunities. The UK is already our second largest source of foreign investment in Australia, with foreign direct investment valued at some $127 billion in 2019. And we see exciting investments such as by British-based pharmaceutical company AstraZeneca in their $200 million manufacturing facility in North Ryde in Sydney. But we do know that when the UK entered the European Economic Community uh, back in 1973, our agricultural exports suffered the worst. We were, at that stage, uh, the UK was our third largest goods trading partner. It's now only our 12th. And tariffs on agricultural products account for 67 per cent of all tariffs that the UK applies to Australian exports. We seek to eliminate as many of these as possible to create new opportunities for our farmers and our businesses to grow more Order. jobs through this Senator relationship. Burnett. Senator Abetz, a supplementary question. I thank the minister for that very informative answer and ask, can the minister inform the Senate how a United Kingdom free trade agreement will create more jobs for Australians? Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, one in five Australian jobs is dependent upon trade-related employment, whether it's across Senator Abetz's home state of Tasmania, mine of South Australia or any other part uh, of our great country. There are so many Australians who rely upon trade and market access to sustain their employment and their jobs. It's estimated that through uh, our trade growth over recent years, more than 240,000 trade-related jobs have been created across Australia. And despite the challenges of the pandemic, we have seen trade volumes hold up very strongly into so many of our key markets. We know that there are more Australian businesses exporting, and we know from analysis that Australian household income is higher as a result of those trading relationships. This is all about making sure that we continue to post the record trade surpluses that we have off the back of record exports, and in doing so, we create even more job opportunities for people right across Australia. Senator Abetz, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise the Senate of how expanding the export market choices for our Australian farmers and businesses will assist our post-pandemic recovery? Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, right through our time in government, we have sought to grow the choices for Australian farmers and businesses about who they do business with. That's why we've struck trade deals with the Republic of Korea, Japan, China, the Trans-Pacific Partnership and our Indonesia agreement that comes into force on 5 July. It's why, whilst we are pleased to be launching negotiations with the United Kingdom, we are also determined to conclude negotiations with the European Union, such a significant and valuable partner for us, and we look to make sure that we grow those opportunities across all of those EU nations and its population and potential consumer base for Australia of more than 400 million people. We've just completed and held our seventh round of negotiations with the EU, doing so through virtual negotiations and formats, but making sure we continue to make real progress to deliver the type of comprehensive trade agreement there that, again, can create more job opportunities for Australians and mutually beneficial outcomes for our nations. Senator Billick. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne.
A survey by Early Childhood Advocates, The Front Project, has found that the government's decision to make Australian families pay unaffordable childcare fees will take food from families' tables. More than half of parents said the high cost of early learning impacts their weekly grocery budget and how much they can buy. Why is the government making parents choose between food and care during Australia's first recession in 29 years? The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I have not been made aware of the survey. I'm not familiar with the group that, uh, that Senator Billick referred to. But, Mr. President, I think it's very important to be clear here uh, about the response that the government has uh, has worked through, which is something that's never been done before, because Australian families were indeed facing a crisis that is unprecedented. We took an important and temporary measure to help Australian families get through the crisis. We are supporting the childcare sector to keep it strong and to keep its workers employed, both of which are fundamental to any provision of any childcare at all. We also know, as those opposite have raised, that we have seen women do an even more disproportionate share of unpaid caring and domestic work, and that's an issue that we believe needs to be addressed, irrespective of COVID-19. We know that working or returning to work needs access to childcare. What many service providers and sector peak bodies have told the government is that that rising demand could not be supported on what were the then business continuity payments that formed the basis of the emergency relief package. Parents were also reporting, and I have said this in the chamber before in response to other questions, that they couldn't access the level of care that they needed into the future under the relief package as it stood. But we don't believe and we don't agree with those opposite on a number of the points that they have made. Parents who are able to afford to pay for childcare, of course, will continue to be expected to do that. That is how the system works. But there are always those who, as Senator Billick has pointed out, who face further challenges. Those who cannot afford it Order. because of Senator Payne. Senator Billick, supplementary question. Thank you. One Western Australian mother told the West Australian newspaper, "My out-of-pocket expense is three quarters of my salary." When bills come in, I ha often have to work out how I can feed my family or pay the rates. Why is the government bringing back fees when costs went up 7.2 per cent in the last 12 months alone? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. As a government, we have put a considerable greater contribution into the childcare system in this country. Importantly, in the context of this process, we have also established uh, a transition payment uh, is, is, as it is described, that was the choice between having an ongoing JobKeeper or a 25 per cent subsistence payment to the sector. We are talking about the same amount of support in that context, but it does mean that more employees are able to be helped. And in the consultations that government had with the sector, that was seen as the better way forward. So that transition payment of 25 per cent of childcare services fees revenue will continue to support the sector through to the 27th of September. In fact, it puts $708 million back into the sector as it moves back to the childcare subsidy system. What we have said Senator to Aineel. providers is that in order to receive the transition payment, providers will need to guarantee employment levels order. to protect Senator staff Payne. as they move Time off job the answer has expired. Senator Billick, final supplementary question. Mr Morrison's childcare snapback will hurt family budgets. Mr Morrison's JobKeeper snapback will cost families their jobs. Mr Morrison's JobSeeker snapback will see them have a fraction of the support they need. Why is this government determined to hurt Australian families in September? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. Let me repeat that we have put $708 million into the sector as it moves back to the childcare subsidy system, and that is an important contribution from the Commonwealth, recognising a number of the challenges that continue in the sector. And I want to be very clear in terms of continued additional support for families who need it. We are providing a safety net in the form of an additional childcare subsidy for families in financial difficulty. Those families can still receive free care 
for a maximum of up to 100 hours per fortnight. The additional childcare subsidy for families transitioning from job seeker back to work, easing the activity test until the 4th of October to help families whose employment has been affected. They will receive subsidised care as they return to work and study and training. So to ensure the viability of the, of the sector, to ensure that childcare Order, can actually Senator be accessed, Payne, this is a very important process. Senator Seward. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, through you, uh, President, to the Minister, is the government still intending to drop people on the job seeker payment back to the base rate of $40 a day at the end of September? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Mm. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Senator Seward. Um, as I have um, mentioned in this chamber on a number of occasions in the last few weeks, um, the coronavirus supplement that was made available to people who were on working age payments uh, at the start of the, uh, the coronavirus um, pandemic um, was put in place for the period of the pandemic. Uh, we made it very clear at the time that the, all of the measures that we put in place, not just the coronavirus supplement, but all of the measures that we put in place, were time limited, they were timely, and they were to be targeted to make sure that we were able to help as many Australians as we possibly could get from where they were at the time with, this, uh, with the pandemic and the implications of the pandemic on the economy and on their employment prospects to get them from there to the other side of the pandemic. Uh, we are absolutely committed to make sure that we continue to support Australians so that we can, uh, we can manage, so that they can manage their lives during this pandemic. But as we've seen over recent days, we're now starting to see the economy opening up again. We're seeing restrictions able to be lifted. We're seeing jobs being created again in the marketplace. In fact, um, today we were, were pleased to report that we're starting to see the earliest of green shoots with increased job creation above the levels of job creation that we'd actually anticipated. Uh, and so today um, we are working our way through making sure that we can put in place all of the things that we need to do so that the economy can open up. And so those people that you refer to that are currently uh, receiving payments through income support are able to get back into the workforce so that they can make provisions um, so that they can improve their well-being. So, uh, Senator Seward, the, uh, the coronavirus supplement was time limited, it was temporary and it was targeted. Senator C, what a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll take that as a yes, you do intend to drop it back to $40 a day. Has the government done any modelling on the expected rate of mortgage defaults and the number of renters who will be in housing stress in October if the rate does go back to $40 a day? If not, why not? If so, what are the details, please? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And, and as the senator rightly points out, this has actually been one of the most unprecedented situations that any government in the world has ever had to confront. In fact, I'm sure that there hasn't been a government in the world that's had to confront this probably uh, since the Second World War. Um, and so, obviously, as we work our way forward to deal with all of the challenges that are before us, um, as we get our economy back on track and get it onto a stable footing, we'll be looking at many things. Um, and we will continue to monitor as we see the impacts of this crisis um, become further um, um, aware. And so we will continue to work with the sectors, all of the sectors around Australia. The Prime Minister continues to work with his state and territory counterparts through the, the continuation of the National Cabinet to make sure that we're in the best possible position on the other side of the coronavirus um, pandemic to make sure that we can continue to support all Australians in their lives. Senator C, would it final I'll take that question? one as a no. Minister, if the job seeker payment goes back to $40 a day at the, end of October, at, in, at the end of September, what essential bills such as housing, power, water, food does the government suggest people don't pay? Good. Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President. And thank you, Senator Seward, for your follow-up question. Um, Clearly, you haven't been listening to what the, uh, we've been saying in this place, what Senator Cormann said in response to many of the questions that he's been asked this week. The most important thing that we can do is to get the economy back open again so we can get people back into work. The other thing that Senator Seward, that you failed to recognise in your original question when you refer to the $40 a day is the myriad of other supports and payments that are particularly targeted 
to people. Uh, for instance, um, anybody who has got children obviously is eligible to receive uh, the full amount of the family tax benefit, Part A and Part B. Those people who are in rental accommodation that you refer to are obviously eligible to be in receipt of uh, the Commonwealth rental assistance. And there are a myriad of other payments that are made available to make sure that our welfare system targets the specific needs of individuals who require the support Cameron, of the federal government. He doesn't have a question. Senator Macdonald. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. How is the Liberal National Government expanding trade and gaining better access to markets? Sen with Senator, Patrick, <laughs> Senator Patrick, props aren't allowed. Remove that immediately. You, quite frankly, you're embarrassing yourself and you're demeaning Australian politics and the people who, elect for, who vote for you. Remove that or I'll remove you from the chamber immediately. Re remove yourself from the chamber, Senator Patrick. Senator Macdonald, I'll ask you to start your question again. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. My how is the Liberal National Government expanding trade and gaining better access to markets with our major trading partners for the agricultural sector? The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And can I thank uh, Senator Macdonald for her question and can I also recognise her strong interest and commitment to the regional communities of Australia and our agricultural and primary industry sectors. Um, Senator Macdonald has a very strong understanding of the importance of overseas markets to our rural and regional communities and the businesses that exist within them. Um, it is quite an astonishing statistic, Mr. President, that 70 per cent of agricultural production, of Australia's agricultural production, is exported. So therefore, access to a diverse range of overseas markets is very important to Australia and never more important than it is now uh, with the economic challenges that Australia faces uh, with uh, the coronavirus pandemic. This government uh, has a very strong record, Mr President, in delivering market access and opportunities uh, to all of our um, Australian industries, but particularly to our farmers and fishers. And, um, today, I'm very pleased to be in the Senate with my colleague, uh, the Minister for Trade, Minister Birmingham, on the cusp of uh, embarking on a new free trade agreement negotiations with the United Kingdom. Um, in the UK uh, and in the EU, where negotiations are already underway, there is enormous opportunity to deliver ambitious and comprehensive free trade agreements, securing more favourable access for Australian products into these new markets. The government understands that it's not just about new markets for our agricultural sector, but we also need to make sure that our industries know exactly how they can best make advantage of these new, new markets. We don't take a set and forget approach. So through a series of 12 uh, webinars, Austrade will ensure that exporters have all of the information that they need uh, so that they can take the most advantage on the steps that they need to take to take advantage of their free trade agreements. Um, and Australia's free trade agreements with trade trading partners continue to deliver huge Order, benefits Senator for Ruffin. Australia. Senator Macdonald, a supplementary question. How will the government's prioritisation of new and better free trade agreements benefit farmers and our rural, regional and remote communities, as well as the broader Australian economy? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you again to the Senator for her question, because exports are absolutely vital to the Australia's agricultural industries and our regional economies, with more than two-thirds of our production exported. So growth in Australian exports to premium markets is absolutely vital for the future of our agricultural sector, and maintaining strong relationships with our trading partners is absolutely critical to that success. Australian businesses that export, um, you'll be interested to know, on average hire 23 per cent more staff. Um, they pay 11 per cent higher wages and they have labour productivity 13 per cent higher than non-exporters. These are industries that are leading Australia. And so trade is a very major contributor to our economy. It's a major creator of jobs and it has a positive impact on our ability to be able to play for the essential services that all Australians rely on. It is absolutely essential that we get these free trade agreements in place. Senator Macdonald, a final supplementary question. 
What other measures has the government implemented to assist Australian agriculture to thrive? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, we have a, a range of programs that we've put in place to help um, Australian agriculture. I mean, just last week um, we implemented uh, the new Farm Household Alliance program to make sure that we can assist our farmers that, uh, to put food on the table and to help them through what has been a very crippling drought in our agricultural areas. We've also invested in rural financial counselling services so that farmers can get the advice, what the advice they need when they need it to make sure that they can make the best possible decisions uh, to ensure their longevity and to make sure that they're able to get into the export markets that Senator Birmingham is about to open up for them. Uh, it's also very important to note that we take the mental health and wellbeing um, of our farmers very, very seriously um, and make sure that we have got the funds and the resources behind that. But there are a myriad of other things that the government's doing. Concessional loans, taxation measures that are general, uh, water for fodder and silage and pasta, uh, path, pasture. Um, the Australian government is committed to Order, our farmers. Senator Rustin. <laughs> Senator Brown. Uh, thank you. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Last fortnight it was revealed that just 38 food boxes had been delivered under a program that was intended to provide 36,000 food boxes to older Australians. Who is responsible for this failure and why did it go so wrong? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, can I, at the outset, reject completely the premise of the question from uh, Senator Brown. Mr President, uh, this government, I think, quite wisely, quite wisely made provision to support senior Australians in the case that they, when, when there were issues at the supermarkets, when there were issues with senior Australians being able to get out, to be able to access support uh, that they might require. And so we put in place a measure uh, in fact, a range of measures that supported senior Australians to uh, be able to get the services that they required. In fact, Mr. President, I'm pleased that not so many people needed to have uh, emergency food supplies provided to them. But I do know, but I do know, Mr. President, that a number of the other measures that we put in Order. place to, to assist senior Australians to provide food and provide meals were extremely successful. So, Mr. President, for example, for example. The, the number of people receiving Meals on Wheels in some areas increased by 50 per cent. Another of the elements that we put in place to assist senior Australians that were in, are having problems providing food. So, Mr President, uh, we made provision Order. for what we estimated might be required by senior Australians uh, under that particular program. And, as, and, Mr President, senior Australians were freely available to, uh, are able to apply for the food boxes. Uh, it was a demand-driven process. And the fact that we've not needed to set out that many boxes, I think, is a success of many of the other measures that we've put in place, including the extraordinarily uh, additional uh, support that's been provided to senior Australians through programs like Meals on Wheels, uh, who have, as I said in some places, had up to a 50 per cent increase in demand and service provision. Senator Brown, order. On my left, Senator Brown is on her feet. On my uh, right now, Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. My first supplementary question is: When did the minister first learn that the program would deliver 0.1 per cent of the food boxes promised to older Australians? Does the minister believe that the program has been a success? And if not, what less lessons has he learned? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, I don't believe that making provision for something that we think might be having, happening or might happen during a pandemic is a failure. In fact, I think the fact that not so many people required that service uh, is a good thing. It is a good thing. So, Mr President, just because the provision or the estimate that we made of what the demand might be hasn't been met is a clear demonstration of the fact that the number of other services that we order, put in place Senator to Brown. support senior on Australians order, have Senator Brown. Uh, um, on relevance. I've asked a number of uh, questions and I would ask you to 
for the ask the minister to respond to the questions that have been asked. Senator Cormann on the point of order. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, the minister was being directly relevant. Some of the interjections were not being directly relevant. I mean, the minister made very clear that uh, people had the opportunity to apply for what is a demand-driven program. Uh, so on the, on the, I was about to points of order. I'm going to rule on the point of order. The minister is being directly relevant if he's talking about the program specifically about which he was asked. It is not appropriate for a point of order to simply ask me to instruct the minister to answer part or how to answer a question. The minister to continue. Order. Senator Watt. Mr. Mr. President, uh, I, I think it's, it's a good thing that not that many people have required Order. this form of assistance. But it is also a demonstration that the many other forms of assistance that we've provided to senior Australians Senator have clearly been a success. As Senator I said, Mr. President, in some places, up to a 50 per cent increase in the number of Meals on Wheels uh, demand uh, that have been provided through that service and an extra $50 million Order, Senator provided. Colbeck, time for the answer has expired. Senator Brown. Uh, thank Order. you, Mr. President. Why is this minister incapable of delivering older Australians anything more than empty slogans and unfulfilled promises? Order on my right. Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, I, I completely and utterly reject the premise of the question. We made provision for a service if people needed it. The fact is, Mr. President, that the demand hasn't been what uh, we suggested it, we thought it may have been. Mr. President, and it's a good thing that people have been able to get the food without having to rely on emergency relief Senator packages. Pratt. I think it's a good thing. Senator but it's Brown. also, as I've said, a demonstration of the fact that a range of measures that included additional capacity of over $50 million into Meals on Wheels has been a significant success because Meals on Wheels provides a number of other things than just delivery of a, uh, a, a food package might also deliver. It provides human contact. It provides a capacity to be in touch with the outside world. Mr President, I am not at all disappointed at the fact that the demand hasn't been what we thought it may have been. And I don't regard it as a failure Order, to make Senator a promise. Colbeck. I've regarded Time for it as the a answer success has expired. Please, Senator, please resume your seat. Order. Order. Senator Wong. Senator Davey. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Senator, how will building an outward-looking, open and sovereign trading economy help to strengthen the Liberal and Nationals government record delivery for Australian small and family businesses and local job creation, particularly in regional New South Wales? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Davey uh, for the question. And, uh, Senator Davey, like all of us in the Morrison government understands, it is critical to put in place policies to support small and family businesses in Australia. Uh, why? Because in particular, when it comes to rural and regional Australia, they well and truly are the backbone of those communities. They give back to those communities. They support local jobs. They support local charities. And of course, Course, they support the local sporting organisations. Mr President, this support has only been made even more important because of the impacts of COVID-19, but also because of the impacts of the bushfires uh, and because of the impacts of the drought on our economy. The government has a strong record of supporting small and family businesses across Australia, including, of course, fast-tracking tax relief for small and medium businesses, because we understand that the money that we give back to them, which was their own money, they are able to invest back into their business uh, and grow that business and create more jobs. We have also, as you know, improved access to finance uh, for those businesses so that they can access the money that they need, again, to grow their business and to create more jobs. We are also ensuring that small businesses are paid on time through our own government policies, leading by example, of course, but also in the implementation of the Payment Times reporting framework. On this side of the chamber, the government side of the chamber, we are absolutely committed to cutting red tape, obviously, and supporting small businesses with advice and disputes with the ATO and big business. Um, and of course, in the wake of COVID-19, we have put in place targeted measures to support small businesses, 
Uh, Mr. President, the government's funding boost today of the Export Market Development Grant acknowledges, of course, the importance of ensuring that small businesses have the opportunity uh, to develop their ability to get into export markets. Thank you, Senator Davey. Supplementary question. Thank you. And can you explain how the government's skills agenda, now bolstered by the Job Maker Plan, is assisting the creation of local training opportunities and skilled employees in regional and rural New South Wales? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And the, uh, the government is supporting apprentices in Australia and uh, creating local training opportunities, in particular in regional Australia. Um, Senator Davey might remember the implementation of the Australian Apprentice Wage Subsidy, a very successful measure which of course provides wage subsidies for apprentices in areas of skill shortage, in particular in rural and regional Australia. Um, that wage subsidy was actually opposed uh, by those on the Labor side of politics. Uh, quite bizarre, actually. One would have thought they would have supported a measure, uh, in particular that was targeted at creating opportunities for small and family businesses to take on apprentices, in particular in areas of need and in rural and regional Australia. But at the time, it was uh, famously called uh, by those on the Labor side of the chamber a political fiasco. Uh, well, no, it wasn't a political fiasco. It was a policy that was implemented specifically to support businesses in rural and regional Australia. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Thank you. And why is supporting small and family businesses and their apprentices critical to supporting local economies, local jobs and local economic recovery following COVID-19? Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. And again, uh, the Morrison government understands you need to support small and family businesses across Australia because they are the backbone of the Australian economy. It is critical that we put in place policies that will support them through this crisis, will enable them to come out the other side, prosper, grow, and ultimately create more jobs for Australians. Mr. President, there's around 3.5 million small businesses in Australia. They give the dignity of work every Every day, and they employ over six million Australians. And when you come from rural or regional Australia, uh, as so many in this side of the chamber do, you acutely understand that these businesses they are the backbone of that local economy. They are the ones that are out there supporting local jobs. They are the ones out there supporting the local charities. And of course, they are the ones uh, that you'll often see supporting the local sporting organisations. Uh, it is incredibly important that we put in place the right policies, as we are doing, to support these businesses Order. so they can Senator prosper, Cash. grow and create more Senator jobs. Faruqi. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Agriculture. In 2018, Minister Littleproud said he was shocked and gutted by footage of thousands of suffering sheep being cooked alive aboard the live export ship Awasi Express. All of Australia was shocked and appalled by this unspeakable cruelty to animals, which has been going on for decades. While the government refuses to shut down live exports, they did implement a ban on live sheep exports to the Northern Hemisphere during summer months because of the excruciating suffering heat stress inflicts. Now you've made a mockery of your own rules by granting an exemption to Retwa ship scheduled to leave Fremantle today. Minister, why did the government bother instituting new rules for live exports if it had no intention of enforcing them? The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you, Senator Faruqi, for your question. Um, firstly, can I say that um, the Australian government takes the, uh, responsi our responsibility uh, for animal welfare, particularly in our farming sector, very, very seriously. Um, as you'd be aware, um, the decision uh, was made by the federal court to allow uh, the El Kuwait to uh, load and sail. Uh, and I'd also like to point out to you that um, there is an independent observer aboard that ship uh, and will sail with that voyage uh, to, all the way to its destination. Um, so the, uh, the matter that you are referring to um, is, is one that we take very seriously. There are in place uh, very, very strict rules and guidelines around uh, the export of, uh, of live animals from this country. Um, and you rightly pointed out, and I think everybody in Australia was absolutely disgusted at the footage that we saw 
um, last year. Um, and that is why this government has worked absolutely tirelessly with the industry, with the sector, with people um, who have an interest in, in, um, in the welfare of animal, animals to make sure that our live export trade is done in a manner that is absolutely world's best practice. And in fact, um, Senator Faruqi, I, I think I would be correct in saying um, that as Australia's um, live export trade and our animal welfare conditions that we expect all of our farmers uh, to undertake is seen around the rest of the world as the best practice. And through our demonstration of best practice, we like to think that we are encouraging other countries around the world to undertake best practice as well and in doing so increase the levels of, uh, of animal welfare protections that are in place for all animals uh, that are around the world. Uh, but we will not destroy our Australian agricultural sector uh, by ideological pursuit when we have put in place very, very strict provisions. Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question. Minister, the Department of Agriculture obviously has a glaring conflict of interest as the so-called independent regulator of an industry it actively promotes. The Moss review showed that the Department of Agriculture had failed animals and was incapable of regulating the live export industry. Will the government commit to establishing an independent office of animal welfare at arm's length from the minister and the Department of Agriculture to protect animals from cruelty and exploitation? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, I first of all refute um, that there is a conflict um, of, of interest, and I would uh, absolutely um, endorse. The, uh, the processes that are in place now as a result of many reviews and, and much, uh, much change uh, since we saw that horrific footage uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and so I think that the Australian government, through the, independent, um, uh, um, uh, the independence of the Department of Agriculture's role uh, in being the inspector, uh, have put in place um, a set of conditions that uh, ensure that Australia's live exports are governed under the strictest, very strictest of conditions, and the fact that we were um, that we have the LQ8 has been able to load um, today is a reflection that the federal court viewed the provisions that have been put in place by the Department of Agriculture as being adequate to protect the welfare of those animals on board that ship. Yeah, yeah. Senator Faruqi, a final supplementary question. Minister, I have received thousands of emails in just the last two weeks from people across Australia who are angry at the way this government mistreats animals. Order, they want order an on my right. Order, so, so, order on my right. Stop the clock. Order on my right. I need to hear the question. Senator Fruki to continue. They want animal cruelty to end, but of course this government just does not care. Will the minister just be honest and admit once and for all that this government will prioritise profits for big business over animal welfare every single time? Senator Rustin. Uh, well, first of all, I would say absolutely the Australian government does not, does not uh, do as you have alleged. The Australian government is absolutely committed to upholding the absolutely very high standards of animal welfare while supporting a sustainable live export trade. Um, this is very important that we get the balance right. Um, animal welfare, absolute priority. Jobs for Australians, particularly rural and regional jobs for rural and regional Australia, and the economies and the regional communities that, that rely upon them. We saw the absolute disaster that was created when we banned, at a knee-jerk reaction, the live export from northern Australia and to watch those hundreds of thousands of cattle die of starvation because an industry got stopped in its tracks was probably far crueler than anything that you could ever imagine, Senator Faruqi. So maybe think about what you're saying, because right now we are absolutely committed to the highest level of animal welfare, and we will continue to be so whilst providing Order, Senator jobs. Rustin. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. In what has been described as a, and I quote, rare public speech, end quote, last night at the ANU, the Foreign Minister finally acknowledged the issue of foreign state-backed disinformation in Australia. Order. The risks of foreign state-backed disinformation have been known for many years, given, for example, the occurrences in Crimea in 2014, the US in 2016 and Hong Kong last year. Can the Minister explain why it has taken the government until now to finally act? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. 
I must be having I must be having hearing difficulties today, Mr. President. It comes with age, I'm sure. But let me start at the beginning. I'd be very happy to send Senator Wong the collected works. Uh, so that she had ready access to a vast range uh, of remarks. And in fact, Senator, I'll have a drop down to the chamber for you any time. And in fact, I'll even table it if that would assist you with your consideration. Uh, I think what the Australian government uh, has, has clearly set out, has clearly set out, uh, and indeed what the Prime Minister talked about at the Lowy Institute, was prosecuting a case for our national interests, and that includes through multilateral institutions. As you know, the Prime Minister instituted the multilateral audit and asked my Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade to carry out that audit. Part of that process has, has meant examining over a hundred multilateral institutions, processes and fora, and that has underpinned everything we have done. What the audit findings have shown us uh, is the value of focusing on our national interest and ensuring that, in doing so, we work within the appropriate systems to achieve outcomes for Australia in our national interest, which should always be the premise upon which Order. Senator Wong on a point of order. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, direct relevance. The question is about foreign state-backed disinformation. And my question was why the government has taken until now to act, given the examples we've seen internationally. Um, I've allowed you to restate the question. I'm listening carefully to the minister's answer. She has 47 seconds remaining. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, and I was responding, I thought, directly to a number of the observations that Senator Wong made in her in her question. But specifically, if she wishes, in relation to the question of disinformation, what the government has made clear is the threat that disinformation, no matter who perpetrates it, uh, places or, or presents to the orderly provision of information in communities, particularly in the context of a pandemic. And the critical uh, impact that we have seen in a number of countries that has drawn together the European Union, that has drawn together 131 countries in a motion uh, drafted by, uh, by, by Latvia uh, on the infodemic, is absolutely symbolic of those concerns and of our Order. concerns Senator in relation Payne. to that impact. Senator Wong, supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters said in 2016 it was essential this issue of foreign state-backed disinformation be considered as part of Australian elections. So I again ask, after four years of thinking about it, beyond the headlines, what is the Morrison government now actually doing to protect Australian elections from foreign state-backed disinformation? Senator Payne. Mr President, I would remind the Senator and those opposite of the passing of the uh, Countering Foreign Interference legislation, which is absolutely apposite uh, in this case, absolutely apposite to the sorts of issues that the Senator is raising. So, in the midst of the pandemic and in the midst of the crisis that we and millions and millions of people around the world have been dealing with. Order. We are absolutely focused on the importance of shining a light on disinformation because it is the most effective antidote. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Thank you. In last night's speech, the Foreign Minister also finally rebuked Mr Morrison's infamous negative globalism speech of last October. Given the internal opponents of multilateralism within the coalition include Minister Dutton, who says, and I quote, there are other bodies within the UN that aren't acting certainly in the interests of Australia. How will this minister persuade her colleagues that multilateralism is a key Australian national interest? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. And I absolutely and fundamentally reject the premise of Senator Wong's question. Absolutely and fundamentally. And as I was trying to say in my response to her first question, very, very clearly when the Prime Minister talked at the Lowy Institute, he talked about prosecuting a case for our national interests, including through multilateral institutions. He instituted the multilateral audit. He asked the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade to carry it out, and that audit has been absolutely comprehensive. And what it shows us is that Australia has a very important role to play in shaping the values and the norms within multilateral institutions themselves. And we're talking about institutions that are extremely important to Australia, Mr. President, in terms of advancing our national interests, promoting and protecting our values. 
whether they are underpinning the global rules and norms that ensure a level playing field, whether they're regulating international cooperation in areas like aviation, in telecommunications, in maritime transport, Order. in intellectual Senator property Payne, and a range of others. The answer has expired. Senator Henderson. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister outline how the Morrison government is building an outward-looking and globally competitive defence industry here in Australia? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Henderson, for the question and for your unrelenting support for Australian defence industry. Uh, look, the Morrison government is fully committed to delivering a globally competitive Australian defence industry a defence industry that delivers three sovereign outcomes for our nation. Firstly, to meet our contemporary defence needs. Secondly, to create thousands of multi-generational jobs right here in Australia. And thirdly, to achieve greater export success. We are providing an unprecedented opportunities for Australian industry to participate in defence work. We are very purposely and very deliberatively maximising opportunities for Australian industry involvement in defence programs. As our companies bid for work, they are now required to submit Australian industry capability plans detailing how they will maximise opportunities for Australian businesses. We absolutely hold these companies to account on their contracted commitments through enforceable deliverables. And we're now also developing an independent Australian capability audit program to validate delivery of this contracted commitment. At the heart of our industry policy is a commitment to support the global competitiveness of Australia's defence industry, as seen in our defence export strategy. And to that end, this government has committed $20 million per year to support Australia's defence industry achieve greater export success. We have established the Australian Defence Export Office and a grants program. We have appointed a defence ex export advocate. We have released the fourth and largest defence sales catalogue this year. And finally, we have also invested $1.3 billion to support Australian technical innovation in defence industry. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Can the minister outline how this government's defence industry policies are creating opportunities for Australian companies and workers, both here and overseas? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I certainly can, Senator Henderson. The Morrison government's $200 billion investment in defence capability provides unprecedented opportunities for Australian companies. And let me tell everybody in this chamber they are embracing these opportunities in record numbers. Thanks to the policies of those on this side of the chamber, global defence companies are establishing uniquely Australian entities uh, that are today employing thousands and thousands of Australians and are exporting Australian-built cutting-edge capability to the world. I'm so proud of companies like Talus Australia, of French origin, is now employing almost 4,000 Australians, and they are now delivering uh, for Australia and also now exporting high technology products for defence, including the Bendigo built Bushmasters. Another wonderful example are the 50 Australian companies, such as Kemmering Australia, just outside of Geelong, who are now exporting Order. over $1.7 billion the of export. Has expired. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline how these policies are setting the foundations to build the attack class submarine here in Australia. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And again, thank Order. you for the question. And let me be very clear: the attack class submarine is on time and it is on budget, Senator Stirl. In the current preliminary Order. design phase, we are starting to select many of the systems and also the future suppliers. As Naval Group Australia approaches industry, it is a mandatory requirement for Australian industry plans to be developed as they approach the Australian market. This will ensure that we are maximising Australian industry content, a minimum of 60 per cent. To ensure we are developing our knowledge base, our sovereign knowledge base, we already have over 100 Australians working in Cherbourg in France, which includes 20 of Naval Group Australia's 200 employees. As this project ramps up, I am absolutely confident Naval Group Australia 
will succeed in ensuring its presence in Australia generates thousands of multi-generational jobs and, in time, more defence export Order, exports. Senator Reynolds. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Communications, Cybersecurity and the Arts, Senator Reynolds. On Monday, the minister said in relation to mail speed standards, and I quote, there have been no changes, no changes, no changes, no changes. I refer to the media release issued by the Minister for Finance and the Minister for Communications, Cybersecurity and the Arts on 21 April 2020, which said the following. Required delivery time for regular interstate letters will be extended to five days after the day of posting. Who was right, the minister or the media release? The Minister representing the Minister for Communications, Cyber Safety and the Arts, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I stand by my statement in this chamber earlier. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Ah, so you were right in Means no changes, no changes, no changes. Hmm. Last night, Senator Hanson said of Australia Post workers— Order. Senator O'Neill. Senator O'Neill, please Thank continue. You. Last night, Senator Hanson said of Australia Post workers, and I quote, there will be no redundancy offered to these workers. Can the minister guarantee there will be no reduction in Australia Post's workforce? Senator Reynolds. Uh, as, as I said previously, as I believe I said previously in this chamber, there will be no forced redundancies of their posties, and that remains correct. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. It's been reported that Australia Post has hired James Hardy's former spin doctor. Why does the government need expensive PR advice when it's clearly capable of running misleading arguments without assistance? Order. Senator Reynolds. Senator Reynolds. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And I would remind the Senator that Australia Post's day-to-day operations are the responsibility of its board and management and not of government. Senator Cormann. Um, thank you, Mr President. I ask that further questions be placed on a notice paper and I also seek leave to um, uh, add to an answer provided uh, to a question uh, by Senator Watt uh, yesterday. Uh, leave is granted. I, I thank the Senate. Mr President, I've written uh, to you in relation to uh, an answer I gave to a question by Senator Watt yesterday in relation to uh, bushfire relief. Uh, I stated that about $1.4 billion worth of bushfire response and recovery funding is already hitting the ground in communities. To clarify my answer, most of this $1.4 billion in funding comes from our $2 billion uh, national bush fire recovery fund, around $1 billion of it in fact, as I've previously stated. This of course includes funding that represents our share of the debris cleanup, which will be reimbursed to the state government in accordance with standard arrangements. The cleanup is uh, well underway, as I also outlined yesterday. However, as the Prime Minister always said, the $2 billion fund was in addition to the response and recovery funding that the Commonwealth already funds under standard disaster recovery arrangements, around $400 million of the $1.4 billion I referenced uh, as already hitting the ground as part of those standard disaster recovery arrangements that the Commonwealth funds. The fact remains that we have over $1.4 billion in federal funding uh, in responding to the bushfire crisis, hitting the ground in affected communities, and this is assisting those communities now. I hope that that clarifies the answer provided yesterday, and I table the letter. Thank you, Minister. Are there any motions to take note of answers? You wish to. Uh, Senator Watt. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I do thank Minister Cormann for providing yes. that statement yes. to Sorry, the Senate. Sorry, Senator Watt. Um, I thought you were doing taking notes, so I'm a bit uh, so late no, to I catch seek, up. So you seek I move leave. to take note or seek, seek, seek. seek leave to take note of the Minister's statement. Is leave granted? Oh. Is leave granted? I need an answer. Uh, leave is granted for three minutes, Senator Watt. Okay, that's all I need. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy President. As I was saying, I do thank Minister Cormann for uh, the statement he just made there. Uh, but 
Unfortunately, again, what we've seen in that statement from Minister Cormann are three hallmarks of this government uh, from him and from the Prime Minister. Uh, misrepresentations of uh, their, their previous statements, getting basic figures wrong and being loose with the truth. Now, just to remind people what this concerns, yesterday I asked Minister Cormann a number of questions about the pathetic efforts of this government in relation to bushfire recovery. Uh, and in answer to the questions that I asked, uh, the minister uh, claimed, uh, and I quote, about $1.4 billion worth of funding out of the $2 billion National Bushfire Recovery Fund is already hitting the ground in communities. Now, I wasn't surprised that the minister made that comment because this is one of the uh, misrepresentations that this government is consistently making in relation to bushfire recovery. Uh, the truth is uh, that the Prime Minister announced a $2 billion bushfire recovery fund in January this year. The government's own figures, which were tabled about a week or so ago, indicate that uh, only $529 million of that $2 billion fund has been spent. The government then uh, tries to include another $470 million or so um, that it will be spending in the future on things like debris removal and tries to say that it has therefore spent a billion dollars from the $2 billion fund, even though they've actually only spent $529 million on their own figures. And then, to be that little bit more cheeky, they throw in, throw in another $400 million uh, of grants and loans that have been made to disaster to bushfire victims, as occurs after every single disaster that this country faces. That extra $400 million has nothing whatsoever to do with the $2 billion bushfire recovery fund, which, as I say, on the government's own figures, has only, in, has only spent $529 million. So I was a little disappointed when I got Senator Cormann's letter today, uh, where he says, uh, that what he said yesterday was that about $1.4 billion worth of bushfire res response and recovery funding is already hitting the ground. If that, if that is what he had said yesterday, then there wouldn't have been a need for me to write to him. But the truth is that isn't what he said yesterday. What he said yesterday in the answer to the question that I asked was that $1.4 billion worth of funding out of the $2 billion fund is being spent. That is simply not true, and I think it would have been preferable for him to be honest in his answer in the letter that he provided uh, to the Senate today and admit that he got it wrong. So very disappointing that we see this minister misrepresent his previous statements. It's yet another example of him and this government getting their figures wrong. Anyone remember the $60 billion JobKeeper bungle? I think I remember that one. This minister does have a problem with numbers. He didn't get them for Peter Dutton either, and again they're being loose with the truth. Thank you, Senator. What, Senator Wong? Seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Thank you. <coughs> a leave is granted for two minutes. Well, well you know, I, I rise to follow Senator Watts' comments and just make this point. When you have the leader of the government in the Senate being loose with the truth in question time, being given the opportunity to come in here uh, and demonstrate the accountability that our democracy demands from ministers, to demonstrate as the leader the examples to his front benches, what do we get? We get more measly words, more tricky words, a bit loose with the truth, doesn't fess up to the fact that he got it wrong. We would have more regard for ministers on that side if they were actually prepared to come in here and say, I correct the record. That's what democ democracy requires. But even from Senator Cormann, who otherwise is generally somebody who does understand uh, this democratic principle. We get more words where he's saying, well, I didn't actually say that, when we know he did. And in the same question time, we have, uh, we have Senator uh, Colbeck refusing to acknowledge what after tax means. We have Senator Reynolds saying that a change from three to five days isn't a change. This is a mockery. And what it demonstrates is the rot at the top of the Morrison government, where the Prime Minister is loose with the truth. You're all being infected by it and you bring it into question time, which is a travesty of what it should be in our democracy. And Senator Cormann, you should be ashamed of yourselves and you should have fronted up. Thank you, Senator Wong. So we move to taking note. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Thank you, Madam Senator Gallagher. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Payne to the questions asked from uh, Senators Pratt and Billick. Uh, the questions asked of the Minister for Women, Senator Payne, today were going to issues around uh, women and particularly the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on women uh, and some of the particular issues that are being uh, drawn, I think, to all of our attention. Many of us knew these, but 
uh, previously. Uh, but I think the coronavirus pandemic has really shone a torch not only on the value of women's work but also some of the disadvantages uh, that women experience in the labour market. We know that women have lower participation rates, lower earnings. Um, we know that they've lost more jobs. I think in, May, in April alone, 500,000 um, people lost their jobs. 55 per cent of them were women. Uh, we know that more women um, feature in the underemployment figures. Um, and we know that in terms of lost hours of work, women experienced a greater, uh, a greater drop in hours of work lost. We also know that women are uh, overrepresented or disproportionately represented in industries that have been smashed by the coronavirus uh, restrictions, so in industries of food, retail, entertainment, accommodation. We know that women are overrepresented in, in uh, insecure work, um, in, in work that uh, pays lower incomes, and all of this, um, all of those areas have been hit hard by the coronavirus uh, restrictions. On the other side, we, on the value of women's work, uh, Madam Deputy President, women are and have featured prominently in the essential frontline workers, nurses, healthcare workers, early childhood educators, teachers, um, aged care workers. 87 per cent of nurses and midwives are women. 87 per cent of aged care workers are women. 96 per cent of early childhood educators are women. And we have relied on these roles um, uh, to keep um, the community cared for uh, in terms of retail, in supermarkets and cleaners, again, where you will see more women than men. Um, key jobs that perhaps have uh, not been recognised for their value have been really shown to be so important uh, during the coronavirus pandemic. Now, the Minister for Women told us that the PM, that the Prime Minister and the government acknowledged um, the disproportionate impact uh, that the coronavirus uh, pandemic had had on women and the restrictions, the consequential uh, restrictions that were put in place, had on women. Well, I mean that admission from the government begs the next question. Well, if that's the case, why are they making decisions that they are making, which have again a harsher impact on women? And I'll come back to that. I think one of the issues uh, um, certainly is um, how they have designed um, some of the programs. If you take JobKeeper, for example, uh, designed to exclude um, people that might have one or more jobs, work in cas highly casualised industries with high turnover, that will exclude uh, women from being able to access uh, JobKeeper. We know that women are doing more of the caring and unpaid work at home, taking on the, on the added responsibilities of caring for children and perhaps elderly parents. Um, again, that has come to hit women hard as well. So JobKeeper, I think um, Home Builder is another one where the government has ignored Treasury advice around social housing and the benefits of that. We know 62 per cent of tenants in social and public housing are women. Uh, we know they require um, social housing. Some women, and more, 62 uh, per cent require uh, social housing to, uh, to support them. And again, this government, in their response on the housing front, have ignored that very important area. Uh, which not only would bring uh, benefits, I think, from uh, public, it would be broader benefits uh, to the community as well. And childcare. I mean, why was uh, the childcare the first industry that was kicked off JobKeeper? With the snapback that's coming, with the fiscal cliff that's coming in September, why was it childcare? I mean, if we're trying to get women back to work, why is it childcare? We know childcare remains one of the biggest barriers for women's full participation in the labour force, and yet this government chose to remove free childcare and kick the workers off JobKeeper and put in place a transition arrangement, which the minister acknowledges is less than what they were getting before. It's going to disproportionately affect women. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Selger. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy President. And very pleased to uh, join the debate in terms of uh, the Labor Party's uh, question time tactics. And indeed, I want to focus on uh, Senator Pratt's question um, because I think, as we reflect uh, on the current state of play, as we reflect 
on uh, last year's federal election. And we think about how out of touch the Labor Party are, as was demonstrated again uh, by the Australian people overwhelmingly rejecting them. Uh, we think about the kind of issues and attacks that the Labor Party launches uh, on the government, uh, which demonstrate how out of touch they are. Now, Senator Pratt's questioning uh, attacking uh, Minister Michael Suker, an outstanding minister uh, in this government, doing an outstanding job. Uh, of course, we are reminded uh, of, of just how out of touch Labor are when their attack on Minister Suka uh, and a program uh, that is designed to support tens of thousands of jobs in the construction industry. Uh, the attack on Minister Suka is, uh, well, there's a lot of men who work in construction. Uh, that appears to be Labor's attack when it comes to the construction industry. Uh, so if you want an example of why they continue to sit on the opposition benches. Uh, perhaps we could reflect on their disdain for the housing industry, their inability to look beyond the very, very important issues, the very, very important issues in the housing industry, because their critique now about the home builder program, so important to so many Australians, so important is, oh well, a lot of men work in the construction industry. And we'll come back. We'll come back to some of those issues. Uh, but I'm reminded uh, about, and I, I'd like Order. to compare and contrast, you know, between Minister Suka and uh, the coalition government uh, in terms of being in touch with their electorate and in the community. I'm reminded that Bill Shorten actually launched his campaign, I think, uh, in the 2019 campaign in the seat of Deakin, uh, in Minister Suka's electorate, because uh, they were coming to get him. They were coming to get him because they had a plan which the people in the outer suburbs of Melbourne were just going to embrace. Uh, they were going to make so many gains in Victoria. Why were they going to make those gains? Oh, it was because it was because the Labor Party had a plan that reflected the values of Australians. Now, now let's think. Order. Let's think about what some of those plans were. Order. Let's Senator think about McAllister. what some of those plans were. Well, central, central to their election prospects, which of course the people overwhelmingly rejected, was Labor's housing tax. Labor's housing tax. So here they are in question time again today, attacking a scheme, attacking a scheme that defends jobs in the in the construction industry simply because there are Order. too many men in the construction industry. Order. Well, what did Labor want to do to the construction industry? They wanted to gut the construction industry. One of the reasons that they were rejected at the last election was because of Labor's housing tax. Can you imagine? And just reflect for a moment. Just reflect for a moment on where we would be if the Labor Party had, had come to government and implemented that housing tax ahead of the COVID crisis and the hit to the economy we have had. They would have had the absolute double whammy of being whacked from pillar to post. You know, the Labor Party talk a big game, and just before I go on to that, you know, I'm reminded as to, uh, as to how seriously they are taken on some of these issues by Tim Richardson, who says he's concerned about federal Labor's intervention because they haven't one, they've won one election in the last 25 years. Well, maybe it's because of policies like the housing tax. But they talk a big game uh, on women. But when it comes to actually acting, well, we've had the record in terms of women's workforce participation. We have delivered in a way that the Labor Party couldn't. Over 800,000, almost 900,000 jobs were created for women Senator by the coalition. But I'm reminded of what the Labor Party voted against in their protection racket for the CFMEU and the misogynist thugs in the CFMEU. And they say, oh, well, now we're acting on John Setka. In 2015, they rejected a motion. They voted against a motion that simply condemned Luke Collier for abusing in female FWBC inspectors. Um, Sean Reardon, who made threatening late-night phone calls to a female staff member of the building industry watchdog, to a, a CFMEU official, spat at a female inspector when she was called out to the worksite to inspect a union blockade. They talk a big game. We've seen it in Victoria this week. As soon as you go beneath the underbelly, as soon as you go beneath the veneer, we see what they actually do. And they're on the record here, defending the CFMEU, excusing their disgraceful behaviour. We're not going to be lectured to by this mob on the other side. Thank you, Senator Seselja. Senator McAllister. Thanks, uh, Deputy President. Well, for 2,509 days, this backward-looking government, as exemplified by the last contribution, has completely failed women. And while we live in hope that they might stop phoning it in from the 1950s, 
There's no indication that anything has changed during the most serious uh, period we've been through economically, the first recession in 29 years while we've been dealing with COVID-19. They have failed mothers by snapping back to a childcare system that is expensive and complex. They have failed older women, leaving them to face poverty and homelessness in retirement. They have failed young women in insecure and low-paying jobs by making so many of them ineligible for JobKeeper. We know what those opposite think about working women in their hearts. They think that women's economic lives don't matter and that they would be better served in the home, as we heard from Senator Rennick just this week. But unlike so many of those opposite, we don't hanker for a world where women are locked at home behind white picket fences. And unlike Senator Seselja, we don't think that women and men's interests stand in opposition to one another. We think that both ought to be considered and that this is an, absolutely, an absolute imperative in the public policy debate. Because Labor wants something more for Australian women. We want our daughters and our nieces to have every opportunity. We want them paid what they're worth on the day that they enter the workforce and every day subsequently. We want them to retire in dignity. If they decide to have children, we want them supported to combine a career with their parenting responsibilities. Now, is any of this, any of this at all, laid out in any way in the government's plan for women or for the response to COVID-19? We wouldn't know very much because the government rarely talks about women. And indeed, invited to do so today, we've just had five minutes from Senator Zazelja where he could barely find, the, uh, find it in himself to even mention the word. They show almost no interest in the economic lives of women. It's not surprising in some ways that their policy settings have so little to offer Australian women when we think about the government's expenditure review committee, which is comprised entirely of men, not a single woman sitting in that most important decision-making body. And I recall on one occasion when I raised the issue of the unfair impact of tax arrangements on Australian women, then Treasurer Morrison responded with the patronising reply that we don't have pink forms and blue forms at tax time and there was no need to consider the impact of their tax proposals on Australian women. Well, the Liberal men of EIC may think that women's economic lives are a joke. Well, I can tell you that that is not how we see our lives. And survey after survey indicates that women want so much more. Tragically, the first thing they want is respect. Respect in the workplace, and I dare say they'd like some respect from their representatives here in Canberra. The COVID-19 period would have been a good opportunity for the Liberals to change direction, to come to grips with the very great differences between the men and women's economic lives and the need for a policy that responds to the lives of women. The ABS has released data showing women have lost jobs since March at 1.3 times the rate that men have lost jobs. But we don't see any specific response to that or any indication that it matters. Part-time work and casual employment can be conveniently flexible, but often the result is that women are really taking these jobs so they can balance the work and family lives. Well, when it came to designing a response in COVID-19, what did the government do? They constructed JobKeeper in such a way that so many people in casual work were excluded, and so many of them were women. There is an opportunity now to create something better. We don't want a snapback. We don't want a snapback to an unfair world for women. We don't want a snapback to a world where women earn 14 per cent less than men. We don't want a snapback to a world where women retire with 47 per cent of the super balances of men. We don't want a snapback to a world where women's career possibilities are constrained because childcare is not available or affordable. We don't want a snapback to one of the most gendered labour markets in the world. This crisis presents a perfect opportunity to actually build something better for Australian women, and it's a shame the government appears entirely uninterested. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Your time has expired. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, this is an extraordinary straw man that the Labor Party continues to put forward. And 
I guess we should be used to it. We should be used to it at this point. Senator O'Neill, we should be used to it at this point. But in the face of an unprecedented economic and health crisis, in the face of an unprecedented economic and health crisis, where we've seen from this government a comprehensive response across the economy, across the economy, instead what we get from the Labor Party is the usual politics of identity, mm. politics of division. They cherry pick some information, they spin it in a particular way, they choose their data set very carefully, they ignore the overall economy, they ignore the comprehensive measures that this government has put in place to underpin our economy, to underpin economic growth, to get the economy moving again, to get all Australians back in work, to get all Australians back into the, into the in participation in the workforce, to get small business back up and running, to protect our families, to give people a chance to be the best they can possibly be. And we get this politics of identity, this cherry picking of information. So from the latest ABS stats, and absolutely I will acknowledge that the ABS stats shows that uh, the, the women in the workforce were impacted very, very hard by the crisis that confronts this government. But does the Labor Party, does the Labor Party Senator O'Neill, ever raise the fact that the latest ABS stats also show that jobs for women recovered at 1.4 per cent, whereas jobs for men only recovered at 0.4 per cent? Do you ever talk about the identity politics of that? Of course you don't, because it doesn't fit into your narrative. It doesn't fit into your narrative. It doesn't fit Order. into this politics Order. of identity that you are seeking to continually drive. Now, uh, Senator Zelja rightly pointed out that almost 900,000 jobs created for women by this government in the uh, six years before the coronavirus uh, impacted our economy so remarkably and, and so with, with, with such great venom. Um, you know, this government has a strong and proud record of supporting women's participation in the labour market. Uh, prior to COVID-19, the March 2020 labour force figures showed record high, near record high uh, employment of women in the economy. Uh, six, almost 6.2 million women employed in the Australian economy. Labour participation rate for women uh, at a, a almost record high of 61.3 per cent two and a half percentage points higher than when the coalition took office in September 2013. Between September 2013 and prior to COVID-19 impacting our economy, almost 900,000 jobs created for women. Wow. Does the Labor Party ever quote these sort of statistics? Of course they don't, because they're too busy Absolutely. playing the politics of identity, the politics of division, cherry-picking information to suit their particular narrative. The Labor's later Labor Force survey figures showed that seasonally adjusted employment for women fell by 325,000. And of course, this is the impact of the COVID crisis. This is an impact across the economy and one that this government is only too well aware of and one that this government is seeking to compre comprehensively guess, address. Now, let me just give you one more example. Uh, today, uh, Minister Birmingham talked about uh, the need to open our borders to get the tourism and hospitality sector up and running again. That will disproportionately impact, in the positive, women, because women are a greater percentage of the workforce in that particular sector. Does that factor into Labor's narrative? Do they come out in support of Minister Birmingham jumping up and down and congratulating him for his words at the press club? Of course they do not, because, again, it doesn't fit into their narrow worldview. We want to get the whole Australian economy. We want to support all Australian workers. We want to support all Australian working families to get um, out of this economic and health crisis, to get the economy back up and running again as quickly as we possibly can. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator O'Neill. Well, thank you uh, very much, Deputy President. And uh, what a shock. What a shock that we've got all blokes on that side speaking on this issue where we've been asking 
for them to verify the fact that they have failed women during this massive crisis facing Australia. COVID-19 is an experience that many of us have could not have imagined and will never ever experience it. And the burden Order. of care that has fallen to women Order. has fallen heavily on the women of this nation. I am proud to be an Australian woman. I am proud to be an Australian woman in the Labor Party. There are many of us. We are very varied and very different, and we bring our perspectives to this place. We bring them in many, many more numbers than you guys. Now, I will give you the fact that on this side of the chamber, you've got a few more here in the Senate, but you couldn't line one up today, not one to stand up to answer our questions about women being affected uh, by COVID. You left Senator it to the blokes again, Senator, your usual standard. Senator O'Neill, uh, there's a point of order, I think, from Senator Smith. Point of order on quotas. Point of order on quotas. Uh, that's not a point of order, Senator Smith. Uh, Senator Smith, please resume your seat. That is not a point of order. Please continue, Senator O'Neill. We, we've heard this bleating and moaning from these poor men opposite who are denying even what the minister said in the other place. The women have been hardest hit through COVID-19, uh, and that is Senator quoting their— Senator O'Neill, please resume your seat. Senator Smith. For those Smith. people who are not able to watch on television, one is, uh, third Senator, of the Labor senators Senator are men Smith, on the other are side. you raising a point of order? If you're not, please refrain from interrupting. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. I can tell I've hit a raw nerve because Senator Smith is actually one of the more exemplary senators on the other side, and I can see I've even upset him. So I consider that quite, quite effective in arguing the point that this government— uh, Senator O'Neill, please resume your seat. Is it a point of order, Senator Smith? I was going to comment on Senator O'Neill's accurate re reflection uh, on me. Senator right. Smith, that is not a point of order. I think senators have the right to be heard in silence, and people jumping up, making spurious points of order, fit into the category of not um, being respectful to the senator making their contribution. Please continue, Senator O'Neill. Uh, look, I've heard of mansplaining, but I think we've got man interrupting here going on. A woman speaking her mind, Australian Labor woman speaking to the reality of Australian women who are at this very time making decisions in one critical by election in the seat of Eden Monero. They've got a choice between sending another bloke like this lot to come to Canberra or sending a great woman in the shape of Christy McBain, and I encourage them to do that. Because the problem with this government is they simply do not listen to the voice of women. They do not understand the challenges of being women in Australia. And if they're going to call being women in Australia and standing up for women identity politics, then they need to go back and learn a few issues, a few understandings about what identity politics actually is. Minister Lee, in the other, in the other place, declared Order. the fact that women have been hardest hit through COVID-19. And what I'm worried about as a, an Australian woman standing up for the women impacted, is that this government has lined up a set of policies where we are set to snap back to unaffordable childcare right around this country. Women are talking to me. They're talking to their partners, sitting at dining room tables, figuring out how much they can actually manage in terms of putting food on the table or paying for childcare, because this government has so mismanaged the whole childcare sector. They are dudding aged care workers not providing them with the promised money that they announced. We see this time and time again, a series of announcements from this government and then failure to deliver. They're taking away from childcare workers. They are refusing paid parental leave. These are the priorities of this government. And when they said at the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, in response to great passionate advocacy by the unions of this country, the big businesses of this country and the Labor Party. When we begged and pleaded with this government to provide wage subsidies, they finally came through with a job seeker. Yep, they came through with it, but who did they take it away from first? They took it away from the women of Australia. They took it away from the childcare workers, the most female-dominated industry in this country. Women in Australia need to remember that this government does not stand up for you. The Liberal National Party government have failed Australians. It's a matter of international record from the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap report that Australia was 23rd in the rankings in 2013, 23rd in the world in terms of women's 
uh, women's uh, economic capacity. The reality now, after seven years of this blokey dominated LNP government that's out of touch with the women of Australia, is we've slipped all the way down to 44 of 153 countries. And after what they've done in response to COVID, I have no expectation that it will rise. In fact, I'm sure it will get even worse. We know that this government has failed Australian women. We are very concerned as the Labor Party that childcare will not be accessible to women, that they won't be able to get back to work, that there will be barriers to their participation in the economy and the society. We are concerned that Scott Morrison's snap back will actually be a job crusher for the women of Australia. Question is the motion moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Country no, the ayes have it. Senator Seward. Thank you. And just to uh, let the chamber know, I'll be using half of our allocated time, and Senator Faruqi will be using the other half. I rise to take note of the answer from the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin, to my question on Job Seeker. And the answer is yes, the government still is intending to drop, to drop Job Seeker back to the old base rate of $40 a day. And when I asked, have they done any projections or modelling on the expected mortgage defaults? The answer, obviously, is no, because she filibustered that question and did not adequately answer it. So, no, they haven't. Now, anybody watching what's going on in this country will know that it is not going to happen that the 1.64 million, and that was the last time we got an answer at the COVID uh, Select Committee on the number of people that are unemployed in this country and receiving job seeker. Who thinks they're all going to be employed by the end of September when Job Seeker ends? Who thinks that? I bet you no one thinks that all those people are going to be getting uh, jobs by that time. As much as we wish it was so, realistically, it's not going to happen. And the government needs to be planning for that. But are they? What are they going to do with, for all those people? So are they planning for the fact there's going to be a massive number of people that will have to default on their mortgage payments, that will have to default on their rent? So where do they intend all these people to live? For a start, we are going to be escalating our homelessness. For a start, and when I asked, okay, what advice are you going to be providing to Australians in terms of which bills they don't pay? Because you cannot meet all your bills when you are living in poverty on forty dollars a day. Which bills? Energy, food. Food is usually the first to go because it's discretionary. So we're going to drop people back into poverty on $40 a day. And what impact is that going to have on our economy and our recovery? That it will have a very significant impact on a devastating impact on our recovery. And it'll also impact on the states. Because the states will also be losing out on those people income who are spending and injecting money into the state economies. It will also be the states that are expected to supply the community services, the emergency relief, the homelessness shelters when people start having to default on their payments. It isn't good enough. You need to keep the rate. question is the motion moved by Senator Seward be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to take note of the government's woeful response to my questions about the total lack of concern for, for the welfare of animals in the live export trade and the failure to establish an independent office of animal welfare. The live export industry has been plagued by scandals for decades, and people right across Australia have had enough. They wanted to stop. The scathing 2018 Moss Review into regulation of the live export industry exposed that the Department of Agriculture lacks the skills, resources, technology, culture and will be, that will be effective in regulating the industry. The department cannot possibly promote the live export industry and its profitability and at the same time protect animals. We know that as long as the Department of Agriculture is allowed to regulate the live export industry, animals will continue to suffer, they will continue to die on these ships of misery. It should not be left up to whistleblowers and grassroots animal advocates to uncover the industry's crimes and hold exporters to account. The only way to begin to fix our broken animal protection system is to establish a truly independent authority with responsibility for animal welfare. 
Since they were elected in 2013, the Liberal National Government has done nothing to improve animal welfare. Worse, instead of holding abusive industries to account, they grant exemptions for animal cruelty. It is pathetic for this government to claim to be shocked and appalled whenever the routine abuse of animals is exposed, to cry your crocodile tears and then return to business as usual when you think the scandal has passed. By the time this retwa ship, carrying tens of thousands of sheep, reaches its destination, thousands of sheep would have suffered inevitable heat stress. Do your job for once, ban live exports, and establish an independent office of animal welfare. The question is the motion moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Uh, I'll call the clerk for petitions. A petition has been lodged as noted on the dynamic red. The terms of the petition will be incorporated in Hansard. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Patrick. Uh, uh, nice Mr. President, Jacket. I seek leave to make a short statement in relation to the Collins class submarine sustainment uh, petition that's, that was lodged. Is, it, leave is not granted, Senator Patrick, but it is nice to see you attired somewhat differently. Um, can I move to any notices of motion to be given for another day? There being none, I shall proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? And I'll commence with the clerk. A postponement notification has been received in relation to general business notice of motion 680 for today to the 18th of June. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I will move on to the discovery of formal business and commence with government business motion number one, Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that Government Business Notice of Motion No. 1 be taken as formal. Is there any objection? There being none, Senator Dunningham. I move that the following bill be introduced a bill for an act to amend the Competition and Consumer Act 2010 and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Dunningham. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formality and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Competition and Consumer Act 2010 and for related purposes. Sorry. Senator Dunham. I table the explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to 4 August 2020. I'll now move to Government Business Matter No. 2, Senator Dunningham. I ask that Government Business Notice of Motion No. 2 relating to the consideration of legislation be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunningham. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. With the consent of the Senator, I will move to try and deal with non-controversial matters first. And I'll come to Senator Waters, Matter No. 524. Thanks very much, President. Uh, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion No. 524, proposing the introduction of a bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I move that the following bill be introduced a bill for an act to amend the Commonwealth Electoral Act of 1918 and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thanks, President. I present the bill and I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is the bill be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Commonwealth Electoral Act 1918 and for related purposes. Senator Waters. I move that this bill now be, now be read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Waters. I table an explanatory, explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard and to table my, continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Waters. Could I go to matter number 679 in the name of Senator Brown? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 679 relating to Sister Mary uh, Lay be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr President. The Australian Government, through AMSA, enforces the rights of seafarers to decent living and working conditions under the Maritime Labor Convention. That includes the right to, uh, of seafarers to choose not to extend their contracts and to seek repatriation 
There are significant challenges to crew changes in the COVID-19 environment resulting from border closures, the lack of aviation services and quarantine arrangements. And on the 9th of April, the National Cabinet agreed that the Australian Government and all states and territories um, would implement a consistent and immediate exemption for all non-cruise maritime crew for the safe movement of crew into Australia and across borders. The exemption allows for an international crew change with appropriate health protocols being met. Shore leave is permitted once the 14-day quarantine period is uh, on the vessel has elapsed and no crew member has demonstrated signs of illness or is suspected of having COVID-19. Some states and territories have additional requirements. The Australian Government is working with states and territories regarding their individual jurisdiction uh, requirements with the desired outcome of more specific advice on how crew changes can occur effectively in Australia. The question is that motion number 679 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could I come to 683 in the name of Senator McCarthy? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice for motion number 683 relating to racism be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? They're being done. Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Australia is the greatest multicultural society in the world. The government calls out racism when it occurs and has zero tolerance for the very small minority that seek to divide our nation. The government has an ongoing communication strategy to send a clear message that racism is not acceptable and that no one has to put up with it. The question is that motion number 683 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. 684, Senator Urquhart. That might be yourself. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 684, standing the names of Senators Gallagher, uh, Gallagher and no, Gallup Chair, sorry, and Senator Mario Smith relating to living with a disability be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek again leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr President. NDIS transport supports are not intended to replace state and territory responsibilities for ensuring accessible public and community transport. States and territories are responsible for ensuring that public transport options are accessible to people with, uh, with disability and are compliant with relevant non-discrimination legislation. Then the NDIS funds transport supports for a participant where it is reasonable and necessary, represents value for money, and the supports are related to the impact of their impairment or impairments on their functional capacity. The question is that motion number 684 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Seward, could I come to 685? Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 685 stand, uh, relating to discharging the social services legislation amendment ending the poverty trap bill 2018 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Seward, number 686, also in your name. Thank you. Uh, Mr President, I ask that General Business no Notice of Motion number 686, standing in my name and the name of Senator Steele John, relating to disability uh, support pension and care payments, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Seward. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Senator Dunham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Senator, leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr President. The government is providing disability support pension and carer payment recipients with two $750 economic support payments to provide additional support in the context of the coronavirus outbreak. Question is motion number 686 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Can I now jump back, Senator Faruqi, to 678 in your name? Thank you, Mr President. I ask the general business notice of motion number 6. 7, 8, relating to employment rates be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Faruqi. Mr President, I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr President. The Coalition Government is working hard to keep unemployment as low as possible. Our job creation record is strong. Prior to COVID-19, we had created 1.5 million jobs since coming to office in 2013. And we will work to get Australians back to work as our economy opens up and the coronavirus restrictions are lifted in the coming months. The government is focused on getting Australians into jobs, and the best way to reduce unemployment is by supporting small and family businesses to hire Australian workers. We do not believe in setting specific targets for the number of people who should be out of work. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, 
Mr President, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Labor supports uh, the, the intent of the motion, but we won't be supporting it uh, today. Um, we believe the concept of full employment is complex. It involves the interaction of many factors, including the structure of the job market and industries, participation, casualisation, frictional unemployment as some people choose to move between jobs and how unemployment rates can interact with inflation. We think that choosing a hard unemployment target via a Senate motion is an arbitrary endeavour. The question is the motion moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 678 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawood teller for the ayes, Senator Urquhart teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 9, noes 30. The matter is resolved in the negative. I ask senators to remain in the chamber. We will now move Senator Faruqi to your matter number 681. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I ask the general business notice of motion number 681 relating to greyhound racing be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Faruqi. Mr. President, I move the motion. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 681 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawitt tell of the ayes. Senator Urquhart tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 8, noes 30. The matter is resolved in the negative. Could I come to matter number 687, the name of Senators Seawitt and Wish Wilson? Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 687, standing in my name and the name of Senator Wish Wilson, relating to the Ningaloo Reef, Shark Bay and Exmouth Gulf, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seaworth. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The proposed national acreage release across the country provides an opportunity for Australia to ensure energy security, bring down prices and support Australian jobs. The exploration and production of oil and gas in waters adjacent to Exmouth and the Ningaloo Reef has been undertaken safely and responsibly for decades. Indeed, the pristine environment of the area is testament to the successful and rigorous regulation of the industry and its ability to coexist with areas of high environmental values. The question is that motion number 687 be oh, Senator Gallagher. I was daydreaming. I was daydreaming. Sorry. I'm in the moment. Um, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you. Labor won't be supporting this motion. Uh, we support the oil and gas industry and acknowledge that these areas would be subject to extensive environmental approvals and community consultation. 
question is that motion number 687 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Shut the doors. Oh, sorry, stop the bells. The question is that motion number 687 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator C. What tell of the ayes? Senator Urquhart, tell her for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 8, noes 29. The matter is resolved in a negative. Can we come to matter number 682, Senator McMahon and others? I'll give you a moment to resume your seat. Yep. Senator McMahon. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion number 682 relating to the Northern Territory border be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator McMahon. I move the motion. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. As government senators know, this is a matter for states and territories. We respect their positions and we must continue to follow the medical advice at all times. The government claims to want national unity on COVID-19. But cheap stunts like this from the government senators suggest otherwise. The question is the motion number 682 be agreed to. Order. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Can we move to number 688 in the name of Senator Waters? Thanks, Mr. President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 688, relating to disbanding the COVID Coordination Commission, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Waters. Thanks, President. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 688 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator C. what tell of the ayes, Senator Urquhart tell of the noes. The result of the division is eyes 80, eyes 8, noes 30. The matter is resolved in the negative. Can we move to motion number 689 in the name of Senator Waters also, please? Senator Waters. Thank you very much, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 689 relating to extending COVID economic support payments be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal, there being none? Senator Waters. Thank you. I move the motion. question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Can we move to number 690, Senator Hanson Young? Mr. President, can I ask that general business notice of motion number 690 relating to the arts and the entertainment industry? be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Hanson Young. Mr President, I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr President. And, um, the Prime Minister and the Minister for the Arts have confirmed that the uh, government is looking at the issues impacting the arts, screen and entertainment sectors. In addition, a substantial number of organisations with, uh, within the arts community are benefiting from the JobKeeper program. For example, the government understands that the Queensland Ballet, the Melbourne Theatre Company, the Sydney Symphony Orchestra and Opera Australia are all benefiting from the JobKeeper program. Government is also advised that the total support received for the initial JobKeeper fortnights in April by the Creative and Performing Arts under the Cash Flow Bo uh, Boost and JobKeeper initiatives is totalling $99.6 million. The question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Ayes have it. Can we come to matter number 691, Senator McKim? Thank you, President. Before asking that the motion be taken as formal, taken as formal I wish to inform the Chamber that Senators Griff and Keneally will also sponsor the motion. I ask that general business notice of motion number 691 relating to Refugee Week be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator McKim. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I'd like to request that this question be divided into parts A, B and C part 1, and then separately parts C, part 2 of that, and part D. Uh, in, on that basis of that request, I will put that accordingly. So the question is that parts A, B and clause Roman 1 of C be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question is now that Roman 2 of clause C and D be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. 
The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Stop the bells. The question is that clauses C, Roman 2 and D of motion number 691 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I point Senator Urquhart, tell off the ayes. Senator Dean Smith, tell off the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 27, noes 27. The matter is therefore negative. I understand Senator Gallagher is going to seek leave regarding a matter that was postponed. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. Um, earlier, a postponement notification was circulated to my notice of motion number 6880. I would like to seek leave to now move that motion uh, number 680 today, and I thank um, other senators and apologise for the inconvenience. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Gallagher. Oh, can I have a ditch? I move the motion. I move uh, motion. You're seeking that it be taken as formal? Yes. Thank you. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator I'm, Gallagher? I move the motion. Question is motion number 680. <laughs> Senator Dunningham. I leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you, Mr President. It's a long-standing practice not to disclose information about the operations and business of the Cabinet and its committees, including when a matter went to Cabinet, who attended and what form of submission was provided as to do so could potentially uh, reveal the deliberations of the Cabinet, which are indeed confidential. question is that motion number 680— oh, Senator Roberts. Short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. We support this, Mr President. The people of Queensland and of Australia deserve to be treated with respect and to have confidence that the government's serious and far-reaching decisions taking us through the COVID scare are based on credible and robust data. The government's huge economic response is based on the Doherty Institute report. It seems that is in turn based on the flawed assumptions in Professor Ferguson's Imperial College London, and I am deeply concerned as, as to the validity of the data and concerned about decisions made on that basis. Professor Ferguson's modelling predictions are known to be wildly exaggerated and fanciful. His work has had devastating impacts on national economies. Yet his assumptions are cited as the basis for the Doherty report. I refer to the model description where baseline values and more were obtained from the Imperial College in London. The government should release Treasury and Health Department modelling and scenario work as the basis for blowing $320 billion. Question Senator Patrick. Leave is granted for one minute. Senator Patrick can speak uh, from his seat, uh, back seat. Thank you, Mr President. I, um, uh, I'm very concerned that we see uh, things like Treasury modelling, which is used to inform uh, the Treasurer, uh, having a claim made over it of Cabinet in confidence. It seems the government is spraying Cabinet sprinkle dust right across uh, a whole range of decision-making, which basically uh, denies the Australian public the ability to scrutinise, the, the ability to participate in our democracy. It's really important that we have openness and transparency in, relating, in relation to these matters. And I remind uh, the government that the, uh, the Prime Minister is at liberty to waive any uh, genuine privilege uh, in relation to Cabinet documents uh, such that the Australian uh, population can see the basis upon which decisions were made by the government. The question is that motion number 680 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. Question is that motion number 680 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart teller for the ayes. Senator Dean Smith teller for the nose. The result of the division is ayes 29, noes 26. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senators, that concludes the discovery of formal business. I'll give senators a moment to leave the chamber before we move on. Do I have to stand to do this? No. No. <laughs> Thank you. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 26 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Ciccone. Dear Mr. President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The Morrison government's continual failure to deliver, leaving Australians to suffer the consequences. Uh, is the proposal supported? I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator Pratt. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, we have a very broad but a very apt MPI on the table today. It does indeed give us an opportunity to highlight this government's, the Morrison government's, continual failure to deliver that is indeed leaving Australians to suffer the consequences. And this is happening in every corner of our nation. Whether you're a tradie in the outer suburbs that's lost their job, whether you're a childcare worker that lost their job during the so-called free childcare period because your childcare centre that you're at couldn't afford to stay open, uh, whether you are a casual worker who didn't qualify for JobKeeper and uh, is now unemployed, whether you're a disability support pensioner who didn't get any extra payment uh, but is having an increasingly uh, a, a higher cost of living uh, because of things like needing to catch taxis instead of being able uh, to take public transport. The government benches, we've heard this day after day in question time answers, they're very, very happy to deliver the Prime Minister, Scotty from Marketing's advertising campaign messages, but they refuse to acknowledge uh, the Senator Prime Pratt, Minister. Senator Pratt, a point of order has been called. Madam, 
Deputy President, on a point of order, it is disorderly to refer to members of the other chamber, or any chamber for that matter, in any way other than their appropriate title. So I wonder if you could remind Senator Pratt to use appropriate titles when referring to members of parliament. Could I remind all senators to please use appropriate titles um, for our colleagues? Our Prime Minister, uh, Scott Morrison, is very focused on his advertising, but not on the execution and delivery, as the answers given in question time from uh, all of those opposite refuse to acknowledge any of their mistakes or bungles or mis-executions. We saw that just this afternoon uh, from uh, Senator Colbeck, where he was lauding uh, the seniors' emergency food delivery uh, as an example of where they were making the best laid plans in case they were needed. In case they were needed. Well, they were needed. I've spoken to many a pensioner who was uh, grateful for uh, home delivery from Coles or Woolies, or indeed who lined up outside the many food banks in our nation. Uh, and one of the reasons they were lining up, well, because they couldn't buy toilet paper. Because when they went down to the shopping centre, there was none there. So don't try and tell me that pensioners didn't need uh, that extra support during that time. You just didn't get around to rolling it out. Let's have a look at some of the other examples. JobKeeper, a massive underspend. Billions of dollars that were supposed to keep people connected to their jobs hasn't been spent. And guess what? We've got a rising and record level of unemployment. My office has been inundated with calls from people who've had trouble getting through to Centrelink to get the support that they need. Uh, all of this, you know, this is off the back of an overstretched system that was forced to deliver this government's ridiculous and unfair robo debt. When this government, uh, when, when the system was overloaded, when Centrelink collapsed because of the number of calls and applications, they didn't acknowledge it was their fault. They just said they'd been cyber attacked. Again, marketing and spin and nothing to see here, but the devil is always in the execution and this government is failing on every turn. Robo debt. We've seen since 2017 uh, example after example of how unfair, unjust and claims that it was illegal. But instead of listening to that, the government had to be taken to court to prove that it was illegal. And yet, what do we get from those opposite? In, question, uh, in taking note this week, I did hear indeed Senator Stoker justify the use of robo-debt, despite the fact that the Prime Minister had just apologised for its use. And I think Senator Stoker said something along the lines, and of course she'll correct me and pull me to order later if I'm wrong. She said, of course the government's got the right to retrieve debts that are owed. That's our responsibility to the taxpayer. And of course that is the case. But of course the government could not prove that these debts were in fact owed at all, hence the illegality of the whole program. Because you're not supposed to send a debt collector out after someone, which is what this government did. You sent debt collectors out to chase people for their Centrelink debts. You're not supposed to send a debt collector uh, after someone unless you can prove that the debt is actually owed, which you couldn't. The home renovator scheme promising to keep tradies in jobs. Well, that's if you uh, are able to qualify it. I don't know anyone planning to spend $150,000 on renovating their house and can also meet the income limits. But if it does get things started, well, what's going to happen? This scheme uh, cuts off uh, later this year. This government talks about uh, you've got to have your contract signed and start uh, work, I think, by December. But everything that this government is doing on snapback, it absolutely uh, terrifies me in terms of any good work that this government is doing with any of the stimulus that it's injecting into the economy, any of that good work being completely undone 
because of the government's snap back agenda. Snapping back before the economy is ready. If you, uh, your execution of these issues is absolutely uh, dreadful. I call on the government uh, to really think about what it's doing. We need a properly executed plan for our nation in these times of need. And yet, day after day after day, all that is revealed is the terrible, terrible mess that you are making. It is time for this government to fess up from, uh, about its mistakes instead of just relying time and time and time again on your marketing pitches. Marketing pitches that have absolutely nothing to do with the truth that's going on for ordinary Australians who are suffering the consequences. Senator Betts. Madam Acting Deputy President, while there are rorts, scams, secret bugging, secret recordings, funny money, cash deals in Aldi bags going on within the Australian Labor Party, they come in here pretending to the Australian people that somehow the Morrison government is not delivering. Here I have a document, 20 pages, with 20 achievements on each page. And if you know your numbers, that might be about 400 achievements that we can point to. But having been in opposition now for some seven years, you would have thought the Australian Labor Party would be using an opportunity such as this to tell the Australian people about their positive forward agenda. No. All we heard was seven minutes worth of criticism, of unrelenting negativity. Unrelenting negativity. No alternate plan for the Australian people. No plan for jobs. No reason for the Australian Labor Party to put jobs first. We in the coalition know the jobs are vital. Vital for people's mental health, physical health, self-esteem, social interaction. Vitally important. And that is why the Prime Minister and the government has said time and time again jobs are front and centre of our policy development and our policy delivery. But what do the Labor Party do? Being confronted with a huge scandal in Victoria, looks as though it's leaked over from the border in New South Wales, those two Labor parties, possibly they should have had border protection between those two states, Madam Acting Deputy President. But those two states, absolutely wrecked with scandal, what do they come to do? They come into this place making assertions, false assertions, to try to distract attention from the dilemma that they face. And so we had the spectre of the would-be Prime Minister of this country addressing uh, CEDA, the Committee for the Economic Development of Australia. And I think his big picture vision was that we might have national driver's licences. Really big picture stuff. Yeah, visionary, visionary. I'm sure people like Bob Hawke and John Curtin would be thinking, if only we could have come up with such a dynamic policy formulation for the future of our nation. But of course, why is the Australian Labor Party so bereft of any policies? Because it is so self-consumed in the internal warfare, branch stacking, funny money, Aldi bags, you name it. And so even when the Morrison government is delivering from a space agency right through to child protection, right across the board, we have the hapless opposition twixt and between deciding whether or not they might actually support mandatory sentencing for those that abuse the most pre precious thing within our community, namely our children. Our mandatory sentencing for border protection, they agreed with that, but not for people that abuse our children, the next generation. Where was the policy thought? Where was the policy formulation? Let alone where was the moral compass in determining that mandatory sentencing should not be 
part and parcel of the criminal law, especially when you were confronted with the fact that 39 per cent of those convicted of child sex offences weren't sent to jail. It's hard to imagine a more horrific crime. And yet the Labor Party twixt and between, not knowing how or why they should be protecting our children. Because they're consumed by their internal warfare, their internal hatred, their factionalism, you name it, and so they take their eye off the ball. But if we want to talk about the litany of policy failures, can I remind those opposite that if you live in a glass house, it's very foolish to throw rocks. And that, of course, is what the Australian Labor Party has done with bringing this forward. Because if the Labor Party want to throw rocks of policy failures, I can hear one pane of glass smashing as I mention live cattle exports. Another pane of glass smashing as I mention pink bats. Another pane of glass being smashed when I mention the cash splash to the dead. And so the list goes on. And who could forget fuel, uh, fuel watch, grocery choice, the list of policy failures, and then, of course, on top of it all, was the legacy of deficit and debt, which is a mortgage and an imposition on the next generation of Australians. Completely immoral, completely and utterly immoral in circumstances where you put such a millstone around the neck of the next generation. And so, Madam Acting Deputy President, it is with a, I suppose, I'm somewhat gobsmacked that the cheek of the Australian Labor Party to come in here to assert that somehow Mr Morrison has failed to deliver in circumstances where we have faced a pandemic, a one in a century problem. And I think most people recognise that Prime Minister Morrison has handled that exceptionally well, with his bringing together of a national cabinet, of dealing with the border closures, protecting Australia before the World Health Organisation was even willing to admit that we had a pandemic on our hands and that closing our international borders might be a good idea. Leading from the, from the front, delivering for the Australian people, and all you've got to do is do a comparison of the death rates. And the last time I looked, Madam Acting Deputy President, we had, I think, four deaths per million of population, whereas our cousins in the United Kingdom were confronted with 482 per million. One hundred times the mortality and fatality rate in the UK. And yet the Australian Labor Party comes in here and talks about policy failure. Excuse me? With a record like that, the world is looking to Australia as I speak, asking how is it that you have achieved such a, such a good result. And it's through hard policy discussion, delivery and making it happen. And so, Madam Acting Deputy President, we have this hapless senator from New South Wales interjecting, suggesting we were listening to Victoria Labor. Can I tell you, that would be the last thing anybody in Australia would want to do today. Listen to what's coming out of the Victorian Labor Party, other than if you were interested in 60 Minutes and all the disclosures there. But I would have thought, using the Victorian Labor Party as the gleaming star example of Labor Party success, is indicative how bereft the Federal Labor Party is. They actually look to the Victorian Labor Party as some sort of guiding light. How desperate would you have to be? to look to Mr Andrews and his state government with that. How many ministers have now resigned? I think it was three or four. And uh, how many others are uh, under a cloud? So can I say to those opposite, if you want to be treated seriously by the Australian people, 
come forward with a positive policy agenda. It is no use just throwing rocks and hoping that the Australian people will be distracted from your own failure in relation to policy. Just look at defence. Six years and not a single major project was started, thought about, let alone delivering jobs for our fellow Australians. So be it in defence, be it in welfare, be it in border protection, be it in trying to balance the budget. The list goes on and on and on of positive policy achievements for the betterment of the welfare of the people of Australia, which stands in such stark contradistinction to what the Australian Labor Party have to offer. Scandal, scams, bugging each other, reporting each other to the police, and all the time they do that, they fail to deliver a positive agenda for the Australian people. So more than happy, Madam Acting Deputy President, to support Mr Morrison and his Senator government. Roberts, thank you very much. Your time has expired. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to make, today to make a contribution to this MPI to raise the Morrison government's failure to adequately invest in the care economy. The government is failing to take the opportunity to make sure that as we come out of this crisis, we focus on a better normal, addressing our health, economic, climate and inequality crisis. An element that has been, uh, where the government has been missing is underinvesting in and which must be part of our recovery is the care economy. For too long, we have ignored the wellbeing and economic benefits from investing in social and community services. Investment in social infrastructure, such as community and social services, education, health, aged care and childcare, um, has a positive impact on the whole of society. Not only does this address inequality and wellbeing, but increases productivity and generates future revenue. A focus on preventative health and social care and is, an, is an investment in future well-being that also reduces the need for further public expenditure if we are addressing these issues. New research from the Open University sheds light on the economic and social benefits investing in, as they call it, care, the care industry. Researchers found that if Australia invested 1 per cent of its GDP in the care industry, this would result in raising the employment rate by 1.2 per cent. If we invested the same amount in the construction industry, it would only increase the employment rate by 0.2 per cent. Now, that's not to say that construction isn't important. Issues such as public transport, renewable energy and social housing must be invested in. But that is not enough for our recovery. Furthermore, Investment in the, in the care economy would help reduce the gender employment gap. Research showed that 79% of the research showed that 79% of new jobs created through investment in the care industry would be filled by women. There are clearly striking benefits to investing in education, health, so, and social services and community services. Benefits that you would think that any government investing and navigating our way out of this crisis and recession would be interested in capitalising on. It just, it just shows how critical the, the care economy is to our recovery. This research is very important and I urge the government to take it on board. The social fabric of our nation is important. In the midst of a recession, we need a new way of doing things. I urge the government to recognise the value of the care economy and start investing to deliver access to essential services for all Australians. Thank you, Senator Seward. Senator Ayres. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. I listened with some interest uh, to the answer that the Minister for Aged Care gave uh, during question time. I don't think there would be any other country in the Western world where the Minister for Aged Care would simultaneously be the Minister for Youth, but that's what the Morrison government's delivered uh, the people of Australia. Uh, and Minister Colbeck, Senator Colbeck's answers in question time are an enduring delight for everybody, I'm sure. But uh, the minister was asked about the performance of the government in relation to a promise that it made to deliver 36,000 
food packages to elderly Australians. Uh, and like many of the announcements that the Morrison government makes, they're breathlessly made with press releases, videos, uh, uh, government ministers standing in front of microphones, uh, but very little delivery. Uh, the delivery in this case, 36,000 promised, 38 delivered. Even my high school maths tells me that that's not uh, 10 per cent, uh, not 1 per cent, 0.01 per cent delivery. Uh, it is an emblem of the government's failure. It's an emblem of uh, the failure of the government's, the, the cancer that goes to the heart of this government's approach to policy delivery and delivering for all Australians. Today, in the other place, the Prime Minister was asked about the impact uh, on women giving birth, travelling, who have to travel to either Canberra or Goulburn uh, from Yass. His answer? Well, there might need to be some improvements to the road system. Out of touch, out of his depth, entirely devoted to spin, uh, no capacity for the policy substance. And there are so many examples. Well, the National Party doesn't have a minister, a minister representing the Minister for Agriculture in this place, but the commitments that they have made to Australian agriculture and the Australian farming industry, biosecurity levy, no delivery. Real-time payment platform for dairy farmers, breathlessly announced during the election campaign, uh, the minister crawled back from that proposition today. Another policy failure, another failure to deliver on behalf of this government. And that would have meant something for Australian dairy farmers. Government promised to deal with dollar milk and the floor price for dairy farmers. No delivery. Drought response. No delivery. Not all the money has gone out the door. The government appears incompetent at delivering money to Australian farmers. They can fill the advertising budgets of the agencies. They can send, uh, they can send people dri driving around all over the country, but no real delivery. The coronavirus response that I listened to Senator Abetz about. The Australian results so far, the public health response has delivered a very good outcome. If you look at the people who are admired by some of the characters over there, um, uh, the, the absolute disaster of policy failure on these issues in the United States, uh, in Brazil, in the United Kingdom, the failure of the government responses there, delivered, driven by the kind of politics that animates some people on the government's backbench. Uh, is a cautionary tale. But this Prime Minister took a very long time to get there, and it was only the response of the state premiers that dragged the Prime Minister to reaching the right policy conclusions. Meanwhile, in New South Wales, the failure of Border Force and this Prime Minister uh, and the Border Force Minister to stop the Ruby Princess has delivered misery to every four corners of the Australian continent. Uh, misery in every state, infections in every state, many, many deaths as a result of that policy failure. The coalition's economic response, uh, job seeker, no certainty about what's going to happen when there's a snapback of job seeker. Prior to the uh, announcement of the scheme, universally acknowledged by everybody except those on the other side. Uh, that Centrelink payments were too low for unemployed Australians, snapback will have dire consequences. JobKeeper, a policy demanded by Labor, mocked by people in here up until a few days before the government announced it. But there are serious policy failures there too. Millions of Australian casuals excluded. Universities excluded. Uh, overseas students left to starve Australia's reputation shattered overseas, food queues in all of our major cities of overseas students who can't pay their bills, can't get enough to eat. The entertainment and arts sector left to starve, left to fail uh, by a government that doesn't understand its responsibilities. And then there's this enormous error, 
a $60 billion error in forecasting and delivery of that policy. As the Leader of the Opposition said, you could see it from space. In fact, the Americans managed to put a man on the moon spending less than $60 billion in today's dollar terms. It is the biggest forecasting de policy delivery error in Australian history. I imagine it's probably the biggest error in the Southern Hemisphere. The one thing that the Minister for Finance can be confident of, the one achievement he can notch up there, is he can be certain that nobody will make an error that big. He is in the record books. Uh, he is in the record books for the biggest policy error in Australian political history. That is the end of the Morrison government's economic credibility. They needn't knock at the door of economic credibility ever again. Uh, it's the overconfidence and the smugness that leads to policy neglect, and that error has real consequences. Rating agencies made decisions about the position that they took in relation to the Australian economy. People made investment decisions. Many, many more people are unemployed because of that policy failure. The Home Builder Scheme. You couldn't design a scheme if you got the cleverest people in the country and you said to them, I want you to design a scheme that reaches almost nobody. And when it does reach them, it's going to fund them a little bit extra to do a project that they were already going to deliver, to devise a policy scheme that would provide no extra stimulus to the Australian economy, none, uh, but drive inequality up, emblematic of this government's approach. Pre-COVID, pre-coronavirus, the government had nothing to boast about. Downward pressure on wages, flatlining wages, downward pressure on retail spending, lowering business investment, decreased productivity, monetary policy on its knees, the Reserve Bank begging the government to actually do something, fiscal policy in all sorts of trouble, no plan. All sorts of other policy areas. The federal ICAC that the government promised they, they would deliver, no delivery. Energy policy, Senator Canavan's favourite thing, well, there's plenty of policies, there's been 17 of them, none delivered. They've managed to construct an environment in energy policy where prices go up, emissions go up, investment goes down and confidence is shattered. The uh, manufacturing industry is forced offshore because of your policy failure and incapacity to develop a plan. Senator Canavan's mad plan for a new expensive coal-fired power station would only serve to add to the policy chaos in energy policy on the other side and push prices up further, increase emissions further and drive more industry offshore. He knows it. He know, he's smart enough to know it, but he'll continue to press that case because it suits him. Apprentices—140,000 less apprentices. Robo debt. And finally, in terms of delivery, we have the government's position in re relation to Australia Post. Well, policy delivery there will mean that many less people in regional areas they will all be getting their mail later because of Scott Morrison's plan for Australia Post. The problem with these people is that they believe their own spin. Uh, they believe their own spin. They are condemned to repeat it. And the grave and serious issues that face Australia in terms of our future economy, Australia's place in a more dangerous world, dealing with climate change, making sure that we reconcile effectively with our first Australians, the future of our rivers, our country towns, they are not up to the task of charting a course for modern Australia in very you, challenging Senator times. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I, thought, I thought this um, MPI was going to be focused on, on, on the failure to deliver for Australians in the coronavirus. That's where, uh, uh, that's where Senator Ayres was focused on in most of his contribution. But you could tell, you could tell he ran out of steam there because by the end he, he, he didn't have much more to say. He started talking about energy policy and all these other things. The yep, sure that we have disagreements on. But it is a shame, uh, Madam Deputy President, that, that the Australian Labor Party can't, can't bring themselves uh, to uh, share a bit of the pride 
that I think most Australians feel uh, about how the country responded over the past few months. It's uh, been a challenging time uh, for our nation. It's been more challenging for some uh, than others. Uh, but one thing I think we can take heart uh, from as a nation uh, is that overall uh, we have responded in a united, committed, uh, determined way uh, to tackle this virus and to support each other through it. Uh, that cooperation, that determination has been led uh, by the Prime Minister, uh, Scott Morrison. Uh, he's led that, uh, that commitment. Uh, he's been supported by other governments around the country. And, and all I'm happy to say here he's been supported uh, by governments of the other side of politics and mine, uh, by the Labor Party, by Liberal national governments uh, across the country, have come together uh, to cooperate in support uh, uh, to do the right thing by our country. What I'm most proud of, though, what I'm most proud of, though, is how the Australian people have come together uh, to fight uh, uh, this virus. How the Australian people have again, overall, uh, complied with the onerous restrictions that have been placed on their livelihoods. That, in good humour uh, and with steely determination, uh, have have sought to respond and adjust to the change economic circumstances facing them. I, I'm astounded by the resilience of so many uh, small business people in this country who have had their livelihoods turned upside down but have dusted themselves off, got on with what they could do and made the best of what has been a pretty, pretty hard road for some. That's what I'm proud of. I'm proud of it. And it's just a shame that the opposition here can't bring themselves to express even just one iota of that pride, of that shared uh, achievement of this country, uh, because by any measure this nation uh, has responded as well, if not better, than almost any country in the world uh, to this threat. We have stayed largely united. We have complied uh, with and done what we needed to do uh, to protect the safety of others, and we are supporting each other uh, in uh, the fallout from what we've had to do and also the rebuilding effort that is to come. Uh, uh, that is something I think we should. Uh, take pride in. Now, that's of course not to say that every decision governments have made around the country has been precisely perfect. Uh, uh, but overall, overall, uh, uh, we have made sure uh, that we uh, we have responded in a way that has uh, uh, protected Australians' health, uh, that we have supported those that have needed assistance, and that we are now also focused on rebuilding and creating jobs. Uh, as we recover uh, from what's happened in the last few months. I think it's been particularly uh, responsive that uh, our government has made sure, the Liberal National Party government, has made sure that it's parked any ideological or, 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 or commitment, uh, commitments that we may have previously made and done what is right. Done what is right. I think the problem is here that the Australian Labor Party haven't quite caught up with the program. They still think that somehow the caricature of what they present as the Liberal National Party is true, that somehow we're mean, evil-spirited people uh, uh, who only want to deliver budget surpluses because we like to be mean and evil-spirited. Mean -spirited. No, we deliver those surpluses because they're important to protect future generations of Australians. But when other priorities come along, as they have here in the last few months, of course we adjust because the end objective is to deliver for Australians. And that is what we have done. That is what we have done. We also, though, must at some stage return to the uh, important point that we cannot keep spending forever, uh, that we have to be mindful of uh, the debt that is being racked up because all of the spending, all of the assistance we have provided in the last few months has been borrowed money. We have had to borrow uh, uh, a lot of it from overseas uh, uh, to, to support Australians. It is the right thing to do right now, but it has to be repaid. Uh, it is not our money down here. It is, is the Australian people's debt that will be repaid. Uh, from themselves and their children and grandchildren, and we will make sure and commit ourselves to the prudent application of funds to support Australians to get us through this crisis and rebuild our nation. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I support this submission. In recent letters to the Prime Minister in March, April, and May, we expressed concern over the government's use of flawed modelling data to justify locking us all away and causing untold damage to our economy, businesses and jobs. The responses to these letters did not address the real issues. Yet it was stated, quote from the government, the government is well aware of the heavy economic and social toll created by the restrictions. 
Well, today, now, we need to know where the plan is to rebuild our businesses and jobs. Or will the Prime Minister just cut the COVID lifeline and feed our, work and feed our workers and businesses to the sharks? We are already hearing about insolvency practices preparing to wind up many struggling Australian businesses, and as many as one in six could disappear soon. Back in the global financial crisis, the Labor government applied academic models which left us with high budget deficits and public debt. Yet they did not address the real problems, and soon we may have a national debt of well over $1 trillion and nothing to show for it. What due diligence on flawed infection modelling from Professor Ferguson in Britain was done. That locked us all up. If this government had learned early from nations like Taiwan and promptly adopted rigorous testing combined with strict isolation for people with the virus and isolation of the vulnerable, then the rest would have been returned to work far, far sooner with minimal economic disruption. Taiwan, for example, isolated the sick and vulnerable. The healthy continued working. They have a strong economy. Their health is 15 times better than Australia. The Prime Minister will really be tested in October when the support stops and we see businesses and our economy unravel. Sorry, Senator Green. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. At the start of this pandemic, as many Australians across the country watched daily press conferences. Each time, the number went up and up about the restrictions that would be put in place. I know that many Australians' um, stomachs just sank, and particularly our arts and entertainment workers. Who knew, with every new restriction that was announced and every new restriction that was increased, there would be some of the first jobs to go and there's, their jobs would be some of the last to come back. I know this because when those announcements were being made, I was sitting next to an arts worker, my wife. And as the ghost lights were switched on in theatres across the country, this government ghosted arts workers. In far north Queensland, we have a vibrant arts community. And this is backed up by a strong lineup of Indigenous performers from the Cape and the Torres Strait Islands and other regions across outback Queensland. Every year, several arts and dance festivals are held, including the Cairns International Arts Fest Festival, which has had to go online this year. It is incredibly disappointing, I know, for many of those performers and workers that the uh, income that they get from the um, events that were due to be held um, won't be coming in this year. But it is even more devastating that those workers were not included in the government's plans to support people through JobKeeper. Now, there might be some people in here that think that regional Queenslanders don't care about the arts, but I know that that's not true because they do talk to me everywhere I go in regional Queensland about the arts industry. And I know this because I was in, Queen, in regional Queensland in Stanthorpe, actually, when the government uh, axed the arts department. And I was in Stanthorpe because they were facing a water crisis. And I was um, pleased to find out, apart from the fact that they were talking about water security, one of the things that they were very concerned about was this government's record on the arts. Arts and entertainment workers are among millions excluded from the government's JobKeeper program. The structure of JobKeeper was designed in a way to exclude performers employed in the arts and entertainment sector, and it is having real life consequences. These workers, who often make ends meet from gig to gig, have been forced to deal with the complete shutdown of their industry on their own. And we know that in many parts of regional Queensland and other regional areas across the country, arts and entertainment workers are actually employed by local councils, and local council workers were also excluded from JobKeeper. 
But in another cruel blow, many arts and entertainment workers fund the jobs that they love so much by picking up casual hospitality jobs from time to time. Those jobs were also excluded from JobKeeper, unless that they had worked for their employer for more than 12 months. These heartless exclusions really cut deep, and that's because it hurts when you feel like you're not worth government support, even though you do a valuable job. Arts and entertainment workers do the jobs that they do because they love their work. Their creativity is tied up in their identity, and I know that it would be absolutely devastating for them to not be able to do that work right now. And they understand the reasons why and the restrictions that are in place, and they, are, they want to um, get back to work as soon as those restrictions are lifted. But throughout this period, they've been doing that on their own. Of course, the government won't even acknowledge that there is a problem, even though they've been whispering now for a little while about a specific rescue package for the arts sector. If the government is going to raise expectations for these, for these workers, then it is better to deliver genuine support for workers. There is an official parliamentary petition calling on the Morrison government to support arts and entertainment workers through the coronavirus crisis, and it has passed more than 30,000 signatures this week. This incredible support makes this one of the most successful parliamentary petitions in recent years, with three, years, three weeks yet to run. The response is yet more evidence that this is an industry in crisis crying out for help from this government, and it is an industry supported by our community. We have called for a com comprehensive industry support package, including support for workers themselves, many of whom have been shut out of the gov government's JobKeeper wage subsidy. At the start of June, the government gave those workers a glimmer of hope, as I said, by suggesting that there be a rescue package on the way. But now, two weeks later, there's still nothing, and these workers are desperately waiting for that assistance. Why did the government raise expectations just to let these people down once again? Well, the Palaszczuk Labor government has delivered $42.5 million for the arts industry, and that includes $22.5 million announced yesterday. That funding will go to focus on stabilising local art companies and seeing that jobs for arts, artists and arts workers are protected. We know that arts workers are resilient. The show must and will go on. As I said at the beginning of my speech, many ghost lights were lit um, in theatres all across the country during this time. And I thought I'd share some words from Ange Sullivan, who's the head of the Sydney Opera House Lighting. And he said that they have um, uh, ghost lights, uh, they have two main functions, if anyone doesn't know what they do. There's a practical reason, obviously, to make sure that if anyone goes into the theatre, they can see where they're going, they don't fall off the, the front of the stage. But there's, a really, there's another romantic idea about ghost lights, and it's that every theatre has at least one ghost. And when they come out at night, we don't want them bumping into scenery or disturbing props. It's a, it is a romantic notion, um, this uh, using ghost lights during this time, but it's also desperately, desperately sad because arts workers feel so alone at the moment. Ange went on to say, we decided that the entire house needed something to look forward to, a beacon, if you like, it's about saying, we haven't gone forever, we're coming back, and we're going to leave the lights on to show you that. Well, every arts worker will remember that this government ghosted them when it mattered. Every arts worker in this country will remember the amount of times that they asked for help and they were not listened to. Arts workers are really, really struggling, not only because they have lost their jobs, but because they can't do what they love to do right now. So I'm calling on the Morrison government to deliver that rescue package and to help these arts workers Senator in the Green, future. Your time has expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm 
know it has been a rough week for Labor members, especially ones from Victoria. But I'm not sure Senator Ciccone had finished drafting the MPI before submitting, given both its lack of specificity and its blatant deception. Because the Morrison government is proud of what it's delivered and continues to deliver for our nation. Throughout this unprecedented time, our focus is on fighting the virus, delivering the economic lifeline Australians need to get through the course of the virus, reopening our economy and our society with a clear road ahead, building confidence and momentum in our economy and growing our economy for the years ahead. This is a five-year plan that will shape our country for the next 30 years. That means we're getting Australians out from under the doona, we're delivering jobs, guaranteeing the essential services Australians rely on, getting children back into school, keeping Australians safe and taking care of our economy. We have the job maker plan to get Australia moving, focused on infrastructure and deregulation. This includes almost $72 billion in major infrastructure projects across the country being fast-tracked, slashing approval times and creating 66,000 jobs. And because the government recognises that in these unprecedented times, some Australians will need to depend on government assistance in the short term, we've already temporarily supercharged the social security safety net providing additional assistance to Australians affected by the economic impacts of the pandemic. Payments are rolling out for the $70 billion JobKeeper program, including a $1,500 per fortnight wage subsidy for 3.5 million Australians. We have a $150 million domestic violence support package to help family and domestic violence support services meet the growing demand as a result of the impacts of the coronavirus crisis. We're supporting senior Australians through two new initiatives to prevent loneliness and social isolation under a $6 million communications package. The government's also awarded $1 million in grants to 215 local community organisations to provide at-risk seniors with digital devices such as mobile phones and laptops. The Morrison government is continuing to take action to help Australians whose mental health and wellbeing is affected by the pandemic by providing an additional $48 million to the support and the mental health and wellbeing pandemic response plan. And the list goes on. And we were delivering prior to COVID and we will continue to deliver in the face of this crisis and beyond. We were already seeing increases in job creation, increases in female participation in the workforce, and we are looking to the future, ready to build on that. The Morrison government is delivering. We're focused on taking care of people now and setting our nation up for success in the coming decades. We all know the impacts of the coronavirus across the economy and that they've been severe. Businesses and households are facing increased uncertainty and economic activity has slowed significantly. But it is this government's economic support package that's provided timely support to affected workers, businesses and the broader community and has kept Australians in work and businesses in businesses. We've put a floor under the economy and will lay the foundation for a strong economic recovery. The government's focusing on reopening and rebuilding. We need to get businesses back open, enable Australians to go back to work and ensure consumers and businesses have the confidence to return to normal activities. But in respect to Senator Ciccone and the point that he may have been trying to make, there are some things we are very proud that we've failed to deliver and quite frankly the Australian electorate are pretty relieved that we have. We have failed to deliver a retiree tax. We failed to deliver limitations to negative gearing that would see increases in the rental prices and decimate the property investment market. We failed to deliver a pink bats program that literally led to tragic deaths. We failed to deliver unwanted and overpriced school halls. We failed to deliver checks to dead people. We failed to deliver cash in Audi bags. We failed to deliver cash in folders along with fake ALP membership forms. We failed to deliver a protection racket for pedophiles rather than protect Australian children. And we definitely showed a failure to sell out Australia to the highest bidder. Unlike those opposite, we are not failing the Australian people. We are delivering the economic health and security they need now and into the future. Senator.
Hughes, your time has expired. Senator Rice. That the Morrison government <coughs> has failed to deliver, it sure has. It has failed to deliver a society where First Nations peoples are safe and equal, a society free of racism and discrimination. The Morrison government has failed to deliver justice to our First Australians. That's why tens of thousands of people have been protesting in the streets. Yet what does the Prime Minister focus on when asked about police brutality and black deaths in custody? He praises statues of colonisers, he denies slavery and he condemns protesters. He is definitely silent on the racist policies and institutions that are costing lives and tearing families apart. If only he cared as much about black lives as he does about protecting statues. Black lives are at risk every day in Australia, and even with all the media and public attention on police violence, it hasn't stopped police officers from attacking innocent people. On Monday, the South Australian police assaulted and wrongfully arrest, arrested Noel Henry. This violence isn't unusual, but this time it was filmed. And South Australian police have now started an internal investigation. Police officers investigating other police officers, we know how that will end. And just today we have learnt that a senior counter-terrorism police officer in New South Wales delivered a gross and mocking acknowledgement of country at a police Christmas party last year. This speech was reworded to acknowledge the Tactical Operations Unit nation instead of traditional owners. It was stomach-churning and disgusting and shows the unbridled disrespect and contempt that police have for First Nations peoples. First Nations peoples in Australia are the most incarcerated group per capita anywhere in the world. We have seen 437 black deaths in custody and not one conviction. Every day news stories emerge of how differently Indigenous people in this country are treated to everyone else. And this is all happening on their land, on stolen land. It is this original and ongoing sin that has taken root in our unequal power structures, our racist institutions and in our laws. Yet the Morrison government is nowhere. We must stop police brutality and systemic racism against First Nations peoples and other people of colour. We must make up for our original sin, dismantle systems of oppression and finally see justice for First Nations peoples. And all of us must examine our own settler colonial history, listen to and centre black voices and actively work to decolonise. Senator Van. Acting Deputy Chair, I rise to speak on this matter of public importance, and I'd like to start by thanking my very good friend, fellow Collingwood supporter and Senator for Victoria, Senator Ciccone, for this Dorothy Dixer. It is wonderful to have the opportunity to highlight the role of the Mor Morrison government has had in delivering jobs, guaranteeing essential services, keeping Australians safe, and taking care of our country. But let's be frank. For those opposite, the past week must have felt like the red wedding episode of the Game of Thrones. I believe Senator, Senator Ciccone is probably the only Victorian parliamentarian not checking for reds under the bed at the moment. But for many Victorians, the past year has been a year like no other. Sorry, Kimberly. Uh, from the drought to bushfires and now the COVID pandemic, the Morrison government has been there every step of the way. It is coming up to a year since I took my seat in this place, so let's go to the highlight reel and discuss what the Gov Morrison government has actually delivered. Well, in my first week in this place, we delivered $158 billion in tax cuts. Not a bad start to the year. In response to the, the drought, the Australian government had committed over $8 billion across the country to support the drought response recovery and preparedness actions. Then, uh, the, uh, the bushfires came along, and earlier this week I spoke about the significant support that the Morrison government had made to uh, bushfires. I was also lucky enough to spend some time with Blaze Aid down in Gippsland, where I saw firsthand the damage that the fires had done, and it was clear to me that the effort needed to recover from this was going to be enormous and long-lasting. So, to that end, the Morrison government delivered on that as well. 
through the National Bushfire Recovery Agency. We've committed $2 billion, that's $2 billion, Regional Bushfire Recovery and Development Program. And of that, $1.3 billion has been spent so far. That has looked after 281,000 Australians who have received direct financial support through disaster recovery and allowance payments. Additionally, 23,000 businesses have received direct financial assistance. Then, while working on the bushfire recovery, the coronavirus pandemic hit, and the Morrison government initiated one of the most successful responses in the world, saving tens of thousands of lives and millions of livelihoods. The Commonwealth, in support of the coronavirus pandemic, has already committed $260 billion towards mitigating the economic impacts of the coronavirus. In that, there's $70 billion of payments are rolling out for the JobKeeper program, including $1,500 per fortnight wage subsidy, keeping 3.5 million Australians in their jobs. For those that lost their jobs or didn't have one, we've established a, a, a new time-limited coronavirus supplement to be paid at the rate of $550 per fortnight on top of the existing $550 per fortnight. So to say that, that there has been a failure in letting people fall through the cracks is just not true. There's also been payments of up to $100,000 to eligible small and medium-sized businesses and not-for-profits. Additionally, $200 million will go towards more than 300 charities to support the community. For mental health, $48 million to support uh, the pandemic response plan was presented to National Cabinet last week. In order to get the country moving out of the pandemic crisis, we have committed a further $1.5 billion to immediately start work on small priority projects defined by the states and territories. And of that, $1 billion is going to projects that are now shovel ready and $500 million reserved specifically to target road safety works. And I should remind the, the Senate that this builds on around $7.8 billion worth of projects we brought forward since last year. And I, I'd just like to show uh, you know, that the, com the combined um, contribution of the states and territories only totals $3.6 billion. So the federal government, the Morrison government, has delivered eight times what the states have done. And in my home state of Victoria, they've only delivered a paltry $5.2 billion in initiatives. So, colleagues, I think it's safe to say the Morrison government has not failed in any way, shape or form, but has delivered incredibly Senator well Bann, for the country. Your time has expired. Senator Waters. Uh, thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on the matter of public importance that the uh, Morrison government has uh, failed to deliver. Well, I'll tell you who it hasn't failed to deliver for. Vested interests and its big business donors. They're doing quite nicely, thank you very much, out of this government. And likewise, this political party is doing quite nicely out of the donations that come from that large sector. Uh, we've had millions of dollars in donations made to the Liberal National Party since they were in government, uh, from the big mining companies, from the gambling industry, uh, from property developers, from all sorts of people that want favours and want policy written that favours their bottom line. And uh, hey, presto, we get tax cuts for those large companies and tax cuts for the wealthy. So it sounds like they're delivering quite nicely for their donor mates. In terms of fossil fuels, well, we know that they give tens of millions of dollars in donations, and uh, this government continues to deliver fossil fuel subsidies, accelerated depreciation that nobody else gets, discounted diesel fuel that nobody else gets, and now they're getting a fast tracking of environmental laws. And you know what else they're getting? They're getting a, a commission stacked with representatives from the gas industry that don't have to disclose their conflicts of interest to the public, or in some cases don't have to disclose them at all, and a commission that's recommending, who would have guessed it, yet more investment in gas infrastructure. This government is delivering quite nicely for the big polluters, who happen to be big donors to its political party, and it is absolutely uh, negligent in dealing with the climate crisis. The government could be investing in job-rich renewable energy. It could be funding schools, 
and hospitals, but instead it's dishing out tax cuts to the wealthy and to big business, and it's paving the way for yet more dirty gas to wreck our land, to wreck our water and to wreck our climate. The time for this discussion has now expired and we'll now move to consideration of documents. The documents are listed on page five of today's order of business. Oh, Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. I wish to um, speak to the ANAO report on the Regional Investment Corporation. The Regional Investment Corporation, or RIC, was established in 2018 with significant financing, supposedly to streamline administration of $4 billion in concessional loans across two schemes for farm businesses and national water infrastructure. Now, as we can see in this report from the ANAO, there has been $387 million across 367 farm loans, which has been approved within 18 months of operation. The ANAO notes that the RIC board appointments largely reflect the required skill sets and also found that there were, were on average 113 business days between submission and decision on loans. In relation to the board, the ANAO sh report shows that between June 2018 and March 2020 there had been no skills coverage on the board in relation to financial accounting and auditing. This is a pretty massive oversight for an investment corporation making large loans. But, and more concerningly, the ANAO report notes that the then chair declared a conflict of interest on the 10th of September 2019, but continued to chair the meeting, including the RIC strategic framework and audit and budget updates. And the resignation of the chair to the minister didn't follow until the 19th of September 2019 despite requirements under the Public Governance, Performance and Accountability Act that requires notification as soon as possible and taking steps to manage conflicts of interest. This is pretty extraordinary. But returning to the timing for the loans, it's something that I'm quite concerned about. And in particular, I want to highlight the case of loans to plantations which were intended to be delivered by the RIC. As part of the election commitments, the Liberals committed to support the delivery of a 1 billion new plantation trees through a new concessional loan product under the Regional Investment Corporation. There was a very short consultation that took place on that approach between November to December 2019. But despite the promises, the process, the spin, the marketing, we've yet to see the Liberals deliver on this. In fact, media reporting today confirms that cheap loans aimed at boosting the nation's forestry plantations have yet to be rolled out, more than a year after they were first promised. We need to end native forest logging with its terrible impacts on our wildlife, water and climate. Instead, we should be supporting environmentally sustainable forestry plantations, including through these concessional loans where appropriate, to help complete the shift of a wood products industry that is 100 per cent based on plantations, shifting from the current 88 per cent. But the Liberals are all marketing spin and no substance when it comes to doing the right thing. I mean, we've known for decades the um, incredible damage that native forest logging does. We know how it's bad for the ecosystems that are torn apart. It's bad for threatened species whose habitats are destroyed. It's terrible for our communities too. And we lose the benefits of the forest as a carbon store, which is so critical as we face a climate emergency. And we lose the economic benefits that come from regional tourism as people travel to explore these precious places. But most of all, we lose the forests themselves, that incredibly important connection to nature, the incredible beauty and diversity of these forests as they are logged, and taking hundreds of years, if ever, to return to something similar to their former state. So much is at stake, and it's got enormous implications. And that's why the recent federal court decision on logging native forests in Victoria was so important. It found that native forest logging in 66 forest areas across Australia was illegal, and it put native forest logging on notice. It's got implications right across Australia. So we know that it's time for the Commonwealth to get out of native forest logging. It was time decades ago. So we need action from the government on support for sustainable plantations and jobs in the plantation-based wood products industries. 
But sadly, the Regional Investment Corporation hasn't even been able to issue any of these loans. Instead, we have this ANAO report showing that the RIC has taken more than 100 business days on average to approve loans under its existing schemes. If you're seeking financing under a concessional loan for scheme for plantations, you are still waiting. I mean, all we've seen from this government is slick spin and marketing. We saw it in forestry videos commissioned by the department to look the for make the forest industry look incredibly glossy. For a party that likes to talk about government waste, the Liberals spend far too much on marketing and spin. They should deliver the substance that makes a real difference by supporting plantations and ending native forest logging. The question is that the report be noted. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Senator Ciccone. Ciccone. That's good. Um, Madam Acting Deputy President, I understand there's been um, uh, agreement with the government, but I just wanted to seek leave to lodge a late notice of motion is as circulated granted? under Senator Gallagher's name. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Thank you. Senator Ciccone. Do, do, could you just? I'll give it to the attendant. There you go. No, did you indicate what the notice of motion was? I'm sorry, I didn't. I'll, I'll, I'll so we seek leave first, and then we proceed to the. Next. As I mentioned earlier, um, and I'll mention it again, um, it's under the name of Senator Gallagher. It's circulated it's... in the chamber and agree with the government. Okay. Thank you. Now we now are proceeding to response to Senate resolutions. Are, is there any senator that wishes to um, take note of the Senate resolutions? No senators. We now will proceed to the consideration of documents. And the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you. I present the report of the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Legislation Committee on the performance of the Australian Maritime Safety Authority together with the Hansard record of proceedings and documents presented to the committee, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. The motion is that the Senate take note of the report. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Leave to incorporate the tabling statement in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Ciccone. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, on behalf of Senator Polly, as chair of the uh, Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills, I present the Scrutiny Digest Number 8 of 2020 of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills. The question is. Thank you. Senator Ferranti Wells. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I present the annual report of the 2019 of 2019 of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation and seek leave to make some remarks. Thank you. Go ahead, Senator. I rise to speak to the tabling of the Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation's annual report 2019. For almost 90 years, the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation Committee has operated on a genuinely non-partisan basis to scrutinise all delegated legislation subject to disallowance by the Senate against the technical scrutiny principles set out in Standing Order 23. In doing so, the committee plays an essential role in ensuring, on behalf of the Senate, that executive-made laws comply with the fundamental principles of the separation of powers and the rule of law. The 2019 annual report documents one of the most significant years in the committee's history. As part of its regular scrutiny work in 2019, the committee examined 1,434 disallowable legislative instruments in 13 private meetings. Approximately 16 per cent of the instruments considered by the committee raised technical scrutiny concerns. Consistent with previous years, the majority of the committee's scrutiny concerns related to compliance with statutory requirements. 
However, there was a marked increase in the proportion of instruments which, in the committee's view, contain matters more appropriate for parliamentary enactment. In addition to its regular scrutiny work, the annual report highlights several important changes to the committee's principles and practices during 2019, which have greatly enhanced the committee's capacity to perform its scrutiny role. Most, perhaps most significantly, the committee reported on its 2019 inquiry into the continuing effectiveness role and future direction of the committee and the adequacy of the existing framework of parliamentary control and scrutiny of delegated legislation. The committee made 22 unanimous recommendations, which emphasised the need to strengthen the committee's powers, functions and scrutiny principles and the broader framework of parliamentary control of delegated legislation. Since tabling its inquiry report, the committee has taken a number of steps to promote these objectives. For example, in November 2019, the Senate agreed to the committee's proposed amendments to Senate Standing Orders 23 and 25-2A. Amongst other things, the amendments to the Standing Orders changed the committee's name to more accurately reflect the scope of the committee's work amend the scope of instruments that the committee could consider, provided the committee with permanent general inquiry powers, enabled the committee to self-initiate inquiries into matters exclusively related to the technical scrutiny of delegated legislation, clarified the scope of the committee's scrutiny principles, enabled the committee to identify but not assess issues in delegated legislation likely to be of interest to the Senate, and clarified the power of the legislation committees to inquire into and report on delegated legislation made in the portfolios allocated to them. In addition to the changes to the committee's standing orders, the annual report details a number of changes that the committee made to its internal work practices in 2019. For the first time in 19 years, the committee conducted private briefings with senior departmental officers to gather further information to resolve its scrutiny concerns without recourse to disallowance. The committee is grateful to the representatives of the Department of Home Affairs and the eSafety Commissioner for their participation in such briefings in 2019. The committee also held its first ever private briefing with a minister as part of its scrutiny of the Quality of Care Amendment Minimising the Use of Restraints Principles 2019. The committee thanks the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians for his constructive engagement with the committee to satisfactorily resolve its scrutiny concerns about that instrument. These briefings embody the deliberative model of parliamentary scrutiny on which the committee's work is based and have proven to be a, a particularly effective means of resolving its technical scrutiny concerns. From July 2019, the committee also changed its reporting practices to draw the Senate's attention to its most significant scrutiny concerns to outstanding undertakings and instruments which authorise Commonwealth expenditure. For example, throughout the year, the committee reported on delegated legislation which authorised expenditure amounting to over $6 billion. I am pleased to report that since implementing these changes for its reporting practices, the committee has observed an increased responsiveness and timeliness by ministers and agencies in engaging with the committee to resolve technical scrutiny concerns. For example, the rate with which undertakings were implemented increased tenfold since the committee altered its reporting practices. While 2019 saw some significant steps towards strengthening parliamentary oversight of delegated legislation, some significant challenges remain. The annual report notes some key technical scrutiny issues which the committee will continue to monitor in the future. In particular, I would like to emphasise the committee's concerns regarding the exemption of delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight. In 2019, approximately 20 per cent of delegated legislation was exempt from disallowance and therefore removed from oversight by this committee and the parliament more generally. This proportion is likely to increase in 2020 due to the significant number of exempt instruments being made in response to COVID-19. 
In its response to the committee's inquiry, the government com committed to publishing guidance materials on the circumstances where it is appropriate to exempt instruments from disallowance and to amending the Federal Register of Legislation to enable exempt instruments to be easily identified. However, the committee notes that the government has yet to fulfil these commitments. These concerns have informed the committee's decision, committee's decision to undertake an inquiry into the exemption of delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight using its new own motion inquiry power. The committee looks forward to working constructively with the executive branch of the government to address the issues arising from this inquiry. Finally, on behalf of the committee, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the work and assistance of the committee's legal adviser, Associate Professor Andrew Edgar. Committee members and committee staff very much value his expertise and his excellent counsel. I would like to especially acknowledge the hard work and commitment of the Secretariat staff. Glenn Ryle, committee secretary, Laura Sweeney, principal research officer, and all the team. Without all your efforts, we would not be able to achieve so much during one. We would not have been able to achieve so much during one of the most significant years of the operation of the committee. I also thank ministers and departments for their willingness to constructively engage with the committee to resolve scrutiny issues. Finally, noting the committee's long-standing practice of undertaking its scrutiny in a non-partisan and consensual way, I thank my current and former scrutiny committee colleagues for their commitment to the committee's important work. With these comments, I commend the committee's annual um, report 2019 to the Senate. The motion is that the report be noted. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Senator Ferranti Wills. I present uh, delegated legislation monitor eight of 2020 of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated uh, Legislation. And I seek uh, to make a statement in relation to the tabling of this monitor. I would like to take this opportunity to highlight two key matters raised in the monitor. The first concerns the committee's scrutiny of the National Health Take Home Naloxone Pilot Special Arrangements 2019. This instrument makes a special arrangement under section 100 of the National Health Act to support the establishment of a PBS subsidised pilot program to supply naloxone to people who are at risk of an opioid overdose and persons who are likely to be able to assist such persons. In doing so, section 25 of the instrument provides that private third parties may be authorised by contract or other means to exercise all of the departmental secretary's powers and to perform all of the departmental secretary's functions under the instrument. The committee considers that the authorisation of private third parties to perform the powers and functions of a departmental secretary is a significant matter that must be expressly authorised on the face of an instrument's enabling act. In this case, the committee is concerned that the enabling provision of the National Health Act does not provide for such an express authorisation. The committee is also keen to ensure that appropriate accountability safeguards apply to any actions taken by private third parties in performing the functions and exercising the powers of public officials. For example, it would expect that authorised private third parties are subject to the same privacy and freedom of information laws as public officials. Following extensive engagement with the Minister for Health, the committee retains significant scrutiny concerns about the instrument. Consequently, the committee has summarised these concerns in Chapter 1 of Delegated Legislation Monitor 8 and is seeking further advice from the minister in the hope that this matter can be resolved without recourse to disallowance. The second issue I would like to highlight is ASIC's recent undertaking to amend three legislative instruments to address the committee's scrutiny concerns. The instruments exempt or modify the operation of specific provisions of the Corporations Act to introduce relief measures related to financial advice and capital raising during the COVID-19 pandemic. The explanatory statement indicated that the emergency measures were intended to be temporary. However, the instruments themselves did not specify end dates for the measures. 
As a technical scrutiny matter, the committee was concerned that allowing the exemptions to remain in force for an unspecified period undermined Parliament's ability to exercise oversight of the, of the measures and was contrary to the committee's request to ministers and agencies that COVID-19 measures be time limited. I am pleased to advise that in response to the committee's comments, these instruments have now been amended to specify end dates. On behalf of the committee, I would like to thank the Assistant Minister and ASIC for their constructive engagement with the committee on this matter. This provides an excellent example of how the executive and the committee can work together to ensure that policy objectives are implemented in a way that complies with the fundamental principles of legislative scrutiny and parliamentary oversight. With these comments, I commend the committee's delegated legislation, Monitor 8 of 2020, to the Senate. The report is that the report, the motion is that the report be um, noted. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. It's my great pleasure to present the Human Rights Scrutiny Report Number 7 of 2020 of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights. I am pleased to table the parliamentary thank you very much. I'm pleased to table the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights seventh scrutiny report of 2020. This report contains a technical examination of legislation with Australia's obligations under international human rights law. The report continues the committee's important work of scrutinising legislation developed in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. I note in particular the legislative instruments that determine requirements to prevent or control the entry or spread of COVID-19 in designated remote communities. The committee considers that these measures promote and protect the rights to life and health and while they may necessarily limit the rights to freedom of movement and equality and non-discrimination, the committee considers these are permissible limitations. In forming this view, the committee is mindful of the potential loss of life that our nation was facing when the pandemic was first declared and the critical importance of responding immediately and urgently to mitigate and manage these risks. The committee also notes the importance of consultation with those in remote communities. And I would like to quote from the Minister for Indigenous Affairs, the Honourable Ken Wyatt, who advised the Parliament on the 14th of May 2020 in relation to these measures, and I quote, so right from the beginning, we worked with elders, leaders and peak organisations. Working with my colleague, Greg Hunt, we use the Biosecurity Act to define secure areas for remote communities in order to isolate them from people bringing COVID-19 in. One of the best ex expressions I heard was from an elder who said, this thing has no song line and we don't want to create a song line that brings death. Madam Acting Deputy President, this demonstrates the very real human rights need for such action to be taken. I would also like to briefly note the committee's concluding remarks with respect to two Civil Aviation Safety Authority instruments. The committee thanks the minister for explaining the human rights compatibility of these measures and commends CASA for revising the statements of compatibility to reflect this and for adopting the same course of action for two additional relevant instruments that it has identified. This is an excellent example of the way that the committee's dialogue, model of engagement with ministers and departments can work in practice. The committee has also continued to consider non-COVID related legislation. In this report, the committee seeks further information in order for it to assess the human rights compatibility of the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation Amendment Bill 2020 and the Migration Amendment Prohibiting Items in Immigration Detention Facilities Bill 2020. I think it's important to reiterate that the committee has not reached a concluded view as to these bills' compliance with human rights law, and I wish to also further reiterate 
that the committee's statutory role is to assess proposed legislation for compatibility with the seven core international human rights treaties to which Australia is a party and then to report to the parliament. Uh, in performing this function, the committee receives legal advice from and is assisted by an external legal advisor as well as the Secretariat staff. Our report clearly sets out the legal advice received, which is uh, separate from any view of committee members, and I spoke about that in my last contribution. Uh, where the committee seeks a response or further response from the relevant minister, the committee is seeking information as to whether particular limitations on rights which have been identified are permissible as a matter of human, international human rights law. I stress that most rights can be properly limited if it is demonstrated that the limitation is reasonable, necessary and proportionate. Finally, the committee has concluded its consideration of the Telecommunications Legislation Amendment International Production Orders Bill 2020. This bill seeks to establish a new framework for international production orders to provide Australian agencies access to overseas communications data for law enforcement and national security purposes and to allow for reciprocal arrangements for certain countries. While the committee considers that the bill seeks to achieve the important and legitimate objective of protecting national security and public safety, it has some concerns as to whether it includes sufficient safeguards. In particular, the committee has expressed its concerns that the bill, as currently drafted, does not specifically prohibit mutual assistance with a foreign country where it may lead to the imposition of the death penalty or to degrading treatment. The committee has made a number of recommendations that consideration be given to amending the bill in order to reduce the risk that information may be shared with a foreign country which could expose a person to the death penalty or to degrading treatment or punishment and to improve the compatibility of the bill with the right to privacy. Madam Acting Deputy President, I encourage all parliamentarians to carefully consider the committee's analysis and with these comments I commend the committee's report number seven of 2020 to the chamber. Thank you. The motion is that the report be noted. All those of that opinion say aye, but those against say no. The ayes have it. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit, I present the report of the committee entitled Report 481, Efficiency and Effectiveness, Inquiry into Auditor General's Reports, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. And I seek leave to speak to the motion. Are you speaking now, Senator? Yes. Continue. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. One of the key functions of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit is to ensure the accountability and transparency of public administration and expenditure in the Commonwealth. Accordingly, examining the efficiency and effectiveness of the administration of government programs directly ties into the statutory responsibilities and interests of the committee. This report is presented to the parliament pursuant to section 8.1 of the Public Accounts and Audit Committee Act 1951 and details the committee's findings from the inquiry into the following Auditor General's reports 2018 and 19. And they been Report number 25, Efficiency of the Processing of Applications for Citizenship by Conferral. Report number 29, Efficiency of the Investigation of Transport Accidents and Safety Occurrences. Report number 38, Application of Cost Recovery Principles. Report number 42, Management of Small Business Tax Debt. Report number 44, The Effectiveness of the Export Finance and Insurance Corporation. Report number 45, Coordination and Targeting of Domestic Violence Funding and Actions. And finally, report number 51, Farm Management Deposit Scheme. The purpose of this inquiry was to examine the efficiency and effectiveness of the administration of a range of government programs across a variety 
of subject matters and Commonwealth agencies. The committee identified several common themes across the seven Auditor General's reports which were examined, including the importance of strong governance structures, the effectiveness beg your pardon, the effective measurement and management of program performance, and appropriate stakeholder engagement. These elements are critical to the success of all government programs, and the committee's findings are relevant to all government agencies undertaking program management on behalf of the Commonwealth. In examining the operations of these programs, the committee has made 11 recommendations to agencies, including the Department of Home Affairs relating to externally reported key performance indicators and an electronic tracking system for applicants seeking citizenship by conferral. To the Department of Finance as well, in reference to cost recovery guidelines and benchmarking activities by cost recovery entities. Also to the Australian Tax Office regarding improvements to data analysis and systems designed to report on debt arising from compliance activities. And to the Department of Social Services relating to risk management and public reporting for the National Plan to Reduce Violence Against Women and Their Children 2010 to 2022. And finally, to the Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment and the Australian Tax Office in relation to policy objectives, key performance indicators and risk assessments for the Farm Management Deposit Scheme. On behalf of the Chair, I would like to acknowledge the work of the committee secretariat and like all committee secretariats we receive fantastic support and uh, particularly want to point out uh, the support that we receive on this committee uh, we're often dealing with such varied subjects and there's never anything that uh, no subject or no issue that they're not willing to take on so I particularly thank the secretariat of this committee uh, and for this inquiry and thank the members other members of the committee for their cooperation in producing this bipartisan report. Madam Deputy President, I commend the report to the Senate. The motion is that the report be noted. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Senator McGrath. Thank you. I present the report of the Economics Legislation Committee on the performance of the Inspector General of Taxation together with the Hansard Record of, record of Proceedings and documents presented to the committee, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. I seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. Are there any ministerial statements? Uh, Minister. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm tabling documents relating to the order of production of documents concerning defence honours and awards appeal tribunal. Is that a ministerial statement? Am I in the right spot? Yes. Here yep. we go. Okay. Yes. I'm also tabling another document relating to the order of production of documents concerning defence honours and awards appeals tribunal. A second. Thank you, Minister. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy uh, President. I rise to speak on um, the uh, OPD, um, particularly in relation to 595. So I want to speak today on the, the display of utter arrogance by the Prime Minister, who has defied an order of the Senate to produce documents in accordance with that order. That, and, and that was in regard to regard, uh, regarding advice received on, on the decision to deny a Victoria Cross to ordinary seaman Edward Teddy Sheehan. On December the 1st, 1942, 18-year-old Teddy Sheehan made several profoundly courageous decisions when ordered to abandon his ship HMAS Armadale after it came under aerial bombardment and torpedo attack from the Japanese. Decisions that would protect, defend and ultimately save the lives of his crewmates. Sheehan did not abandon ship. He turned back, returned to his gun, strapped himself to it and fired on the enemy aircraft that was strafing and killing his mates. Wounded, he persisted and shot down at least one of them, remaining at his weapon until he was killed and the Armadale disappeared beneath the waves. Teddy Sheehan is a hero. He was posthumously mentioned in dispatches, a great honour. But it has been consistently, consistently asserted by his many supporters that an MID does not adequately ref reflect 
Teddy's gallantry. Those supporters straddle all political divides. All political divides. Chief amongst them are his tireless family, supported by former Senator Guy Barnett, now the Tasmanian Minister for Veterans Affairs. For decades, they have worked towards a comprehensive review of his case to prove just how valiant this young lad was and that he deserves to be awarded the Victoria Cross. In 2013, they were sorely, sorely disappointed when a valour inquiry by the Defence Honours Awards and Appeals Tribunal found Sheehan's actions did not meet the criteria for that award, determined that a full merits-based review was the only way to achieve justice, they pushed on. In 2018, the Chief of Navy, Vice Admiral, Admiral Noonan, wrote to Mr Barnett saying that he had considered the matter forming the view that there was no new evidence to support review of Sheehan's actions. In October that year, Mr Barnett applied to the tribunal seeking a review of this decision by Vice Ad Admiral Newman. The review went ahead. It examined the story, the witness accounts in detail, process and precedent. It was the full merits-based review that they had hoped for. Finally, finally, on July 23 last year, the tribunal recommended to the Minister for Defence Personnel, Darren Chester, that the minister recommend to the sovereign that ordinary seaman Edward Sheehan be posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross. I'll repeat that. The Defence Personnel Minister, Darren Chester, recommended uh, the, sorry, the tribunal recommended to the Minister for Defence Personnel, Darren Chester, a member of this government, the Morrison government, that the minister he recommended to the sovereign that ordinary seaman Edward Sheehan be posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross. Shortly after, Minister Chester advised the tribunal that he was comfortable with the recommendations and would be communicating with senior ministers, including the Prime Minister, Mr Scott Morrison. All the way through this, Teddy supporters have been most respectful of process and procedure and the reverence in which the VC is held. After all those years of work, it looked like Teddy was finally going to get the medal that he so well deserved. Then things went awry, absolutely awry. The Prime Minister, Mr Scott Morrison, intervened. That's when things went bad. He rejected the recommendations of the tribunal and his own minister out of hand and refused to recommend to the Queen that the VC awarded. And I guess one of the disappointing things from my point of view is here, the, the Tasmanian members on the other side of this chamber, as I understand, have also supported the position that Teddy Sheehan be awarded the Victoria Cross. No, 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 they're not silent in this. They're not silent because I understand they've, they've pressed the Prime Minister to uphold that decision. But they have been silent in this chamber. So they should be speaking out and they should be supporting this decision. Defending this decision, he claimed, this is the Prime Minister, that he had taken advice from Australia's military chiefs, not chief, but chiefs, past and present. So is, it, it, is this very advice that the Senate demanded to be tabled in this place by moon, noon today, 12 noon? That's almost, well it is actually, six hours ago. But Mr Morrison could not be bothered to meet that deadline. And now, over six hours later, but four and a half hours late, the documents were received. Four and a half hours late, defying a Senate motion. And the only advice was one letter. And that letter came from General Ang Agnes Angus Campbell, and that was already publicly available. So no other letters, yet we wind back to the um, 
to the radio interview that the Prime Minister made a statement in ABC Tasmania on the 26th of May, 26 of May 2020, where he said, We have not taken this decision lightly. I have taken advice from Australia's military chiefs, that's plural, past and present. But all we've seen today is a letter that was already tabled in the other place a couple of days ago. So where is all this advice that he sought? Was it actually official advice or was it just a few matey chats with the old boys? Not good enough, Prime Minister. Not good enough at all. And now, in a de desperate attempt to save face, we have yet another review and not one provided for by any kind of prescribed process. It's one that he just made up, the Prime Minister made up the process that is now going to determine whether or not that independent tribunal's position will, will uh, up, be upheld. So we are baffled and we are angry that the Prime Minister will reject the recommendations of the independent tribunal set up for the express purpose that's why the awards tribunal is set up. It's why it's independent. It is for the express purpose of providing him with expert, independent advice. But he didn't like that advice, so he goes off and develops another review committee. It's outrageous. It is incredibly unfair that an open and proper process could be ditched by the Prime Minister in favour of private advice, advice that we, the Australian people, have not been privy to because he has not provided that to this chamber today. And in the end, this is about trust, the trust of the Australian people that proper process is followed. And right now, they are seeing nothing but an arrogant Prime Minister who has made the worst kind of captain's call the worst. And still we wait for justice for ordinary seaman Edward Teddy Sheehan. Uh, Senator Billy. Thank you. I would like to associate myself with my colleague um, Senator Urquhart and her comments. As she said, ordinary seaman Edward Sheehan was only 18 years of age when he committed an act of extraordinary bravery. On 1 December 1942, when the HMAS Armadale was struck by torpedoes, its personnel were ordered to abandon ship. Sheehan, although severely wounded by attack attacking Japanese aircraft, returned and strapped himself to one of the ship's guns to engage en enemy aircraft. He shot down at least one of the aircraft, and in do so doing, he was defending his fellow personnel, knowing knowing that he would go down with that ship. It's possible that Mr Sheehan's actions in drawing away the fire of enemy aircraft saved the lives of his fellow crew members. Madam Acting Deputy President, the Victoria Cross is awarded to a person who, and I quote, in the presence of the enemy, displays the most conspicuous gallantry or daring or preeminent act of valour or self-sacrifice or extreme devotion to duty. Now, for those who know of Teddy Sheehan's deeds and who have follow, followed the various inquiries into them, um, and I must say I've been here for 12 years and this issue has been going on longer than that. Um, we've been debating it longer than that. The Prime Minister's decision not to posthumously award him a VC is more than baffling. My Labor colleague, Senator Urquhart, moved for the documents related to this decision to be produced because this issue warrants public scrutiny. On the face of it, the decision and the explanations of those opposite make absolutely no sense. We have the Minister for Defence claim in this place that the 2019 review by the Defence Honours and Awards Appeal Tribunal did not present any new evidence. Senator Reynolds also claimed that their inquiry was a review of the 2013 decision, not a full merits-based inquiry. Well, guess what? She was wrong on both counts. And that's according to the chair of the DHAAT. The chair, Mark Sullivan's decision to write to the minister regarding her misleading the Senate is not something that I think he would have taken lightly, and yet he did it. Given Senator Reynolds' explanation was comprehensively torn apart by Mr Sullivan, the reasons for the Prime Minister's decision not to accept the 
The um, independent tribunal's unanimous recommendation of 11 members remains a mystery. And that's why the Senate ordered the production of these documents, to get to the bottom of the mystery, because there's nothing yet in the government's public statements or statements to this place that excuses or justifies the decision. And I was also very surprised at comments in the media about this issue by the Liberal member for Braddon, Mr Pearce. Now, Mr Pearce, I've got to say, is a fence-sitter, and here's a classic example. I do recognise that Mr Pearce acknowledged that Mr Shearn's actions were worthy of Victoria Cross, but then he also stated he thought the PM made the correct decision to have another review. I mean, seriously, how long can you sit on the fence? That is just the most ridiculous double standard that you could come across. And it's a particularly curious intervention, given that Mr Pearce joined his Liberal colleagues in advocating for a VC to be posthumously awarded to Mr Sheen only a month earlier, saying he was satisfied with the process but not satisfied with the decision. So I'm pretty disgusted, really, that Mr Pearce would characterise Labor's advocacy, as he has done of Labor's uh, advocacy as using this as a political football or conducting a chook raffle, chook raffle. because I don't think, uh, given that Mr Sheen was born on the northwest coast of Tasmania, I doubt Mr Pearce's constituents would really appreciate his comments. On this side, we take this issue very seriously and we're all, uh, all we're asking for is for due process and transparency that Mr Sheen, his relatives and advocates deserve. I, to be honest, I can't really see how awarding Mr Sheen a VC would upset the Queen, as has been um, suggested by a certain high-ranking military official. The VC is about courage and gallantry. It's not about whether someone else, no matter who it is, might be upset uh, by this person, whoever it is, and in this case Mr Sheen, receiving the VC. And Labor's advocacy is simply for the Prime Minister to accept the advice provided by independent experts. The excuses that this government continues to provide, including those provided by the Minister, are wearing pretty thin, uh, certainly on the northwest coast of Tasmania. And I believe the Prime Minister's decision to announce yet another review of this matter is really worthy of a Yes Minister sketch. I can already hear the voice of Yes Minister Bernard asking the Prime Minister if he is suggesting a review of the review of the review. Refusing Teddy Sheen a posthumous VC in the face of all the evidence and the DHAATS's findings is a gross injustice to this young Tasmanian war hero. It is a slap in the face to his families, his supporters and to the veteran community. Thank you, Senator Billick. Now, Senator Brown is uh, wishing to contribute, and we'll give her a few moments to take her place. Senator Brown. I too rise to associate myself with the remarks of my Tasmanian <coughs> Labor Senate colleagues, Senator Urquhart and Billick, and to demand the decision of the Independent Defence Honours and Awards Appeals Tribunal be upheld so that Teddy Sheehan can finally be recognised for the, his brave and gallant service with the awarding of the Victorian Cross. Given the Prime Minister has steadfastly refused to provide any real insight at all into his decision to unilaterally quash the findings of the tribunal, it is essential that the authority of this place is respected and documents pertaining to that decision are tabled for every Australian to see. I don't need to retell the incredible story of bravery and courage that underpins the legacy of ordinary seaman Teddy Sheehan. It is a story known so well, particularly to Tasmanians and particularly to Tasmanians on the northwest coast, and so it ought. Our story known so well that it has spurred so many supporters to fight so long to see that Teddy is given the respect and recognition he deserves. The Defence Honours and Awards Appeals Tribunal has determined that no less than a Victoria Cross be awarded to Teddy, an honour awarded for the most conspicuous bravery or some daring or preeminent act of valour 
or self-sacrifice or extreme devotion to duty in the presence of the enemy, an honour justly deserved. For a Prime Minister to interview, intervene after a preeminent tribunal has made such an emphatic decision on the weight of overwhelming evidence is extraordinary. It is precisely a circumstance such as this that the Australian people should be entitled to see the advice the Prime Minister relied upon to make such an extraordinary decision. To set aside the decision of a tribunal set up to specifically to deal with such matters. Now, quite extraordinarily, the member for Braddon, Mr Gavin Pearce, stood up in the other place and said, and I quote, in my opinion, the Prime Minister has taken the right decision, end quote. Now let's just let that sink in. The member for Braddon is on record in the parliament backing the Prime Minister's mishandling of this process. It is a mishandling that effectively amounts to a bizarre intervention to overrule the findings, recommendations and decisions of a Defence Honours and Awards Appeal Tribunal. Simply extraordinary. And for what? We have, not, we have not been given a reason as to why the Prime Minister would seek to intervene to overturn the decision of an expert tribunal specifically tasked with considering the merits or otherwise of awarding of a military honour. Its, its decision should be upheld and respected, not cast aside without explanation. Teddy Sheehan, his family and supporters deserve so much better. Tasmanians deserve better. Indeed, all of our serving military personnel and our veterans deserve better. The member for Braddon, though, went further. He went on to say, and I quote, it's not this, place, this place's job to kick around like a football, like a can down the road, end quote. I actually agree with the member for Braddon, Mr Pearce. Couldn't agree more. That's why the decision of the independent umpire should be respected. The only person kicking the ma this matter around like a football is the person who refuses to respect the decision of the umpire, which has, which has called time on this matter, and that person is the Prime Minister. A Prime Minister who refuses to provide a proper explanation for doing so, and his actions are backed 100 per cent by the member for Braddon, Mr Gavin Pearce. I'm, I'm astonished, absolutely astonished. I would have thought that the local member for Braddon would be going in to bat for Teddy Sheen, his family and his supporters at every opportunity, not backing in a recalcitrant Prime Minister who has unquestionably done the wrong thing by failing to accept the decision of an independent tribunal. All Tasmanian members and senators should call on the Prime Minister to set aside his hastily formed review of a review and get on with un upholding the appellant tribunal's decision and allow, allow the awarding of the Victoria Cross to Teddy Sheehan. Thank you, Senator Brown. Committee memberships. Minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. The President has received a letter requesting changes in the membership of committees. Minister. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister? I move that senators may uh, be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. Is the motion agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no. The ayes have it. Are there any messages from the House of Representatives? The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. National Vocation, Education and Training Regulator Amendment, Governance and Other Matters Bill 2020 and the Therapeutic Goods Amendment 2020 Measures No. 1 Bill 2020. Minister. 
Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. These bills are being introduced together after debate on the motion for the second reading has been adjourned. I shall move a motion that, to have the bills listed separately. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. Is the motion agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. Oh, Clark. A bill for an act to amend the National Vocation Education Training Regulator Act 2011 and for related purposes. A bill for an act to amend the Therapeutic Goods Act 1989 and for related purposes. Minister. I move that these bills be now read a second time and seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate be now adjourned. The motion is that the uh, debate be now adjourned. All, all those of that opinion say aye. 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 Again, say no. The ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bills be listed as separate orders of the day. The motion is that that uh, the motion is that that be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. The President has received a message from His Excellency, the Governor-General, notifying assent to four laws, details of which will be incorporated in Hansard. A message has been received from the House of Representatives returning the Treasury Laws Amendment 2020 Measures No. 2 Bill 2020 and informing the Senate that the House has disagreed to the amendments made by the Senate. Minister. I move that the message be considered in the Committee of the Whole immediately. Is the motion is that that be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The question is that the message be, be considered in the Committee of the Whole immediately. That's the motion before the Senate. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The Committee is considering message number 225 from the House of Representatives relating to the Treasury Laws Amendment 2020 measures number 2 Bill 2020. Minister. I move that the committee does not insist on its amendments to, the, to which the House of Representatives has disagreed. The question is that the motion moved by the minister be agreed to, and that motion is that the committee does not insist on its amendments to which the House of Representatives has disagreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the ayes have it. No. No. Noes have it. Division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
Yes. Stop the bells. So the question is that the motion as moved by the minister be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Brockman as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 29 ayes and 33 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Minister. Um, uh, I move. Uh, You're so, yeah, so I move the resolution be reported. So the question is that the motion as moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The committee has considered message number 225 from the House of Representatives relating to the Treasury Laws Amendment 2020 Measures No. 2 Bill and has resolved to insist on the amendments made by the Senate to which the House has disagreed. Minister. 
I move that the report of the committee be adopted. So the question is: a motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. So we're now going back to the business, which is the disallowance motion. I call the clerk. Government, uh, no, sorry, business of the Senate uh, notice of motions number one, standing in the name of Senator Sheldon, motion for the disallowance of the coronavirus economic response package payments and benefits amendment rules number two, 2020. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you. I move business of Senate notice of motion number one. Um, sorry, good. Senator Sheldon, I um, missed what you had just said. Oh, good, thanks. I just moved the business of Senate notion, notice of motion number one. Thank you. Good, thank you. First, I'd like to uh, add the name of Senator Rice as a co-sponsor of this motion. And secondly, I would, I'm aware that there are differing views on the two issues contained in the disallowance. Accordingly, I ask that at the conclusion of this debate, the questions on this motion be divided with respect to item four and items five to seven, so the senators may vote differently on item four, relating to sovereign entities, and items five to seven, relating to higher education sector. I rise to speak to my motion that would disallow sections four to seven of the government's coronavirus economic response package payment and amendments rules 2020. Senator Sheldon, um, let me interrupt you for a moment. Um, there's a lot of senators in the chamber um, meeting. Perhaps you could step outside so that those senators who wish to hear the debate are able. Thank you. Please continue, Senator Sheldon. Good. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to my motion that would disallow sections four to seven of the government's coronavirus economic response package. These are the amendments the government introduced on May the first which further tighten the eligibility for the JobKeeper program. I do this because there are thousands of Australians who deserve better from this government, their government. The COVID-19 health pandemic has rocked the foundations of Australia and global society. It has closed successful businesses in all shapes and sizes across all industries, left millions of people around the world unemployed, it has killed over 100 people in Australia and 400,000 across the world. It will leave a permanent mark on the lives of so many of us. During periods like this, unprecedented periods of social and economic upheaval, the people of Australia look to us, the democratic leaders for guidance, for leadership and for support. Throughout this period, Labor has consistently called for action to support the economy to protect jobs, help Australian workers, businesses, families and communities through what has been a once-in-a-generation period of instability. We know the origin story of JobKeeper. We know that at the outset the government really just wanted to throw Australians on the Centrelink queues. It was only the continued pressure from the Labor opposition, the crossbench and the Australian trade union movement and the business community that this government announced that it would introduce a wage subsidy scheme, one that would give companies and workers certainty and support. When the Prime Minister Scott Morrison and Treasurer Josh Frydenberg announced JobKeeper, the Treasurer said, Australians know that their government has their back. But very quickly it became apparent that JobKeeper would not have the backs of hundreds of thousands of Australians and their families. Which is why, when it was legislated, Labor moved amendments to ensure that key groups of workers were protected, including over one million casual workers, including gig workers in transport and other areas, the arts and in education, workers in local government around the country, migrant workers and international students who pay tax and who come here in good faith. These amendments were defeated by a government uninterested in helping Australian tax-paying workers. 
Since then, we've urged the Treasurer repeatedly to use his extraordinary powers to extend JobKeeper payments to those left behind. Instead, he has chosen to exclude even more workers. This program, which was meant to support workers, keep, their con keep them connected to their employers and in turn stimulate the economy, has instead been made to pe so piecemeal that it's failing in its purpose. The government promised an economic compact with the Australian people. It promised to support some six million workers, a number they trumpeted. And now, after their accounting blunder was exposed, we know it's just three million. Australian workers have been shortchanged by this heartless government and have broken the compact with the people of Australia. The JobKeeper program began on the 30th of March 2020. But on the May the 1st, the government moved to exclude Australian workers in universities and Australian workers whose companies are ultimately owned by a foreign sovereign entity. It was an outrageous and cruel stroke of a pen that has left tens of thousands and thousands of tens of thousands and thousands of families, thousands and thousands of families out in the cold. In the higher education sector, one that employs roughly 260,000 who, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, may see some 21,000 workers unemployed. These workers include the cleaners, the security, the caterers and the administra administration who work across Australian universities, the academics and the many that, that teach so many important people across this economy. These are workers in our suburbs and in our regions, the places hardest hit by the economic down turmoil of the pandemic. These workers have, been, have done nothing wrong. And yet the government has now, on three occasions, changed the regulations to make it impossible for universities to meet the thresholds for JobKeeper, deprive these hard-working Australians of the support that they need during the shutdown. I want to commend the National Tertiary Education Union and their leadership and their president, Alison Barnes, for their steadfast advocacy of these workers, doing everything they can to keep them in secure jobs. I want to focus now on those Australian workers shut out of the sovereign entity provisions. Let's be very clear what the government has done. In 2018, they approved the sale of Qantas Catering to Donata, a catering company owned by the Emirates Airlines, which is itself owned by the UAE government. Now they want to turn around and effectively punish these workers for this decision. It is though no fault of these workers who the ultimate and what the ultimate ownership structure of the company is. It is also a well-known feature of the aviation industry around the world that these, there are high levels of government ownership. This is how aviation works. And in any case, it, shouldn't be, no, it should not matter. They are Australian workers. They pay income tax like everyone else to this government. They expect the government to treat them equally and fairly. JobKeeper is an Australian wage subsidy. The money is going to into the pockets of Australian workers, not foreign governments. And this government instead wants to split hairs about ownership structures and shareholdings. Qantas workers are getting JobKeeper. Even Swissport, an aviation firm employing thousands of Australians who are opaquely owned by the Chinese government by its takeover of HA, are getting JobKeeper. These aviation workers are getting this support because Australian workers, they're Australian workers, full stop. Acting Deputy President. Donata employs over 5,500 workers across nine Australian airports, including Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Adelaide, Darwin, Coolangatta, Avalon, Perth and Cairns. Many of these workers worked previously for Qantas before it was sold its catering business to Donata. These workers were amongst the very first hit by the coronavirus lockdowns when the government made the decision to shut aviation down. It was hard. But they said that this was a public health emergency 
and then subsequently they were told their, by their employer that it would be okay, that they would get JobKeeper and they would have jobs on the other side of this crisis. Donata had to stand down 9 per cent of their workforce and employ only a skeleton crew. Then JobKeeper was announced and the company was invited to apply. Invited to apply. Some workers even received some payments from their employers in the expectation they would be receiving JobKeeper. Many cancelled JobSeeker applications, many looking forward to getting back to work and the certainty that JobKeeper payments would provide them and their families. They were playing by the rules, only to have the government move the goalposts on them mid-game. The lunacy that workers who hand you the meal on a flight can receive the support, but the worker who makes the meal is denied it. It is hard to describe this situation as anything short of these workers being double-prossed by their own government. Cancelling their applications has cost them time and money they can ill afford. I want to pay tribute to the incredible work of the Transport Workers Union of Australia and the Australian Services Union who represent these workers, but importantly the workers themselves who are standing up. The workers at Donata have no control who owns their company. They work for a company that is sovereign owned from another country. But they are Australian workers and after a lifetime of work and paying tax they deserve our support. The decision to exclude these workers is harsh and lacks compassion and logic. It impacts not only these workers but their partners and their families, their communities. This decision has created such unnecessary and harmful stress to workers and their families. It looks even more harsh after the $60 billion JobKeeper accounting area by the government was revealed only a few weeks ago. Well, I'm pleased to acknowledge that at least one member of the government, the member for Hughes, Craig Kelly, has joined with me to support the case for Donata workers. He acknowledges, as so do many members and senators, that these workers could easily be included within the original funding envelope provided for the program. This is a heartless decision that hurts Australians, Australians like Nellie and Darlene. Nellie was made a permanent employee in Qantas Catering in 1980. She took pride in her job and she says in writing to me, keeping myself mentally and physically active, continue to be a provider for my family and also working with my team, who after 40 years has become my family away from family, sacrificing time away from actual family for all those years to be able to contribute to something greater. Knowing that I wasn't a burden on society also filled me with satisfaction. I have never asked nor received family assistance from this government. I didn't ever plan to. Unfortunately, as of March this year, we were all asked to step down from our jobs. Four decades working for Qantas, wiped clean because the company had sold, been sold to a foreign entity, something we came to find out the Australian government approved before it could be sold. Now four months into COVID-19, having paid taxes for 40 years, regardless of who owned the company, not only was I out of work, unable to qualify for assistance, I should have been entitled to and left re-evaluating all my life's hard work and sacrifices to this point. I felt helpless, broken and unsure of what to do next. She is not eligible for job, keeper, job seeker and because of this government she has been excluded from job keeper. There's another Donata worker, Darlene, contacted me also this week. This is what she had to say. My grandfather served in World War I and World War II. My grand uncle died in the battlefield of Polygon Wood, Belgium, on the 26th of the 9th, 1917, serving in World War I. My father passed away last year from illness, received while serving with the Australian Navy in Korea. Yet you don't consider me to be Australian enough to receive JobKeeper? Please explain what your requirements are to be classed Australian. The Australian government allowed this sale to go through, yet are punishing and sacrificing us for their poor decisions. You can help us to right this wrong. Please 
give us JobKeeper. Well, the Prime Minister likes to talk about quiet Australians. He likes to talk about a fair go. If you have a go, you get a go. Where is a go for Nellie and Darlene and their families? Where is the backing of these quiet Australians? If the JobKeeper allowance is not for them, it's not worthy of the name and more appropriately called Job Faker. And this government is not worthy of the name either. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. In response to the economic crisis caused by the coronavirus, the government has provided total economic support worth $260 billion, or 13.3 per cent of GDP. As a part of this response, the $70 billion JobKeeper program provides unprecedented support to millions of Australians. Eligibility has focused on maximising the reach of the JobKeeper program while ensuring that the program is able to be implemented as quickly and efficiently as possible while remaining sustainable. Thank you. Um, Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. The Greens support this disallowance. And specifically, I want to talk to supporting disallowing item four of these regulations for the coronavirus economic response package. We also support the disallowance of items five to seven, but my colleague Senator Faruqi spoke extensively to this in her own disallowance, disallowing items five to seven last week. And I associate myself with her remarks that she made about those items which were related to the higher education sector. So there was a time when the coalition liked to talk about Team Australia. But they're not talking about being a team now, now that we're in a crisis. Now that Australian workers are in the lurch, the coalition is backpedalling as fast as they can. Now when it really matters, people in Australia are doing it tough, who are doing it tough, find out whose side the coalition is really on. They might be willing, this government, to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to a former mining executive to fly around the country, but they're not willing to support Australians who are doing it tough and the communities that are struggling. The potential work, the, the workers, the particular workers that I want to talk about tonight are some of the workers in the aviation industry. And of course, we know that the aviation industry is in a bit of difficulty at the moment with the virus, with this pandemic because we know that most people aren't flying. There are very few flights, either domestically or internationally. We're in a situation as state borders are lifting their restrictions that we may see an increase in domestic flights, but international flights are not likely to return to the levels that we saw pre-crisis in, in a particularly short amount of time, if indeed they ever do. So we've got a situation with aviation workers, and there are thousands of them, there are probably tens of thousands of them, who are out of work because of the pandemic. These are just the workers, just the type of workers that the government's JobKeeper package was designed to support. People that, because their industry was being badly affected by this pandemic, were not able to be in work. But we've got this particular cohort of workers who aren't being supported. We've got the workers employed by Donata, which before this crisis handled 300,000 tonnes of cargo and supported more than 7 million passengers. There are 5,500 of these workers, and the government is not supporting them. And the government is not supporting the hard-working workers of Cabin Services Australia who do all of the cleaning and preparation of flights across the country. And I met some of these workers out in the lawns of Parliament House last week, and they could not understand why they were being signalled out. They were proud of their, their work. They, they knew that every time one of us, I mean, here as politicians, we fly around the country a lot, every time we have flown in a flight, that it's those workers of Cabin Services Australia who have done the hard work, who have cleaned the cabins to make sure that they are safe and clean for us to, us to be flying in. And so why? Why aren't these workers being supported by JobKeeper? And it's because their companies are owned by a foreign government. But that makes no difference to them. And in fact, in the case of Donata, 
It makes no. It's only a, a matter of different corporate takeovers now that their company, Donata, is owned by a foreign government. It makes no difference to them. They are workers who are employed here in Australia, who have been paying taxes here in Australia. They are just like all the other Australian workers who are being supported by JobKeeper. By supporting these workers with JobKeeper, we're not propping up foreign governments. We are supporting Australians who are out of work during this pandemic. And by not supporting them, it's a terrible impact on these workers for workers, for their families and for communities around the country. It's a huge impact. By not supporting them, it means food on plates, it means mortgage payments, it means being able to pay the bills in the midst of this crisis. I mean, this pandemic is hard enough for people without the coalition throwing workers under a bus. The tragedy is that there is a real opportunity for this government to act and to make a real difference in people's lives. The government could step up and provide support and support these workers in this crisis. I mean, the Greens believe that we need to have a serious look at the sustainability of the aviation industry after the COVID pandemic or whatever situation we're in as, as the COVID um, virus plays its way out throughout the world. And we need to look at, have a serious look at aviation in the context of the climate crisis as well. But leaving workers in the lurch on the arbitrary basis of their company being owned by a foreign government is not the way to do this. I mean, domestically, the, the, the Greens believe that we should be taking action to ensure that we have two viable airlines connecting up our rural communities as we come out of this crisis and that all existing workers in the aviation sector are looked after. We support the calls from the Transport Workers' Union for a national plan for aviation, and I want to thank the Transport Workers' Union for the work that they have been doing to be trying to be supporting the workers in this industry. The TWU are calling for a two-airline model, government equity in the airlines to ensure long-term stability, accessible and affordable services for regions, protection and promotion of regional jobs, JobKeeper for all aviation workers, for workers to get the same pay for the same job, to have safe supply chains and regulation of airports, and capped CEO salaries. We support those calls. This is a crisis and it requires a real response from government that doesn't leave people behind. It requires a response that doesn't allow one of our domestic carriers to go into administration. So we, what the Greens are calling for is the government to take steps for public ownership, if required, for, for Virgin as a step to deal with this crisis. And of course, the support, however, that the government is giving should come with conditions. We think, it, we think it should support worker representation on the board and no bonuses for executives. Public ownership is an important way for government to support workers through this crisis, making sure that an aviation crisis doesn't exacerbate the jobs crisis that we face. And public ownership is also a way for government to support airlines in tackling the environmental challenges we face. I mean, in the long term, airlines must reduce their emissions if we are going to stay within our carbon budget and have a safe future on this planet for us to continue to live on. So any public ownership stake must ensure that airlines live up to their commitments to reduce emissions under the carbon offsetting and reduction scheme for international aviation. I mean, we've heard reports that airlines are lobbying to have their targets made easier, even as they ask for government support. So let's be clear. Government needs to be supporting an aviation industry, and governments must support workers through a national aviation plan that includes public ownership where necessary. It must ensure that, that airlines meet their emission targets. But in the context of this disallowance tonight, what we must ensure is that workers are not left behind, that hard-working workers in the aviation industry who have been paying their taxes, who have been working hard like every other Australian worker, deserve to be supported like other Australian workers have been during the JobKeeper scheme. And so that, for that reason, the Greens are strongly supporting this disallowance tonight. Yeah. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. 
This disallowance motion has created a significant amount of torment for both Senator Roberts and myself, because I have stated from the outset the repercussions the coronavirus will have on Australia and the rest of the globe will be left for potentially generations. And one of those industries that felt the immediate impact of this virus was those in aviation and affiliate industries. The fate of Donato employees was first brought to my attention by 5AA radio announcer Leon Biner several weeks ago. And I made a commitment to Leon that I would look into this. I thank Labor Senator Tony Sheldon, who has been a very strong advocate for the workers of Donata. He has given me a very raw insight into what these employees are going through. This chamber will never quite know how much anger I feel when I hear that we lost another wholly owned Australian business called Q Catering to the United Arab Emirates. You see, many of these employees started their careers employed by Qantas until it was sold to Emirates, who is a UAE state-owned government company. Emirates have posted 32 consecutive years of profit in their recent 2019-20 annual report with a revenue of $28.3 billion, billion US dollars. Now, unfortunately for these Australian workers, and let's be upfront about this, they might work for a foreign government company, but they are Australian workers. The emergency legislation that was passed by Labor, let me say again, Labor, and the coalition government to safeguard jobs under the Job Keeper program prohibits Australian and foreign governments from accessing the Job Keeper program. I'll say it again. The Job Keeper program cannot be accessed by foreign governments and equally it cannot be accessed by Australian governments, which also includes local councils. This was passed by both Liberal and Labor and the Nationals. The disallowance motion that's been put forward today is somewhat a false hope to the workers of Donata, and I sincerely apologise to you and your colleagues if you had hoped this disallowance motion would give you access to the JobKeeper program. One of the questions I asked both the government and Labor related to the return of domestic and international travel. As Australian states determine their relaxation of domestic travel, there is an expectation that flights will resume in some form of capacity over the coming months. As for international travel, that's not likely to restart more broadly until we either find a cure for the coronavirus or somehow everyone miraculously recovers. Which brings me to the decision process Senator Roberts and I used for our determination. The vast majority of the nearly 6,000 Donata workers here in Australia will not have a job to return to once the JobKeeper payments ends on September the 27th. As I stated months ago, our aviation industry will barely be open for domestic travel, let alone international. This is going to be a complete blow to many Donata employees, but I'm being completely upfront and honest with you. I have confirmed with the government that many Donata employees will qualify for JobSeeker, which at the moment still includes the coronavirus supplement of $550 per fortnight and gives recipients a total of $1,100 per fortnight. Depending on an individual's circumstances, Parents may be eligible for other supplements like Family Tax Benefit Part A of up to $186.20 per fortnight for a child up to 12, or the Family Tax Benefit Part B can offer up to $158.34 each fortnight for children under five, and job seekers can also make an application for the Commonwealth Rent Assistance. 
I also want to point out that people on social security payments will also be eligible for two $750 economic support payments, both of which have now been paid following the 13th of July. It is also important that anyone caught in these horrible circumstances know that their ability to access JobSeeker will not be asset tested and that the partner threshold has been lifted to $79,788 per annum. I have always tried to maintain a responsible position when it comes to spending taxpayers' money, and there have been some tough choices made by the Morrison government. I can assure you some of which I agree with and others I don't. But we have all had to make tough choices these past few months, and I sense there are going to be many more over the next 12 months as well. All employees who have lost their jobs or were ineligible for the JobKeeper program have my absolute sympathy at this moment in time. I am very conscious of the needs of these workers, and I am also aware that my party's head office has employed one of these workers who lost their job at the Brisbane airport. Taryn has been with my head office now for a fortnight, and I would encourage any business who is looking for employees right now to consider closely the former employees of Donata and our airport staff. Let me say this to all Australians. I will do everything in my power to ensure that we rebuild jobs in this country, that we stop selling our profitable businesses to foreign governments and overseas companies. And I will continue to fight with the same vigour to ensure that Australian jobs go to Australian workers moving forward. I want to acknowledge Senator Sheldon for his determined representation of the aviation industry, but on this occasion, One Nation will not support the disallowance motion. Senator Patrick. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. I uh, just rise to make a very short statement. Uh, uh, it seems to me perverse that there are Australian workers who, uh, for no uh, for no reason th that they had any control over, find themselves in a situation where they are uh, working for a foreign company and yet uh, are not able to get access to the job uh, keeper uh, payments. And uh, this is this is not money that goes to the company; it's money that goes to the workers. And uh, in some sense, it tells you how uh, the Liberal Party think. Uh, they, they, they think through the, through the lens of a business. They're looking at this from a business perspective uh, and saying, how do we support businesses? This one's a foreign business and therefore it doesn't uh, uh, warrant support. And I, and I understand that, but this particular payment goes straight to the worker. Straight to the worker. Uh, so, I'm, so again, I'm not talking about uh, companies, Senator Hanson. I'm talking about people who work for companies who are good people, good people that work uh, for these companies. They 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 um, go to work, spend their you know spend their time working hard uh, for the company, servicing uh, uh, you know, Australian customers ultimately, uh, and they will suffer as a result of uh, uh, the decisions made by government and what we're trying to do here tonight is stop this particular decision. Again, I just emphasize this money goes directly to the workers. It does not go to the companies. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The COVID scare has been having a massive impact on our country. We know that. And as a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I want to express my empathy to the people who have either been put out of work or limited work. There's enormous stress on people. We know that. And especially in the airline industry, because it's been decimated because there is such close contact with people when we fly in an airline or mix in an airline terminal. I want to acknowledge the Donata people. Uh, fine people, fine Australians must be feeling devastated to be in such a solid industry and to have been sold out by Qantas and to have been sold out by the government that allowed that sale to a foreign company, to a foreign government. It would be very stressful. It is very stressful, I'm sure. 
a lot of worry, a lot of concern, a lot of pressure, and people want to feel, want to, want to be heard, and people also need support. So we'll come to that support in a minute. But I want to compliment Senator Sheldon for his sincerity and his uh, strength and his, his advocacy for the TWU and their campaign. I also want to, want to acknowledge Senators Stirl and Gallagher, uh, former TWU officials who have also been strong in supporting Senator Sheldon. We've listened to Senator Sheldon and compliment him for the way he's brought, brought his argument forward, the, the facts, and also his approach, very respectful and sincere. We also went to the government and asked them for their, their opinions and their views and their data. And as Senator Hanson and I always do, we listen to people to get the data, to get the facts. As I said, we do not like the sale of this, this company to a foreign government, let alone, to any foreigner, let alone a foreign government. It's one of the core industries in our country. It is, though, a very difficult decision. It's a very difficult issue because, as Senator Hanson pointed out, and I'm not going to go through the, the details of, of Senator Hanson's speech because Senator Sheldon wants to put this to a vote tonight, but Senator Hanson has pointed out the comparable uh, after-tax benefits from job seeker and job keeper. But I also want to point out, as I think Senator Hanson said, that job keeper ends in September. Now this program, and I, I disagree with Senator Patrick, this is not for businesses, it's for people to maintain connection with the businesses. So I don't accept that criticism of the government from Senator Patrick. It is to maintain that connection. That connection is going to be severed after September. That's it. It won't last any longer because an, an international travel, travel, air travel and even much domestic travel won't recover by then. So I think it's heartless to give people false hope. I'm certainly not accusing Senator Sheldon of giving people false hope. I know what he's doing and I admire him for that. But I think we need to be uh, straight with these people. What I'd like to do is to, is to ask the government to think about its response. And maybe we need something other than JobKeeper and job. Uh, job, uh, start, uh, job seeker. We need a job restarter because Taiwan, and I mentioned this to the government back in March, Taiwan has had amazing results. What they did was isolate the vulnerable, isolate the sick, and let everyone else get back to work. And that's what we could be doing. Taiwan has had virtually no impact on its economy. And they've had one fifteenth of the deaths we've had, and yet they've got a similar population very close to China heavily dent, highly dense population. So they've done a remarkable job by, instead of isolating everyone and separating everyone, by isolating the few that have got it, the few that are vulnerable and letting the rest get back to work. What we need to do is to get this country back to work. And if that was the level of performance when we led the world in per capita income back in the 1900s to 1920s, we've slipped to about here. We, we were number one, we're sliding out of the top 10. As a, as a result of COVID, we've slipped down here. The target should not, I hope, be just to get back to where we were pre-COVID. We need to get back to our full realistic potential. That's why I say we need to get Job Restarter going, a comprehensive program that looks after energy, restores our energy, low-cost energy, restores infrastructure, restores proper fair taxation system, creates an environment for business so that hopefully more Australian businesses will survive and not have to sell out in the future. We need to end the stress on the economy, end the stress on people's health, end the, end the uh, lack of security. We need a realistic return to not just where we were pre-COVID, but to where, where our potential is. We also need to remember that taxpayers are footing, footing the bill. So, Senator Sheldon, through you, um, Madam De Acting Deputy President, I compliment Senator Sheldon again, and Senator Stirl, and Senator Gallagher, uh, as, as Senator Hanson said, though, on this occasion we will not be voting with them. Senator Stirl. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Just very quickly, I just want to qualify that it is Labor's advice given to us that the Treasurer, Mr Frydenberg, can change, to address what Senator Hanson was saying when the legislation was put through, he can unequivocally change the legislation at the stroke of his pen. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Senator Sheldon. Uh, I'll be uh, very brief, but uh, just to thank um, all the crossbenchers for the opportunity to speak to them. But this isn't a situation of actually voting with Labor. 
or voting with the Greens. This is a situation of voting with Darlene and Nelly and the thousands of people like them. So I still implore all across benches to vote with Nelly and Darlene and thousands of others. Oh, there are no more speakers. A request has been made for the question on the motion to be split. Um, so I'll put the first question that item four of schedule one of the rules be disallowed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the no's have it. A division is required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Stop the bells. Um, the question is that item four of schedule one of the rules be disallowed. The eyes will move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. 
I appoint Senator McCarthy, teller for the ayes, and Senator Brockman, teller for the noes. There being 30 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Um, could I please ask uh, members to remain in the chamber because we have one more division, I think. So the question is that items five to seven of schedule one of the rules be disallowed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Again, say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Division is required. We ring the bell for one minute. Okay. Stop the bells. The question is that items five to seven of schedule one of the rules be disallowed. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McCarthy for, teller for the ayes and Senator Brockman tellers for the noes.
There being 29 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Thank you, Senators. And it being past 7.20, I propose that the Senate now adjourn. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The easing of coronavirus restrictions has led to a renewed sense of optimism for our country, for businesses to resume trading, for workers to return to work and for Australians to enjoy their lives. The latest round of relaxed restrictions means we can get back to restaurants and pubs, which is not only a great reward for the vast majority who have followed the rules, but also fantastic for those businesses to be able to reopen and start getting back to business. In Tasmania, state, uh, travel within our state uh, was lifted in time for the Queen's birthday long weekend, and many people took the chance to visit friends and family in different regions or to go to the shack. This is welcome news for Tasmanian businesses across the state, particularly in the tourism and hospitality industries, who just two months ago were staring down the barrel of potentially six months without any trade at all. I want to commend the Tasmanian business community tonight. They deserve so much credit for the sacrifice they've made in diligently playing their part to prevent the spread of this infectious disease. We are all recognised that recovery for our economy, job market and business sector is going to take a massive combined effort. That's why, over the last six weeks, I've been busy engaging with local councils, business leaders and Tasmanians on how they think we can get Tasmania back in business. Tasmania needs its leaders and elected representatives to help develop a clear plan to assist businesses in the recovery process, encourage new developments and create new jobs for Tasmanians. I have received incredibly valuable feedback from Tasmanians who have provided me with their thoughts and ideas on how we can work together to recover and expand the state's economic prospects. For example, Tasmania's agriculture industry is a major contributor to our economy and something that we are extremely proud of in our state. This industry will play a major role in recovery with the potential to increase production and seek new market opportunities for our produce. Further investment in the state's irrigation infrastructure will only assist with the growth of this important industry, create jobs and meet the nation's demand for fresh produce. The federal government's record on investing in water infrastructure projects in Tasmania speaks for itself, with the Australian and Tasmanian Liberal governments jointly investing $170 million to deliver the next tranche of new irrigation schemes. With the Morrison government last year creating the National Water Grid Authority, there is also a great opportunity to leverage that authority's expertise to pursue not only further irrigation investment but also to drought-proof the east coast of Tasmania, which suffered through record dry conditions last year. I look forward to pursuing that opportunity with state and federal colleagues. For many Tasmanians, this crisis has also highlighted our nation's reliance on imported, imported rather, products. The coronavirus pandemic has laid bare just how dependent we are as a nation on foreign markets. International trade and forging strong relations with other nations is extremely important for Australia as a member of the global community, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't shy away from opportunities to make or grow things we may not have previously produced. What's more, economic threats made by Beijing in response to Australia's push for an independent inquiry into coronavirus has highlighted our need to diversify markets and address our over-dependence on China. These are all things we need to consider as we continue to forge ahead with recovery efforts. Tasmania also must be open to development and infrastructure opportunities, both large and small. Of course, projects must be sensible and appropriate, but it's clear that if we are to bounce back strongly, we can't afford to be seen by the investment community as an anti-development state. The announcement earlier this week that Project Marinus, the proposed second interconnector across Bass Strait, has been identified as one of the 15 major projects the Morrison Coalition government has given priority status to is a welcome development. This project would enable another generation of hydroelectricity development in our state, as well as other renewable energy projects, providing a huge economic and job creation boost for Tasmania. Project Marinus and the Battery of the Nation initiative to grow Tasmania's renewable energy capacity will inject over $7 billion into the Tasmanian economy and create thousands of jobs to support Tasmania's renewable energy sector. 
We need development ideas for Tasmania to keep coming forward so that the private sector can invest with confidence and create jobs for Tasmanians. I will continue over the coming weeks and months to seek those ideas and work hard to get Tasmania back in business. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Many of you in this place and many people on the northwest coast of Tasmania, where I live, will know potato processing gave me a fantastic start in employment that lasted for over 10 years of my working life. The extraordinary soils of the northwest and near-perfect growing climate, plus the hard yards worked by hundreds of farmers, produce, produce great potatoes, and thousands of people rely on the potato industry for their livelihoods. They have done so for nearly 200 years. In 1826, the Van Diemen's Land Company sent the first shipload of potatoes from northwest Tasmania to Sydney. Today, that industry supports the lives and families of around 320 employees at Simplox Olveston Potato Processing Plant, around 200 employees at McCain Smithton Plant, and more than 165 local growers that supply more than 300,000 tonnes of potatoes each year to the Simplot plant alone. McCain's have also another large plant in Ballarat that employs over 500 people. And of course, there are all the associated indirect jobs in transport, logistics, and shipping. These plants process potatoes into a variety of frozen products, value adding enormously to the raw product. They are typically of high productive regional industries that provide a substantial number of jobs vital to regional economies, vital to the lives, well-being and happiness of literally thousands of people. It's an industry that I'm passionate about and it's the kind of industry we need more of if we are to have jobs and opportunities in regional Australia. The COVID-19 pandemic has reminded us of the importance of our manufacturing industries, industries we need to nurture and invest in to ensure that we have the resources as a nation to provide for our population to feed them. The pandemic has also, also thrown industries around the world into crisis, with restaurants and food outlets closing down for months and no longer buying product, creating mountains of surplus food. Tasmanian potato growers and workers at our vegetable processing plants are rightly stressed about the fluctuation in global commodity prices caused by the coronavirus. And recently, the farmers and workers in the potato industry in northwest Tasmania and Ballarat became deeply concerned that a $1 billion COVID-19 assistance package to European potato farmers could see large quantities of cheap French fries dumped on Australian supermarket shelves. I completely understand the fear and anxiety that these workers and farmers experience over this issue. This fear caused workers and farmers to rally recently, along with their community, at a socially distant rally in Smithton and, and Ballarat, organised by the AMWU, my union. They were unusual events, with many people showing up in their cars and cheering through their car windows so they could stay COVID safe. In Smithton, I told those workers and farmers I would take their concerns to this place and make sure my colleagues here understand their anxiety. This industry is vital for employment and economy on the northwest coast of Tasmania, an area hit hard by COVID-19 and already doing it tough before the pandemic. We are talking about livelihoods of hundreds of people. In response, Labor has called on the government to ensure that no worker and no industry gets left behind in the wake of the virus restrictions, which have had a se severe impact on the frozen ship industry. We have implored the government to ensure that the Anti-Dumping Commission is ready to act in the case of the dump dumping of any products into Australia under the guise of lower global prices. That means ensuring the Commission is adequately resourced, able to respond swiftly should the need arise. It was Labor that established the Anti-Dumping Commission, and we are rightly proud of that achievement. But its existence has not been sufficient to allay the fears of these workers and farmers, simply because the immediate impact of product dumping could see their livelihoods wiped out before the Commission's processes have an effect. They could quite easily become collateral damage in a market that is overwhelmed. We have since been reassured by the Europeans that they will not be dumping their product, but we must remain vigilant. We must. We must check when we go to the freezer at the supermarket. We must do everything we can to encourage investment in vibrant regional industries to lead us out of this economic crisis. And one worker said, the last thing we need is a kick in the guts by cheap imports. To the McCain's potato workers and potato farmers, 
and the AMW, I say good on you for drawing this to the attention of the nation, and please stay vigilant. We stand with you. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. I rise tonight to speak on protecting our forests, particularly forests that are part of the lands of the Wurundjeri, the Tungarong, the Gunai Kurnai and the Bidwell peoples. And I acknowledge the traditional owners of these lands and their elders past, present and emerging. And I acknowledge that these are stolen lands and there's been no consent for the logging and destruction of these forests, of this First, uh, First Nations forest heritage. And I pledge to work alongside First Nations peoples until we have achieved justice for them and for country. Last month, the federal court handed down a landmark legal decision. It found that Vic Forests, the Victorian government logging agency, had broken the law in its logging and plans to log 66 different areas of forest. The court found that the state and federal government were failing to protect two threatened animals, the tiny leadbeater's possum, of which there are only around 2,000 left in the world, and the greater glider. And the court found that logging was killing these animals and helping to send them closer and closer to extinction. I applaud and congratulate the friends of Leadbeater's possums who brought the legal case, their amazing legal team at Environment Justice Australia and the thousands of people who helped fund the case. Leadbeater's possums, <coughs> called wallert in the Tungarong language, can fit in the palm of your hand and they're very fussy about where they nest. They need hollows, that, which are only found in mountain ash trees that are over 100 years old. They are critically endangered, which means they are facing an extremely high risk of extinction in the wild in the immediate future. Greater gliders can fly from tree to tree. They are the largest of the gliding possums with big teddy bear ears and a long fluffy tail. And being vulnerable, means that they are facing a high risk of extinction in the wild in the medium-term future. It's estimated that almost a quarter of the greater gliders in Victoria were killed in last summer's fires. You would think that this should have been enough for governments to realise that the logging of the forest where these animals live should stop. You would think that when a federal court says that the logging has been illegal, that state and federal governments would realise that, like whaling, the game is up. That it's time to scrap our logging laws, the regional forest agreements, and strengthen our environment protection laws to protect our wildlife. That it's time for our forests to be left in peace, to grow old, to be protected for their wildlife, for their water, their carbon, their value for tourism and recreation, for their beauty and for their ability to inspire and soothe and rejuvenate the human spirit. That it's time for the wood products industry to complete the shift to being 100 per cent based on plantations, up from the current 88 per cent. But no. Last week I put a motion to the Senate calling upon the government to accept the federal court decision that the logging was illegal and to take immediate urgent action to ensure Australia's native forests are protected. The government and Labor voted against the motion. The Labor Party said that they support the benefits that flow from sustainable management of our native forests and support regional forest agreements. That is, they support ongoing logging, ongoing forest destruction, ongoing deaths of endangered animals. I've been campaigning for protection of our forests for over 30 years, and I am angry. So what do we do? The other MPs in this place are not listening. We need to make them listen. And I applaud the brave protesters who stopped logging in forests across Victoria last week. I applaud forest campaigners across the country who have been inspired by the federal court decision and are now working on legal actions in their states. And I call upon anyone listening to join these campaigns. You might like to learn more and share what you have learnt, to donate to cover legal costs, to take time to visit these wonderful forests, to join actions on the ground. And I call on you to help make our democracy work for us and our forests, to elect more people to this place who will vote for forest protection. People in the seat of Eden Monero have a chance to do that by voting for Greens candidate Cathy Griff in the by-election that will be held next month. Above all, 
I urge you to not give up hope, to keep campaigning, to keep fighting for our forests. Eventually, together, we will win. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Last night on the adjournment, I was telling a compelling story about how the West Australian Labor Environment Minister, Stephen Dawson, is the latest soft target for environmental alarmism in my home state of Western Australia, and I'd like to continue that sorry tale. In November 2017, approximately nine months after appearing before the committee, Professor Black and former Senators Bob Brown and Christine Milne wrote to Minister Dawson, repeating their alarmist and unsubstantiated claims. They requested he instruct the Environmental Protection Agency to conduct a Section 46 review undertaking a review of Yarra Pilbara's operating licence. Section 46 states, if the minister considers that the implementation conditions relating to a proposal or any of them should be changed, whether because of changes to the proposal authorised under section 45C or for, or, or for any other reason, the minister may request the authority to inquire into and report on the matter within such period as is specified in the request, it says. Section 46.6 of the Environmental Protection Act 1986 requires the EPA report to include, one, a recommendation on whether or not implementation conditions to which the inquiry relates or any of them should be changed, and two, any other recommendations that it thinks appropriate. This is a totally unnecessary step by the WA Labor Environment Minister, but a heavy regulatory impost on Yarra Pilbara, especially because the EPA had previously analysed Yarra Pilbara's emissions and concluded it was unlikely the predicted quantities of nitrogen dioxide and ammonia that would be emitted from the TANPF would have a significant impact on rock art in the surrounding areas. However, in September 2019, after conducting an inquiry and acknowledging Yarra Pilbara already uses best practice pollution control technology to minimise air emissions, the EPA recommended that the minister impose stronger licence conditions to protect Burrup rock art from Yarra's emissions. This advice was swiftly acted upon by Minister Dawson when he issued Ministerial Statement 1121 on Christmas Eve 2019, imposing stricter conditions on Yarra Pilbara's facility. So what does all of this mean? Despite having already employed best practice pollution control technology to minimise air emissions, Yarra Pilbara must compare its operations against industry best practice every four years or when directed to do so by the WA Department of Water and Environmental Regulation. The practical implications of these new licence conditions mean Yarra Pilbara could at any time be non-compliant with its operating licence based on a subjective assessment of what constitutes best practice. Their licence to operate can now only be considered conditional, and all resource con companies considering investment in Western Australia now need to consider the additional risk of having, a, having potential licence changes imposed upon them without scientific or evidentiary cause. Not only is this a bad outcome for Yarra Pilbara, it is a bad omen for all future resource project investment in my home state of Western Australia. Just when our mining and resource sector has been the lifeboat for the Australian economy during this pandemic, the actions of the WA Labor government have unnecessarily increased uncertainty for this critical part of our state and national economy. All because Minister Dawson fails to stand up to scientific alarmism. Those in the community who masquerade as experts, building an argument by quoting out of context, selectively choosing data and misusing science. The objective of this alarmism is to obstruct and to derail industrial development across WA's far north. My message tonight is a simple one. WA's resource sector should be alert and alarmed. This case study regarding, regarding Yarra Pilbara and Professor David Black introduces a new heightened degree of risk for existing and future resource projects in Western Australia. The WA Labor government and Minister Dawson have emboldened the activist movement and put at risk the employment opportunities of thousands. Potentially, no resource company is safe from the campaign tactics and trickery of these activists. So be prepared. The activists will quickly move to their next victim, stir up the community, bully companies and the regulator into submission and wrap job and wealth creating resource companies in more and more red tape. WA's resource sector has been warned. 
and it's time for WA's resource sector to stand up and be counted. Senator Green. It is with great sadness that I pay tribute tonight to the more than 100 regional newspapers which will no longer be printed from the 29th of June. It follows the recent closure of online sites 10 Daily and BuzzFeed News Australia this month and mounts on top of more than 150 Australian newsrooms that have shut down since January 2019. Local journalists play an essential role in breaking news and telling the stories that matter to their communities, particularly in regional Australia. These newspapers have a rich connection to their community, in some cases going back further than a century. North Queensland mastheads like the Daily Mercury, Whitsunday's Times, Whitsunday Coast Guardian and Bowen Independent will cease print publication after this month. The Atherton Tablelands, Northern Miner, Port Douglas and Mossman Gazette and the Burdekin Advocate will disappear completely. The loss of these regional media jobs will have a devastating blow for regional communities, journalists, printers and sales staff. The natural consequence of these cuts is that regional Queenslanders will be less informed about the issues impacting their lives. Fewer reporters will be available to perform their watchdog role, covering council meetings and court proceedings. Many have noted that regional papers are also a training ground for Australian journalists. But more than that, what we know is that we have great journos in regional Queensland that love to call regional Queensland home, and they do a great job writing the stories about local government decisions and shining a light on community news. Without them, many stories simply wouldn't get told. When decision makers are less accountable to the public, this leads to poorer community outcomes. But these cuts won't just impact journalists. These regional media cuts will see the Rockhampton Print Centre close on the 26th of June and the Warwick Print Centre close on the 17th of July. 84 hard-working print workers will lose their jobs. 45 of them were permanent staff. Some of these workers found out that they were going to lose their job on breakfast TV or on radio news while they were on their way to work. That is not good enough. These workers deserved better than that. I know how important these jobs are to regional communities and I know that these workers work hard and have done for so many years to get the news out. When I was young, my dad worked the night shift as a printer at Fairfax, so I know that print workers don't turn up day after day just simply to do a job. They do it because they love serving their community and getting the news out is important work. Sadly, so many regions will now be missing out on these vital news services. So we have heard a lot from this government during this crisis about supporting manufacturing workers, but they are not supporting these manufacturing workers. We also hear a lot of, from the members opposite about how they represent the regions, but when it comes to regional media, they have gone missing. What is the point of the Liberal National Government if they cannot save regional newspapers? They're very happy to head out there with their Akubra hats and do a press conference and make an announcement. But now when they do that, there will not be any regional journos there to hear them. And these cuts, as we know, started a long time before COVID-19 pandemic. The government simply cannot hide behind COVID-19 for letting these cuts unfold. Labor warned that the government's regional and small publishers innovation fund announced in 2017 was ideologically motivated and inadequate. This government also wasted precious time in failing to provide a timely and effective support for the media sector in crisis. And now we know that the Minister's Public Interest News Gathering Fund announced in the middle of this crisis is scant on details, inadequate and too late to save regional Queenslanders' jobs. Delays on this government's watch 
means that essential funding is yet to flow to media organisations in the time of their need. These jobs needed this government to step in, but they have turned their back on regional Queenslanders once again. Order. Your time has expired. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise tonight to discuss mature age workers, a cohort of Australians I am very worried about, particularly in the myth in the midst of this crisis and recession. The data paints an unsettling, uh, an unsettling and upsetting picture for anyone concerned about the well-being of older Australians. It shows that our older workers are having a particularly difficult time in the labour market, especially through the coronavirus crisis. For example, employment for people aged 50 years and over fell by 3.4 per cent in April this year. The number of Australians aged over 50 who are underemployed or working zero hours significantly increased in the month of April. Australians aged over 55 also spent a much longer, time, uh, look, a much longer amount of time looking for jobs compared to the younger aged groups. One of the shortcomings of this data from the ABS is that it hides the cohorts that are specifically struggling at this time, including older Australians from cold backgrounds, disabled people and women. Older workers face a myriad of barriers in the workplace, including ageism and discrimination. They are, they are especially, uh, pronounced, these are, uh, especially pronounced during a recession where jobs are scarcer. We have all heard accounts from people who have, had, who have been told to remove their age from their CV, dye their hair and if they want to keep their job, or been refused training on the basis of their age. Tonight I want to express my strong concern that the government isn't considering the needs of older, uh, older workers uh, enough at this time. One of the ways we could better support older unemployed workers is by improving the Job Active Scheme. I have spoken a lot about the Job Active Scheme in this place. I often hear from people who have been discriminated against, discriminated against by their provider on the basis of their age. For example, they have been told to look for volunteer roles instead of paid work. We need to embark on a process of educating employment consultants to ensure they are equipped to sensitively assist older unemployed workers. There needs to be a greater focus on career guidance and a pathway for providers to specialise in helping disadvantaged older workers. The Career Transition Assistance Program is one way employment providers can help older workers. While I welcome the recent announcement that this program now has a separate funding source, I have concerns that it is not geographically dispersed and the referral rate to date has been incredibly low. Another way we could better support older workers is by retaining the rate of job seeker payment. Before COVID, people aged over 45 years, I say 45 years, make up the oldest aged cohort, sorry, the largest aged cohort on job seeker and they spent the longest time out of work. Setting income support payments above the poverty line would prevent older people ageing in poverty in, onto the age pension. This should be coupled with the relaxed eligibility requirements around income and asset tests until the economy has recovered. We still have a lot of work to do to ensure that older workers aren't left behind. Older workers were already doing it tough juggling health issues, caring responsibilities and facing discrimination in the workplace and when they were trying to find work. The government needs to step up and show leadership at this critical time. Other words, in, otherwise, a whole uh, a large cohort of older Australians who are seeking work may never find work again coming out of this recovery, uh, out of this process. Where is the recovery plan for older workers to ensure that they have specialist support to help them find work, access to better training? Where is the reach out to expand the career um, transition assistance program so it is better geographically dispersed, so that more people, older Australians, can access this? While we have such a large cohort of older Australians who are being discriminated against, where ageism is playing a clear role in keeping people out of work. We cannot drop these hard-working Australians 
who are want to regain work, we cannot drop them onto $40 a day. It is unconscionable to do that to this group of Australians. Senator Henderson. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise in this adjournment debate to raise some very serious questions about the conduct of the Labor Party in Victoria and Victorian Labor Party members of parliament, not just state but federal. On 60 Minutes on Sunday night and in the Age newspaper the following morning, the shocking headlines reverberated in every household in Victoria and around the nation. Labor rights notorious head kicker Adam Somurek, a power-hungry minister of the Crown brought back into cabinet by Premier Daniel Andrews after being forced to resign over his treatment of a staff member, was caught red-handed on videotape, boasting about how he wielded most of the power in Victorian Labor branch stacking using disgusting foul language about numerous people, including the Premier and one of his female cabinet colleagues, seemingly organising forged documents, cash payments for fake Labor Party members and staff improperly working for his factional machine rather than for the members of parliament for whom they were hired to work. Labor has tried to give the impression that it has moved quickly to stop the rot, with the Premier referring these matters to Victoria Police and IBAC, sacking Adam Somurek and expelling him from the party and forcing the resignation of two other cabinet ministers close to Somurek. The national executive of the ALP has taken over the Victorian branch and a full-blown inquiry is now underway, and it seems the pre-selections of all state and federal MPs in Victoria are now safe. But Labor and the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Albanese, have been incredibly slow off the mark when it comes to understanding the role of the federal member for Holt, Mr Byrne. It was Mr Byrne's federal electorate office in Cranbourne West where these covert video recordings occurred, surveillance which may be unlawful under both Victorian and Commonwealth law. The Leader of the Opposition, Mr Albanese, was the only person in the nation, it seems, who didn't seem to notice the map of the electorate for Holt, a poster, the parliamentary screensaver, and there was even for very close viewers who watch this very closely, there was even a photo of Mr Byrne on the bookshelf, but he failed to speak with Mr Byrne. Mr Albanese failed to speak with Mr Byrne, let alone understand whether he had any knowledge of this surveillance. Under the Victorian Surveillance Devices Act, it is an offence for a person to knowingly install, use or maintain a listening or optical device unless it's for law enforcement purposes in the public interest or for the protection of the lawful interests of the person making the recording. And the maximum penalty is two years in jail. While well, Mr Byrne has agreed to cooperate with police, if he has any knowledge of these covert activities in his office whatsoever, his position order. as Deputy Chair order. of the Parliament's— Senator Henderson. Point of order, Senator Watt. Point of order, <coughs> Mr Acting Deputy President. I just draw your attention to Standing Order 193, Paragraph 3, uh, which states that a senator shall not use offensive words against either House of Parliament or of a House of a State or Territory <coughs> Parliament or any member of such House or against others, and all imputations of improper motives and all personal reflections on those houses, members or officers shall be considered highly disorderly. And I suggest that some of what Senator Henderson is saying right now uh, contravenes that standing order. Thank you, Senator Watt. I have been listening very carefully with Standing Order 193, particularly subpara 3, uh, at the front of my mind. Uh, Senator Henderson has not been reflecting on the member, nor uh, has she, to this point, uh, imputed improper motives, but has been recounting facts. So I'm watching that very closely. Senator Henderson, you have the call. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And I won't be shut down in this debate uh, if Mr. Mr Byrne has uh, any knowledge of these activities. Uh, it appears that his role as Deputy Chair of the Parliament's Intelligence and Security Committee is untenable. But there are other federal MPs who have said very little, including the member for Corio, Richard Miles, and Senator Carr, 
who are closely aligned with Mr Byrne in Victoria. And it is indeed the case that the most prominent beneficiary of this week's fiasco is Mr Miles, and I ask, is that a coincidence? As the new king of Labor's right in Victoria, after Mr Miles white anted the member for Maribyrnong, Mr Shorten, Order. Victorians Senator, and particularly Senator the people— Henderson, you do need to be careful about personal reflections, understanding Order 193. Thank you very much. Victorians, and particularly the people of Geelong, need to know exactly what Mr Miles knew. Was he aware of any of the goings-on in Mr Byrne's office, or was he aware of any of this conduct or any of these allegations which have surfaced since Sunday night? It is no secret that Mr Miles will now be working day and night to take over the leadership from Mr Albanese. Is now Order. much more Order. serious. Senator Henderson, that is a personal reflection and an imputation of an improper motive. You will withdraw that. I withdraw. These matters are very serious, and Victorians deserve to know the full truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President, and I thank you for your intervention uh, during Senator Henderson's uh, speech. Uh, essential workers have been the heroes of COVID-19. Our health workers, our cleaners, our truckies, our retail staff and, of course, our aged care workers uh, who have ensured that some of our most vulnerable citizens remain safe from the virus. Now, I know that expectations were raised amongst aged care workers when the government agreed to pay, pay them a retention bonus to ensure the continuity of the workforce for aged care workers in both residential and home care. But sadly, as we so often see with this government, these expectations were dashed with yet another broken promise. Firstly, having raised these expectations and for once making aged care workers feel truly valued for their vital work, the government then excluded about 40 per cent of aged care workers from receiving the retention bonus. Just as this government has excluded short-term casuals, arts and entertainment workers, university workers, migrant workers and others from receiving the JobKeeper payment, it decided to exclude the catering staff, cleaners, gardeners, therapy assistants, leisure and lifestyle workers at aged care facilities, as well as aged care workers delivering care under the Commonwealth Home Support Program. Is the government really saying that some aged care workers aren't as important as others? Why would the government exclude 40 per cent of aged care workers from receiving a payment meant to recognise their service? Secondly, the government promised payments of up to $800 after tax per quarter for residential care workers and up to $600 after tax per quarter uh, for home care workers. But after making this announcement, the government changed the Gold Coast, making these payments taxable. All weeks that we've seen the aged care minister dodge this, the fact is that the government's broken their promise. It's an absolute disgrace and disrespects aged care Order. workers. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Thank you.